lecture one part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne lecture one the divine law of probation part one the lord your god trieth you that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul or not deuteronomy chapter thirteen verse three the noblest building demands the costliest foundation to secure its firmness and solidity the magnificent structure of the christian virtues by which the soul ascends to god can only rest firmly and rise securely upon the receptive virtue of humility a virtue most costly to our corrupted nature yet of wonderful strength when brought to its perfection this virtue has its ground in the nature of things its reason in the unchangeable order of justice and the whole knowledge of god and of oneself for the compass of its motive and whilst as a virtuous force of the will it keeps the soul in her just and true position it opens her powers to every good and perfect gift that descends from the father of lights in our former course of lectures we considered the endowments of man in their relations with his final end and took a general survey of the broad and deep foundations of this virtue and we thus prepared the way for a more precise and exact consideration of its nature its origin its force and efficacy and upon this we have now to enter we shall have further to consider the relations which humility bears to the other christian virtues its qualities as their essential groundwork and as the preparation sustaining power and protection of them all for the foundation of the christian virtues is itself a strong and a most comprehensive virtue and a virtue without which there is no christian virtue as the moral groundwork of god's building in the soul this virtue has rightly obtained the name of humility for as the word humus from which it is derived signifies the lowly ground that is opened by the labourers of man to the fertilizing influences of the heavens humilitas or humility is the lowly condition of the soul opened by the self-cleansing and self-subduing labours of the spiritual man to the benign influences of god god alone is independent every creature is dependent on god but as man is made for god he has a vast capacity and wants in full proportion to his capacity for god and is therefore immeasurably more dependent on his creator than the irrational creatures whose wants are limited to this world to be deeply conscious of this dependence is to have the soul filled with the most important moral truth with which we are concerned and to enter with good will into this truth is to place ourselves on the secure foundation of all justice this dependence has its foundation in the divine preeminence and absolute sovereignty of god and in his bountiful goodness and in the need we have of receiving his divine help and bounty that we may be united with him both as our first cause and as our final end as our first cause that we may receive his continual influence and as our final end that by his graces and blessings as we are made to his image we may come to our divine original so dependent is the ray of light upon the sun 
that when separated it expires in darkness and so dependent is our soul upon the divine beneficence that when we are no longer subject to his gracious influence we decline into a moral death as humility springs in the order of justice from the truth of our dependence on god it is the virtue proper to the intellectual and moral creature and the foundation of all those virtues whereby man is perfected unto god but as the pillar that led israel from egypt to the land of promise was both light and cloud so this virtue of humility is light to the children of belief whilst to the children of this world it takes the appearance of an obscure and unintelligible cloud it enlightens the humble it perplexes the proud for the world without humility is the world without the sense of god and consequently without the sense of dependence on god but when for long ages pride had usurped the place of humility in human hearts then came humility from heaven in the person of god and the nature of man that through its divine power and influence the souls of men might return to god but before entering into these great subjects we shall have to consider the divine law of probation which has its reason in the law of subjection and which establishes the connecting link between the subjects of our present and of our past course of lectures lest however what we have already said on the great qualities of humility should seem overcharged especially to those who have hitherto seen but its cloudy side and who can see nothing in it but an amiable weakness or a shameful degradation we shall at once point out two facts that place the victorious force of this virtue on invincible foundations the first is this that by the divine exercise of humility the fallen race of man was redeemed from evil and brought back to god the second is this that by the exercise of this virtue the christian soul is transplanted from dependence on her own native resources to dependence on the inexhaustible resources of god and from reliance on her own feeble self-support to reliance on the strong support of god a virtue that carries the soul over from her own foundation to place her on a divine foundation must be strong and this virtue is humility god is the fountain of law he gives to us the light of law that by its guidance we may rule our wills in conformity with his divine will which expresses both the eternal order of things and the order of progress in the creature from what is good to what is better from this order all justice proceeds and through justice all good is obtained there are two orders of dependence in the creation there is a necessitated order in the material creation which is without understanding or will and there is a voluntary order of dependence in the spiritual creation which determines its own free conduct by law and virtue or by neglecting them becomes a failure in the material universe the order of dependence is fixed and determined by the will of god the first mover of all things unless for great spiritual purposes he changes that order and brings it under the higher motive of a higher law that it may serve to the saving and sanctification of souls even in that fixed order and dependence of the material world on which we habitually rely what is inferior in it is perfected by what is superior but in the spiritual world of created intelligences where wills are free 
the just and due order of dependence on god whose needy clients we are is one thing as it exists in the law of justice and another as it exists in fact that is to say as it exists in the actual conformity of our will to the will of god as expressed in the law of justice for the law of justice may be in our mind and conscience while our will is far from it thus whilst the material creation is necessarily dependent on god our spiritual soul must be willingly subject to god that we may be in just order and right dependence on god to receive his sovereign bounty a truth which redounds to our honour and dignity as free and intelligent spirits made to the image of god there is one truth more of vast importance in this relation to every soul a certain portion of the elements of this material world is attached in the wonderful organization of the human body and notwithstanding the general laws which regulate material things the free soul exercises its free will upon the body and upon the things dependent on the body that are external to it and either subjects them to order or throws them by evil conduct or neglect into disorder now if the will of man can thus change the material order of things in so far as they are dependent on him yet without seeming to interfere with the fixed and constant order of any part of the material creation how much more can god for his high spiritual purposes do the same for matter is made to be the servant of spirit the light of justice is therefore planted in our mind and the sense of god in our heart and the choice is left to our will whether we conform ourselves by the exercise of virtue to the just and due order of our dependence on god or not but this moral conformity of our disposition and will to our real position before god and the subordination of our will to the known will of god is expressed by the subjection of our mind and will to the mind and will of god and in virtue of this subjection which is the becoming predisposition on our part we are able to receive from god the gifts that bring us to perfection subjection is therefore to our free natures what dependence is to the irrational creature and by this willing subjection we not only consult our greater good which comes to us from the divine superiority but we give that reverence and honour to god which is due to him yet this reverence and honour as st thomas observes is not given to god as though a benefit to him to whose glory no creature can add anything but it returns to our benefit because our perfection consists in subjecting ourselves to god even as everything is perfected by subjection to its superior so the body is perfected through subjection to the soul the atmosphere through subjection to the sun and the soul is united to god through subjection to him and by reason of that subjection she receives from him whatever is needful for her perfection the soul in her substance and powers is the free creation of god who in creating willed that she should exist for ever as the book of wisdom says god created man indestructible and to the image of his own likeness he made him wisdom chapter two verse twenty three man has no power therefore over his own spiritual existence independently moreover of her own will the soul receives whatever is necessary for her natural functions such as the gift of reason 
and the natural sense of good and evil but as she is destined for a good unspeakably higher than her nature as god himself is the supreme object of the soul she cannot receive what is necessary for her union with god and her perfection without the free subjection of her will and the voluntary dependence of her hope on god first because divine things in the moral order must have a willing subject secondly because their greatness and goodness must be gratefully recognized thirdly because the lowly receiver of gifts so high must humbly understand and feel that they are not her own but come from the bounty of god fourthly because the soul must willingly open herself in response to the divine gifts to make them fruitful fifthly because the will must enter into the intention of her divine benefactor yet so far is this willing subjection from debasing the soul that it brings her to the majesty and submits her to the loving condescension of god which brings honour to her nature and dignity to her character nor is the freedom of our nature lessened by subjection to the divine nature on the contrary it is wonderfully increased we are set free in mind by the possession of greater truth and free in heart by the possession of greater good our subjection to god is not a subjection by descending but by ascending is not a deference to things lower than ourselves but a movement towards what is incomparably higher than we are in this subjection the soul deserts her self-love and the base things to which self-love holds her captive and enchained and moves towards god in the act of subjecting herself to him who is the perfect freedom and the source of all freedom is the spirit free that cleaves to her own nature or the spirit that seeks the divine nature is the mind most at liberty in her own light or the mind that comes into the sphere of the divine and supernal light is the soul enlarged through immersion in the body or through union with the spiritual things of god the pride of independence is isolation and isolation is poverty poverty of mind poverty of heart and poverty of spirit but he who is the subject of greater light than his own and the servant of greater powers than his nature can supply has reached to sources of freedom beyond the limits of his nature it is not the man then who isolates himself in the pride of self-sufficiency but the man who unites himself by subjection to what is higher in power better in wisdom and greater in good the man who looks hopefully to the divine fountain of light and grace who is free with that freedom with which god sets us free freedom is not of the night darkness is its adversary freedom is of the day and god is the sun of our freedom to put the law of dependence in a simple point of view whatever is created is feeble and requires to be fed the heavens feed the earth the earth the plants the plants the animals and all feed the body of man but whatever lives by food depends on the provider of that food to rebel against that food or against its provider is to starve and spiritual creatures are also in a state of weakness and want of their proper food all the greater because their capacity is too immense for anything but god to satisfy they too must be fed and since they are spirits with spiritual food or they can neither grow nor strengthen nor advance to those better things the appetite for which is deep within them and for which they were really made 
the food of the mind is truth the food of the will is force and good hence the divine master of souls has said not in bread alone doth man live but in every word that proceedeth from the mouth of god st matthew chapter four verse four spiritual natures are on the summits of creation there is nothing but god above them bearing the image of god in their nature and the consciousness of god in that image they are his immediate subjects and he their father and feeder for the lord god is the pastor of souls feeding them as a shepherd his sheep and when he appoints other shepherds they feed not from their own substance but from his eternal stores but unless the spiritual children be subject to the father how can they be fed a stomach that loathes its food makes a weak and sickly body and a soul that revolts against its nourishment cannot have spiritual strength god is the first giver and the first mover the will is the receiver and the second mover meeting the gift making it her own and making it fruitful but if the receiver responds not to the divine giver if the gift be left unregarded the mind is not enlightened the heart is not nourished the soul is in a worse plight through her neglect than before the gift was offered there may be an idle sentimental passive submission to the gift but this will do nothing for the soul's good there must be an active subjection and an earnest correspondence to god and his grace to meet and mingle with the good movements of god to enrich and fertilize our powers with his gifts government is as necessary to the soul as food and spirits on their venturous way from ignorance to truth from nothingness to god require the divine wisdom to lead them the divine lord to govern them but there can be no government without subjection you may choose a wise and beneficent master who is interested in your well-being and advancement or you may choose a tyrannical master who thinks but of his own interests at the cost of yours but a master you must have if you choose the first you choose freedom if you choose the second you bid farewell to liberty there is no master so large-minded so generous or who is so well acquainted with you and your requirements as god no father so loving and bountiful no friend so free from all jealousy none who so completely loves you for your greater good whilst there is no tyrant so narrow-minded so proud-hearted so exacting so suspicious so utterly bent on keeping you to your own littleness as the one we all know so well of whose tyranny we have had such bitter experience and who goes by the name of myself this name has such an unpleasant sound to all ears but our own that even whilst cherishing what it signifies we find it prudent to keep it as much away from other ears as we can yet god or yourself you must choose for your master the whole design of god's beneficent government of souls is to draw them out of themselves and to bring them to his truth and good this is the true object of the divine law of probation to draw us out of ourselves by means of those virtues which probation is intended to develop and promote unless you understand this grand truth you will have but a faint notion of the good which god contemplates in providing temptation and probation for his spiritual creatures as there are few truths more obscure to the general mind or that more nearly concern our spiritual welfare let us examine the principle of this divine law more closely 
the soul begins her everlasting existence in a feeble and contracted condition as well as the mortal body her first life is one of sense and instinct what she first obtains is the consciousness of self and of her own personal and separate existence for a little experience adds to this keen self-consciousness the sense of limitation owing to the double sensation produced by what acts within us and what reacts upon us from external causes these lines of limitation are at first obscure and indefinite experience has yet to teach the difference between these two causes of sensation both however have the same effect of increasing the sensibility of self-consciousness but this inclines our nature to independence consider the motive power within this young spirit first it is an instinct rather than a will until reason draws in the intelligence and then it becomes a will the infant seems at first to be almost a part of the mother and finds its good and protection in her when taken from her the child suffers when brought to her it rejoices and clings to her for all good but in passing from infancy to the dawning of reason there comes a change thinking has begun self-consciousness has grown the sense of independent life becomes definite the will begins to assert itself and to feel its own importance the mother says you must the child replies i won't this little fit of self-assertion is the beginning of pride fear must come to check this first step to independence the child receives reproof and some new command as a loving discipline to enforce subjection and obedience this first trial of the young spirit is probation helping the little soul to leave its selfishness and to submit to its mother's law the obedience that follows is the beginning of self-knowledge and self-mastery this will serve to explain how the newly created intelligence whether angel or human soul is engaged with the sense of her own existence and of her own limitations and is thus inclined by nature to self-love before that intelligence is drawn by grace to a greater being than her own the sense of personality comes first because it is the foundation of responsibility we therefore find ourselves before we completely find god although the testimony of god is within us even the angels were not created in union with god or with virtue they had first to receive the grace of god and then acquire the virtues in a state of probation End of Lecture 1, Part 1Lecture 1, Part 2 of The Groundwork of the Christian Virtues by William Bernard Ullathorne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 1, The Divine Law of Probation, Part 2 if we look for analogies between the visible and the invisible world we shall find them in abundance because both are created by one spiritual power and are formed from spiritual types there are two great principles of movement in the visible world and two great principles of movement in the spiritual world which with great differences have still a striking resemblance to the fundamental principles of movement in the material universe we give the names of attraction and gravitation names that cover our ignorance of their nature by a mysterious influence beyond our perception each mass of matter is attracted to its own centre whereby it coheres together 
whilst by another mysterious influence a body of less quantity is attracted to a body of greater quantity in proportion to its mass density and distance in other words what is less is attracted to what is greater according to its greatness and proximity of influence this is a shadow of the order that reigns in the spiritual world where justice prevails for whilst the movement of the material universe is necessitated the movement of the spiritual world is free and springs from will and choice but the order of good in the spiritual world demands that whatever spirit has less of being life and good should overcome the tendency to self and the disposition to abide in self and should tend to what has the greatest being life and good that the less may partake of the greater and as the movement of spiritual natures is by thought desire and love and the attraction which influences these movements to the better things is the presence light and grace of god they ought to tend by the inclination of faith desire and love to the supreme being who is the truth the life and the love that they may become partakers of god this ever-moving earth is not only attracted to its own centre as all that constitutes man is held together by the central force of the soul but it is held on its rapid course by the attraction of the sun and as it turns towards that mighty luminary it receives his image and partakes his light warmth and fertilizing power yet his rays are intercepted by the vapours which the earth produces and by the turbulence arising from their conflicts and so by his creative influence does god hold the ever active soul in which he has placed his image in her dependence but when she turns her face with desire to him who attracts her he sends forth the celestial influence of his light grace and charity upon her attracting her to move towards him by faith hope and love and she becomes a partaker of his goodness but as the soul is not necessitated like the earth but free to make her choice if she prefers her own central attraction and the drawing to herself of the small things around her instead of the divine attraction and her own uneasy love instead of the divine love that soul is left in her own littleness is clouded and darkened by her own vapours and troubled in herself for she is doing violence to the deepest appetite of her nature and is oppressed far more than she can understand with the weight of that attraction to the greater good whose object she is constantly misunderstanding or which her pride is constantly resisting and that spirit becomes more and more oppressed and more and more impoverished who can express the magnificence of the light of faith as compared with the light of reason one who has had the gift of faith from infancy and has no experience of a condition of soul without that supernatural light can never realize the immensity of the sphere of faith as compared with the sphere of natural reason or the difference of character that belongs to the one light as compared with the other in the things of god and the soul reason but gropes among the shadows reflected here below whilst faith with its light direct from god opens out the infinite and eternal prospect of divine truth which though obscurely seen is yet surely seen by the humble mind giving a breath and firmness to the mind that nothing can explain but the action of god in the soul for the truth of god received by faith and embraced by charity gives a largeness to the soul beyond every limit of nature 
exalts the will above all that is merely human and the joy of believing brings the heart nigh to god the divine master of truth knowing all her ways has said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free st john chapter eight verse thirty two in words that still vibrate with his awe and gratitude st augustine records the first visit of that light of faith which drew him out of himself to the eternal truth admonished he says to return to myself through thy divine guidance i entered my interior i was able to do this because thou o god wast my helper i entered and with the eye of my soul i saw the unchangeable light it was above the eye of my soul above my mind it was not this common light that shines to all mortals alike nor a light of the same kind embracing all things equally with its brightness it was not this but another light exceedingly differing from all this nor was it upon my mind as oil is upon water but was far above me because it made me and i was far beneath because made by it whosoever knoweth the truth knoweth that light and whosoever knoweth that light knoweth eternity charity knoweth it o eternal truth true charity and dear eternity thou art my god to thee i sigh both day and night when first i knew thee thou didst lift me up that i might see it was not myself i beheld but the truth and thou didst beat down my sight with thy vehement irradiation into me and i trembled with dread and with love finding myself far from thee in a region of unlikeness it was as though i heard thy voice on high saying to me i am the food of the strong grow up and thou shalt partake of me thou shalt not change me into thee but thou shalt be changed into me and i knew that thou dost correct man for iniquity and dost make his soul to waste away like the spider and i looked on the things beneath thee and saw that they neither are nor are not because they are not as thou art for that alone hath true being that abideth unchangeable my good therefore is to adhere to god for unless i abide in him i cannot abide in myself but he whilst abiding in himself reneweth all things and thou art the lord my god because thou hast no need of my goods if the gift of faith is so wonderful how much more wonderful is the gift of charity it is the flame of love descending from god into the humble soul penetrating to the centre of her spirit embracing the will embraced by the will carrying us gratefully out of the contracted limits of our self-love towards the divine author of all life and happiness this love is the living bond between god and the soul on the one side an extension of god's eternal love to us on the other a return of love to our divine benefactor the free restoration to him of the life he has given to us the full homage of all we are and have received if we look to the earth for a symbol of the way in which spiritual natures are developed we shall find it in the flowers those beautifiers of the earth that gladden all eyes are the fructifying organs of the vegetable world yet they are beautiful and pure a reminiscence of the world yet undefiled by sin fit offerings therefore are they to the heavenly purity although like all earthly things they quickly fade in their first life the flowers are closed upon themselves but the sun shines upon the lily 
and it opens to the descending light expands its sensitive petals to the glowing warmth and its pure cup is filled with light beauty and sweetness yet it gracefully bows its head in confession of its native weakness and dependence in many flowers when darkness comes or the tempest rages like the faithful soul under trial the beautiful creature folds itself in patience awaiting the return of light to expand itself anew in joy there is an intimate and essential connection between the law of subjection and the law of probation for probation is the test of subjection to prove is to examine to apply a test to find out by experiment man is often an unconscious imitator of god if he makes a thing for some great purpose on which much depends he puts it to a severe test to try its firmness before it is adopted if any one is intended for a great office honour or duty he is proved and tried by a suitable discipline before he is advanced the angelic spirit and the immortal soul are destined for the highest honour and the noblest end but this demands great purity and constancy and as they are not only free but weak by nature they must be proved and tried whether they will hold to the strength of god or abide in their own weakness as their advancement to the glorious end depends on their constancy to the ever-increasing gifts of god on their sincerity in acknowledging them and their fidelity in responding to them their virtue requires to be openly proved and strengthened by trial before they receive the great things of eternity in the sacred scriptures god is sometimes said to prove and sometimes to tempt but this is always by a revelation a command or an affliction when the law was revealed from sinai moses said to the people fear not for god hath come to prove you and that the dread of him might be upon you and you shall not sin exodus chapter twenty verse twenty the great revelation came with fear that the souls of the people might be humbled for its reception when the commandments of god were repeated with solemn circumstances and the people bound themselves to obey them before entering the promised land moses said to them again thou shalt remember the ways through which the lord thy god hath brought thee forty years through the desert to afflict and prove thee that the things that were in thy heart might be made known whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or not deuteronomy chapter eight verse two here the trial of affliction is to reveal the disposition of the heart again the great lawgiver says the lord your god trieth you that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul or not deuteronomy chapter thirteen verse three here probation is shown to be the test of faithful love then the prophet alleges another motive why they have been proved and tried after he had afflicted and proved thee at the last he had mercy on thee lest thou should say in thy heart my own might and the strength of my own hand have achieved all these things for me but remember the lord thy god that he hath given thee strength that he might fulfil his covenant deuteronomy chapter eight verses sixteen through eighteen the motive here assigned is that through trial the gifts of god may be known to be his and not the power of the creature the whole reason of divine probation is summed up in these grave sentences but where the scripture speaks of god as tempting what is really meant is proving as st thomas observes after st augustine where it is said for example 
that god tempted abraham it was not an evil temptation to sin but a proving of his virtue and fidelity by a most difficult command abraham was destined for great things to be the friend of god the prophet as well as ancestor of christ and the father of the faithful he receives the command to sacrifice his son a figure to all times of the sacrifice of the son of god he obeys and a substitute is provided he gives the required proof of his firm faith and obedience and through his angel the almighty said to him because thou hast done this thing and hast not spared thy only begotten son for my sake i will help thee and i will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is by the seashore thy seed shall possess the gates of their enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice genesis chapter twenty two this exceptional example proves that when god himself tries the good he tries them with good and not with evil for the trial was a divine command that god alone could give because it arose to principles far higher than those of the law delivered to men it arose by reflection to those principles which our blessed lord proclaimed when he said god so loved the world as to give his only begotten son st john chapter three verse sixteen and isaac became a figure of christ the temptings of god are not seductions to evil these belong to satan and his followers they are searchings of the spirit that she may know herself become more humble understand her grace find out what help she needs from god and draw nearer to him for strength and protection for as saint augustine says no one knows what powers of love are in him or are not in him until through a divine experiment they are made known to him if the spirit fails in the trial it is expedient that her hidden infirmity be brought to light for the divine justification st james gives us this solemn warning let no man when he is tempted say that he is tempted by god for god is not a tempter of evils and he tempteth no man the apostle then points out where the temptation comes from but every man is tempted by his own concupiscence being drawn away and allured then when concupiscence hath conceived it bringeth forth sin st james chapter one verses thirteen through fifteen the external tempter is powerless without the inward inclination to evil but when the inward weakness yields to evil allurement the sin is conceived and death is its fruit but god does not allure us to sin he proves the spirit by some new truth that asks for faith or by some new command that calls for obedience and the humility of obedience brings great good and enlargement to the soul hence st augustine observes that when god ceases to prove he ceases to teach from what has been said we may gather five reasons why every rational creature who has received the grace of god should be submitted to probation number one the first reason is that the spirit may be drawn out of herself and be attracted to the sphere of eternal light and good and so be enlarged in spirit and life for the reception of greater and diviner gifts this is accomplished through some great and unexpected call upon faith and obedience thus in the innocent morning of their creation after magnifying them with holy gifts god suddenly proved the angels he gave them a new and wonderful revelation prophetic of the mystery of the incarnation 
and commanded their adoration of the eternal word their own illuminator in a nature made lower than their own when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world he saith and let all the angels of god adore him hebrews chapter one verse six they were tried by good in a difficult mystery and by their subjection and obedience they had to prove their faith and constancy those who stood their probation were confirmed in sanctity and passed to their reward in the beatific vision but those who yielded to pride and resisted proved their utter unfitness for union with god as they would not accept the truth from god they could not accept the god of truth as they would not subject themselves to god in one command they could not adhere to god for eternity number two the second reason for probation is that the outward call upon the inward powers may act as a kind of awakening shock upon the sleeping energies calling upon them to meet the new demand upon the spirit's faith and obedience it is a call to active leaving of one's narrow self to adhere to god despite of difficulty for it is one thing to receive light another to enter into that light one thing to obtain grace another to act with that grace but when an exterior revelation is added to the inward light or an exterior command to the inward grace or an exterior affliction to the inward gift of patience that exterior call acts as an outward impulse to summon and help the will to exercise her inward gifts and to use the powers divinely given to her as the preacher gives us an outward stimulation to use our inward grace so in the moment of probation god gives us an outward call to use our inward grace and give proof of our fidelity this trial is the culminating moment that determines the will to its root deciding the habit and condition of the soul like a profession after a novitiate it is said of the interests of this present life that everybody has one opportunity which followed up leads on to fortune however this may be the hour of probation is such an opportunity for the gaining of eternal life number three the third reason is that through probation every spirit may obtain the knowledge of herself what her weakness is what her limitations and what the strength received from god we must consider says st elred how every creature is changeable if rational creatures were not changeable as well as others they would not need their creator's help as they could neither advance to what is better nor fail to what is worse but as they are changeable they require to know this and to learn by experience what is written my good is to adhere to god that every mouth may be stopped and every creature may be subject to god but for angel and man to discover their mutability they required to be tempted and through temptation to be proved and through probation to be confirmed that the victorious may receive glory and they who sin through evident perversity may give proof of the justice that befalls them for it concerns that beatitude and glory which the beneficent creator bestows on his rational creatures that their merits be known to flow from the grace of their creator and that their happiness is his gift as well as their reward there is another important view of the self-revelation brought out by trial as the child who obtains the grace of baptism before the age of reason might never know the divine gifts received without the instruction of the church the newly created angel or man 
who received the gifts of grace immediately upon creation might confound those gifts with the natural powers were they not taught by the probation of some difficult revelation and command that their nature is weak and needs the special help and grace of god to believe and to obey number four the fourth reason for probation is to form develop and invigorate the virtues by which the soul is perfected for god the first probation is the trial of faith because as st thomas observes faith is the first virtue that submits the mind to god the second is the trial of obedience because thereby the will is made subject to the will of god through humility temperance and patience the virtues whereby we renounce ourselves and overcome our weakness our subjection to god is made thorough free and constant but the final end of all probation is to test our trust and to try our confidence in god this is summed up in the universal virtue of obedience which embraces all the virtues for to believe the eternal mysteries because god has revealed them is the obedience of faith to abstain from all things that god has forbidden is the obedience of justice and to love all that god commands us to love is the obedience of charity to be passively subject to god is to be only like the things that perish to be actively subject to his sovereign will is alone worthy of a free and intelligent creature when god therefore gave to the newly created man the precious endowment of grace and the dignity of original justice he would not give him entrance into heaven until he had proved himself worthy by the active exercise of obedience this was so necessary and so befitting the divine providence that although god knew that he would transgress the precept and fall into evil he nevertheless imposed the command upon him to abstain from the tree of knowledge and left him to his liberty yet not without giving him ample grace to enable him to obey the mysterious command the reason for man's probation has been pithily expressed in the following terms by st augustine it was needful for man under the dominion of god to be proved in one way or another that through obedience he might deserve his lord for it may be truly affirmed that obedience is the one virtue of every creature acting under the power of god and that the vice we call disobedience that swelling tumour of the creature using her own power to her ruin is the first and the greatest vice but unless the man had been commanded something he would have had nothing to enable him to know that god was his master in further explanation the great doctor says in another place god planted no evil tree in paradise but he himself was better than what he forbade to be touched he forbade this to show that the rational soul is not in her own power and ought to be subject to god and to keep the order of salvation through obedience for this reason therefore god called the tree he forbade to be touched the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because when touched despite of his command it brought the experience of sin and the knowledge of the good of obedience and of the evil of disobedience number five the fifth reason for probation is to interrogate the soul whether she is disposed for greater gifts and is able to respond to them with fidelity can she change greater trials into patience and so become more solid can she transmute greater humiliations into profounder humility and so enlarge her capacity for divine things 
and be more perfectly subject to god can that soul transform greater manifestations of the divine love into greater acts of charity and so become more closely united with god the lord your god trieth you that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul or not trial alone observes st augustine can show to each one what gifts are hidden in him to leave other examples the virgin may be solicitous for the things of the lord and how she may please god but how does she know but that some secret infirmity leaves her unprepared for martyrdom yet some poor woman over whom she prefers herself may be already prepared to drink the cup of the lord's humiliation the cup he gave his disciples those true lovers of his sublimity how does that virgin know that she may not be ready to become a saint thecla whilst that poor woman is ready to become a saint crispina she has assuredly no proof of this gift before trial the deeper regions of the soul are searched for their purification by keener and more secret trials which cleanse away the latent inclinations of self-love and prepare the mysterious recesses of the soul for the entrance of the holy spirit with a diviner light and purer flame of charity why god proved the angels himself and proved them with good is obvious on a moment's consideration there was no evil in the universe until through occasion of their trial a portion of the angels fell but why god ordained that man should be proved through the temptations of those fallen spirits is one of those profound mysteries whose highest reason is beyond our knowledge yet he has not left the children of faith without light to know that in this permissive part of his providence he contemplates the greatest amount of final good it was essential that man should be drawn out of himself to enable him to enter into better things and trial is ordained to bring him forth from himself but as he is of a different nature from the angels he must have a different probation the angels are pure activities and only require the right direction of their unceasing contemplation and action to be perfected whilst the human soul is encumbered with a body inclined to earth and earthly things made lower than the angels yet for the same divine end as they man has to acquire the spiritual virtues that bring him to god in an earthly body upon an earthly scene and has to keep that body obedient to his spirit it is evident therefore that he will require not only a different but a more protracted trial than the angels owing to the gross elements with which his spirit is combined the slower speed of his operations and the natural obstructions that retard his development he will require such a trial as will make his soul active animated and vigilant in spiritual things notwithstanding the corporal organs through which the spirit acts and their tendency to those sensual attractions that impede the free ascent of the spirit to things invisible and divine but this will be best accomplished by a life of labor on the earthly side and a conflict with spiritual powers on the invisible side adam was therefore placed in the garden of paradise not merely to enjoy its beauty but to dress and keep it and after receiving a prohibition for the exercise of his obedience satan was permitted to tempt him that through combat against a spiritual adversary his spiritual powers might be awakened and brought into vigorous exercise thus in the words of job is the life of man upon earth a warfare and his days as the days of a hireling because of labour 
job chapter seven verse one when the exigencies of warfare call for labour and peril the commander spares not his soldiers but when the victory is gained he gives the greatest honour to the bravest the master of the household gives the chief work to the best workman but when the toil is over he rewards them the best so also is the providence of god he spares not the good from toils and conflicts but rewards them beyond all measure in the end end of lecture one part two lecture one part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture one the divine law of probation part three we have come into the midst of perils that are awful to human weakness and fears and most terrible in their effects upon the cowardice of unbelief this dark side of the universal plan can only be lighted up by contemplating the grand finale to which the whole drama of life is moving the bright side illuminates the dark side of the divine arrangements that bright side from which the sovereign light of the supreme goodness of god is shining upon us the dark side comes like that of the earth against the sun from our own limited mind and feeble will which god would have to be intelligent and strong for which reason he gives us light and grace and with them labour and conflicts that we may grow strong in light and virtue it belongs to his magnificence to raise up the lowly and strengthen the weak but if the lowly refuse to be raised and the weak to be strengthened in the combats of grace against evil god does no violence to their freedom but they must sink lower in being vanquished and become weaker and encounter greater darkness if there be an unchristian error an unbelief that is widespread scornful desolating withering to souls in this sensual age it is the disbelief in the power of evil spirits to tempt man to evil after the belief and experience of all ages and races of men pagan prophetic and christian in the malignant activity of those evil powers on the earth it has now become a distinguishing mark of the faithful christian man to act upon the conviction that the devils have powers of seduction in this world against which he has to guard and protect himself even the weak in faith are too apt to slumber under the heavy atmosphere of the sensual world and to forget the apostolic admonition be sober and watch because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour whom resist ye strong in faith knowing that the same affliction befalleth your brethren in the world one peter chapter five verses eight and nine wide and far men are ready in their pride to think if thought it be and to their own ignominy that all their evil thoughts their sensual movements and their malicious acts come of their own original instigation rather than allow that they have been tempted by any power beyond themselves this is a pride of egotism in evil of independence in wrong like that of the evil spirits themselves it is true that we are more conscious of our adversaries when our will is opposed to them than when they hold possession of the will but the proud take a dark honour to themselves in claiming the whole origin of their evil deeds as though this could make them independent of the tempter 
but those who will not allow that satan moves them to evil are seldom disposed to feel that god moves them to their good it is true again that satan and his angels are not the grotesque creatures of their imagination except as all evil is grotesque from want of true form and just proportion they are spirits with the swiftness and subtlety of spirits and therefore except in symbolical shapes they cannot be imagined more than angels can but they are spirits in terrible disorder and their wills are distorted with fearful malice were they alone in the midst of us where would be our safety but god and his angels are nearer with help to the man of faith so near that the gross veil of the body alone intervenes between our soul and the presence of god and our guarding angels as it regards our probation we may consider this conflict with evil spirits on three sides on the side of god on the side of man and on the side of the evil spirits themselves on the side of god we may reflect that his great design is to show forth the power of his grace this is accomplished by overcoming evil with good by exercising his providence in the highest degree in overruling the conflict between good and evil and directing the final issue to the order of justice rewarding the virtues brought out in the conflict and punishing the evil that sought their destruction by drawing a vast amount of good out of the conflict to the honour of his grace and the glory of souls by causing the pride and independence of those souls that reject his divine help whereby they might have overcome to be revealed and finally though first in the divine intention to crown his creation by the intervention of a divine combatant to repair the losses of man in the conflict when all seems desperate because human pride has discarded the help of god the almighty sends forth his eternal word in the feeble panoply of human nature and by his humble obedience satan and his angels are conquered and put to shame pride is shown to be weak in presence of humility man and the creation are restored to god and the mercy of god shines through the grace of christ in unspeakable majesty on the side of man we have already given five reasons why he should be proved and to these we may add that what he most stands in need of is to be advanced in humility because upon this advancement all his gifts and virtues depend but nothing can be more calculated to humble him than the assaults of evil spirits and the fear of being brought beneath their power or more suited to awaken him to care and vigilance than the sense of always living in the presence of his enemies yet all our temptations are not from those evil spirits many have their beginning in the promptings of our self-love in the concupiscences of our inferior nature in our evil thought and lax will but the sense of being always in the presence of malignant adversaries ready to take hold of our weaknesses is a cause of humility and fear that prompts us to be vigilant in watching over the precious treasure of grace and virtue at every point the custody of the thoughts and senses the protective arms of prayer and self-discipline and the resting patiently on the inward strength of god are the true and safe means of guarding the soul from the hostile incursions of our spiritual enemies as we have no strength but with god we have a double motive for keeping nigh to him the love of god and the fear of our enemies 
saint maximus the martyr has summed up the traditional reasons prevailing in his time why god permits this conflict five reasons he says are affirmed why god grants us the conflict with the demons the first they say is this that in combating their attacks we may learn to distinguish the vices from the virtues the second that the virtue gained by laborious conflict may be firm and invincible the third that in advancing to virtue we may not become proud or high-minded but may obtain the practical wisdom of humble things the fourth that through these very temptations from spirits so vile we may be led to hold the vices in abhorrence and the fifth reason to be added to these is that after our affections have been purified we may never forget our infirmities nor the power from on high that helped us through the conflict on the side of the evil spirits themselves those mediators of pride as saint augustine calls them have an intense hatred of god whom nevertheless they strive to imitate seeking to establish in the world a dominion through pride that god establishes through love and beneficence they have also a special hatred of man because he bears the image of god and because by their revolt against god in the form of man they fell in their disorder they have a certain imitation of the good angels having their chiefs their offices and special ministries in which they are active day and night they lay snares for our senses and watch our weaknesses now violent now cunning now crafty using their great subtlety and great experience of human nature they are keen versatile accommodating persevering even condescending that by little and little they may gain their ends they have great power over the proud and the impure who may be justly called their imitators in their dark insinuations they caricature the light of grace and affect to show as angels of light in their wicked instigations and allurements and their deceptive promises of good things they grotesquely imitate the operations of grace they seek to draw the worship of god to themselves in idols charms spirit manifestations witchcrafts and other superstitions they inspire proud and subtle minds eager with curiosity for the unknown with false and proud philosophies that imitate their own revolt from god and worship of themselves they may be truly called the apes of god yet god has set bounds to their action beyond which they cannot go were it otherwise there would be nothing safe from their destructive power david calls them the strong ones our lord calls their chief the strong one armed and saint paul the prince of this world and the god of this age whilst he designates their whole host as rulers of the world of this darkness yet they can do no violence to the soul they can compel us to nothing against our will they can tempt us as they are permitted through the bodily senses and so through the imagination but have no license to touch the soul unless by her own will she gives herself into their power this is fully shown in the extreme temptations of holy job god is faithful says st paul who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able but will make also with temptation a way of escape that you may be able to bear it one corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen but when a soul abandons god and the will takes to pride or to luxury in the absence of grace and good will the devils have great power 
the dire result of which are seen in the heathen world both ancient and modern but they assume the most injurious aspects when human culture lends its sharp weapons to a soul immersed in egotism the devils are strong through human unbelief and through vicious self-love resist the devil says st james and he will fly from you st james chapter four verse seven set your will in the right direction and though he may be troublesome he cannot hurt you he can seldom even be troublesome unless you give him your attention give your mind to better things and your body to better enjoyment than awaiting his pleasure in idleness hold yourself to god in patience and prayer and his tremendous temptations cannot lay hold of you tempt not the tempter and then his offensive importunities will inspire you with a disgust that will turn you round to those better things it is the fostering of minor troubles till they swell to a flood of sadness and discouragement that gives the devil a turbid pool in which to cast his nets take my counsel says the illuminated tolerus if those minor troubles befall you let them drop be not disturbed turn your heart to god do not look at them do not dispute with them answer them not a word only turn your mind from them and let them drop the words of st james are profoundly instructive every man is tempted by his own concupiscence being drawn away and the lord st james chapter one verse fourteen our own uncontrolled inclinations and propensities supply the fuel and the devil sets the match and blows the flame he weaves seductive pictures for the imagination and infuses a false sweetness into the senses and so allures to sin where does he find the materials in our own concupiscences senses fancies and memories and to our own self-love he adds his own peculiar sting of pride then when concupiscence has brought forth death he changes his policy the joy of sin is changed to gloom and sadness and he suggests the fear and dread of returning to god there is a shame a confusion a reluctance even to look towards god and he urges the victim in his power to recklessness that he may escape the cries of conscience yet all this comes less from the devil's power than from our own want of virtue and vigilance everywhere the sacred scriptures enjoin the cultivation of faith and the watchful eye against the approach of danger as our safe defence against the evil powers take the celebrated description by st paul of the full-armed christian put ye on he says the armour of god that you may be able to withstand the deceits of the devil for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the world of this darkness against the spirits of wickedness in high places therefore take unto you the armour of god that you may be able to resist in the evil day and to stand in all things perfect stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of justice and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace in all things taking the shield of faith wherewith you may be able to extinguish the fiery darts of the most wicked one and take unto you the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god by all prayer and supplication praying at all times in the spirit and in the same watching with all instance and supplication ephesians chapter six verses eleven through eighteen 
the whole defensive armour of the christian against the evil spirits which the apostle elsewhere calls the armour of light is here reduced to faith justice and watchfulness in prayer they dread the light of christ tremble at his power and fly at the sound of his name conquered by his divine humility those proud spirits cannot stand his presence nor the presence of those who invoke his name with faith his cross put forth with faith has the same power it is the altar of his sacrifice the sign of his conquest the memorial of his humility the creed of the devout christian the terror of all proud spirits when heathenism possessed the world and the power of the evil spirits was at its strongest the fathers tell us that the christians signed the cross upon every occasion as their armour against the powers of evil and tertullian gives us this remarkable testimony to the confidence which the christians had in the power of faith over the evil spirits in his famous apology for the christians addressed to the heathen authorities of the roman empire he declares that their gods are evil spirits and offers to prove his assertion by a public and judicial test let any one he says be brought before your courts of justice who is known to be agitated by a demon or possessed by a god he then describes the usual signs of such admitted possession then he says let any christian command that spirit to speak and if he who pretends to be a god does not confess in truth that he is a demon not daring to lie to a christian let that audacious christian be put to death on the spot the loathing mixed with dread evinced by unbelievers against the symbol of humility and salvation is as mysterious in its cause if well considered as the terror that it inspires in the evil spirits it is the symbol of self-denial as well as the symbol of humility for they that are christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences galatians chapter five verse twenty four it is neither wonderful nor unjust st augustine observes that the unclean man should be subject to the unclean spirit not because of nature but of uncleanness the stronger nature of the angel captivates the weaker nature of the man because they are associated together in vice yet the pride of the conqueror is destroyed by the humility of our redeemer when the eyes of saint antony were opened to see all that is commonly invisible in this world he beheld it covered with snares and pitfalls laid for souls by the evil spirits and exclaimed in astonishment lord how can all these be escaped and the answer came by humility the humility of faith is clear-sighted the humility of charity is quick to feel the present danger and quick to turn to christ for help humility has nothing on which the evil spirits can lay hold the spirit of god dwells in the humble and guards them from the approach of evil god hath chosen the weak in their own estimation for the dwelling of his strength and he perfects his power in their infirmity the illusions with which those spirits strong in pride but weak in power provoke the humble servants of god fall back and strike themselves and augment the crown of glory for those who by humility avoid the snares laid for their ruin st john chrysostom says to his flock if any one asks you why god allows the devils to be here give him this answer so far from injuring those who are alert and watchful over themselves they are positively useful they don't mean it their intention is wicked but fortitude knows how to use their malice 
if the elect are sometimes touched by their infectious breath and for a while pine under the blast they gird themselves with the arms of penance and after this experience of their turpitude they return more humble and secure to the conflict whilst those vanquished spirits fall back upon themselves to feel the horrors of their malignant condition be it ever remembered however in practice that the true and safe law of combat is to turn away the mind and heart from their temptations phantasms and foul suggestions which is only done effectually by raising the mind to some better object and the heart to some better affection and in turning the whole man to his duty in the sight of god for we are so made that the soul cannot be taken hold of except by that to which we give attention and the certain way of delivering our attention from evil is to turn the mind and affections right round with a vigorous will to the opposite good hence our lord has taught us to pray that we may not be led into temptation that is that we may not give to it our mind and will we must now conclude this exposition of the divine law of probation creation is weak the grace of god is strong the end we have to reach is high above us only the power of god can bear us up to god our will is free and if we follow the divine attraction the grace of that attraction will bring us to his presence but if we choose the attraction of these base and low things among which we are placed for our probation and prefer the sordid limits of our nature to the heights of the divine goodness we remain in the bonds of our disordered existence distressed in spirit and far from god the whole plan of our happiness is defeated from our want of generosity what does god ask of us not that we should be stronger than we are but that we should confess our weakness and accept his strength for god has provided all things for us in great abundance nothing is wanting but our will if we are in a low position and short of sight he has sent forth his light and his truth to lead and guide us if we are weak of will he sends his grace to strengthen and lift up our will if we are uncertain of his ways he has sent his son in our likeness to teach us his ways who has ordained his church for every place and time that his truth and will may be always at our doors our will may be weak very weak he asks for that will that he may make it strong our abuse of our will may have defiled our soul he asks for that will that he may make us clean all that god asks of us is our will when given to him in whatever condition he will make it good but without our will every provision to help and strengthen us is in vain they cannot be ours for the further helping of our will god has established a great order of probation as an external force to awaken our will into action and help it to enter into his inward light and grace this order of probation he has varied and changed to suit the different states and conditions of his intelligent creatures he has employed fear as well as grace he has given outward commands as well as inward light he has ordained a visible authority to enforce his inward voice he has set evil before us to inspire the dread of evil and has brought us into conflict with the evil spirits that we may know how fearful it is to fall from the living god the order of probation was also directed in its provisions to bring out exercise and fortify the will 
through the vigorous virtues produced by conflict with our evil inclinations as well as with the evil powers with the law of redemption and grace came the laws of humility and self-denial in the clearest terms and through the divinest example that by exhausting the fuel of sin and extinguishing the flame of selfish desire the heavenly gifts may work upon our will with less and less resistance and attract our affections to follow their leading to the god of all goodness from whom they descend end of lecture one part three lecture two part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture two on the nature of christian virtue part one whatsoever things are true whatsoever modest whatsoever just whatsoever holy whatsoever lovely whatsoever of good report if there be any virtue if any praise of discipline think of these things philippians chapter four verse eight plato has said that were virtue to appear in visible form to the eyes of men she would awaken in them a wonderful love virtue however is not a goddess but a gift of god st paul knew a diviner virtue than plato could imagine and saw that virtue with the attributes of truth justice and purity of modesty holiness and loveliness as commended for the praise of discipline and as most worthy of our thoughts but when virtue in all perfection did appear in visible form to the eyes of men when christ the wisdom of god and the power of god was seen and heard and touched by men the humble alone were drawn to him with wondering love the sensual and the proud scorned and crucified him something more than human eyes is required to love that virtue which descends from god we cannot love that of which there is no element within us and as the divine grace is the principle of christian virtue we first require the grace of humility to open our eyes to the divine beauty of that virtue which alone is worthy of god christian virtue differs so widely from natural virtue that its power begins from god it is an active reflection of the moral attributes of god and a certain partaking such as the creature can receive of the virtue of god giving the soul an active resemblance to her creator and a divine attraction to unite her spirit with him this virtue begins in faith and is perfected in charity and is the true nobility of the soul its atmosphere is the divine light its principle the divine grace its final object god himself as the infinite virtue of god and the supreme beauty of his eternal action are beyond our imitation reach or comprehension he has given us the form of virtue that is proper to our nature in the human life and example of his incarnate word the subject of virtue is the human will it is of great practical importance to understand this clearly it may be defined in general terms as the disposition of the will to conform the soul to truth and justice the latin word virtus from which the word virtue comes is derived from vir and intus signifying the inward force or energy of man the greek words arete and dunamis are used in much the same sense as the latin word virtus 
and in the sacred scriptures these words almost invariably signify interior vigour power or force of soul it must be remembered that the soul as a spiritual substance is simple and one but it is susceptible of spiritual light and force in proportion to its purity as it receives the light of truth it is mind as it is an active power it is will when st paul tells the thessalonians that the work of faith is in power he uses the word that signifies both power and virtue and so in many other places the word virtue still retains with us the sense of power or effective strength or when we speak of the healing virtue of certain plants the object of these remarks is to impress clearly on your mind that virtue always implies a habit of force in the will either to act or to endure but although force of will is the foundation of virtue it is not actual virtue of itself because that force may be given either to virtue or to vice virtue is the right direction of the force of the will to its right objects the will is a free cause exercising the forces possessed by the soul from its own elective choice in short virtue is the strength of the soul because it acts in order and vice is the weakness of the soul because it acts in disorder but christian virtue is much more the strength of the soul because in it the will is helped by the supernatural power of divine grace the virtues are the interior fountains from which our good actions spring like fruit from a well-sunned tree but the vices are the sources from which our evil acts break out like corruption from a festering wound both are habits of the soul and both habits are increased by exercise but our virtuous habits incline us to good and our vicious habits to evil virtue has been defined by st thomas after st augustine to be a good quality or habit of the soul by which we rightly live and which cannot be put to an evil use but this last cause requires a distinction as a good habit of the soul no virtue can be put to an evil use but we may make that virtue an object of the mind or of the imagination and as such it may be evilly used as when any one despises that virtue or treats it with pride or with levity but it cannot be put to an evil use as it is a habit of the will the most accurate thinker among the heathen philosophers has beautifully explained the nature of virtue as being a certain force productive and conservative of good for the effect of virtue is to make the person good as well as his work and to perfect the soul according to the quality and degree of the virtue exercised virtue then is not a sentiment or a feeling or any conscious enjoyment of one's own goodness as some people are blind enough to imagine the pleasure of virtue is derived from its object and is a result of its exercise whilst the reward of christian virtue is neither the virtue itself nor the enjoyment of it but the god of virtue as st ambrose says he who quits himself and cleaves to virtue loses his own and gains what is eternal although the virtues are not created or born with us but have to be acquired yet we have the preparation for them in the image of god and the powers of the soul in the fundamental appetite for good and in the light of reason these are the preparations for the virtues of the natural man their light is from the natural reason 
and they go not beyond the bounds of nature nor exceed the powers of nature they grow into habits by exercise which strengthens all good inclinations but although the natural man is capable of knowing god as the creator and ruler of the world and the judge of consciences giving natural rewards to the good and punishments to the evil his natural virtue can never bring his soul into union with god this is the work of supernatural and infused virtue here begins the marvellous difference between the natural man and the christian man so enormous is the distance between created good and divine good between the imperfect creature and the all-perfect creator and so infinite the difference between the natural qualities of the soul and the divine attributes of god that no natural power in the creation can possibly raise the soul to god to effect this great object a divine power must descend from god and enter the soul of man purifying and sanctifying his nature illuminating him with divine light strengthening and attracting him to ascend above himself in will and desire by the infusion of a divine virtue which by the acceptance and cooperation of his will he makes his own this is the mystery of grace this sanctifying influence is the root and force of those divine habits in man which we call the theological virtues of faith hope and charity whereby the soul holds direct communication with god these infused habits given first in baptism are the seeds of a divine life above the life of nature and the principles of all the christian virtues they enable us to give our mind heart and works to god as to the supreme good and the final end of our life and being they are habits because so long as they are not rejected by the vices they abide permanently in the soul and incline us to exercise the virtues of which they are the principles and these habits are perfected by the actual grace which constantly feeds them and gives them activity and by the cooperation of the will all virtue is in the will as in its human cause it is necessary to repeat this simple truth because some minds are so confused that they almost fancy that each virtue and each vice is a separate will the other powers of the soul are the subjects of the will and the will acts through them and puts them in motion the intellectual virtues for example such as faith understanding knowledge and wisdom dwell in the mind as the subject in which they reside but the powers of the mind are moved by the will and decided by the will upon which they wholly depend for their free action as it is our will that moves our corporal eyes that fixes their attention when we wish to see and turns them away when we wish not to see so are the eyes of the understanding moved by the will which searches for the truth through them adheres to the truth when found refuses its consent to falsehood and suspends its ascent when the truth does not appear hence the folly of the vulgar saying that a man is not responsible for his thoughts or his opinions for the will is responsible for the whole action of the mind as far as it is voluntary there are intellectual vices as well as virtues vices that destroy all soundness of judgment but the will is the cause of those vices which are always allied with pride sensuality or passion virtue therefore as st augustine remarks is the good use of the free will 
if we would understand the right management of the soul this cannot be too much insisted on that in all its branchings virtue is reducible to the good use of the will the will moves all the other powers and moves them with ease and vigour in proportion to the force of the will and its habitual exercise in virtue but as the christian virtues go beyond the scope of nature in them the force of will depends upon the divine gifts that assist our natural weakness and the prosperity of these virtues comes on the subjection of the will to the powers of grace that its action may be illuminated and sustained by the light and power that descends from god another point that should be clearly understood is the essential simplicity of the will what looks on the surface like multiplicity in the will is caused by the number of different objects with which the one simple will is engaged each one succeeding the other but as in a dissolving view one picture still lingers for a time on the canvas whilst another is growing over it so in the will the last object with which it has been engaged may still quiver there whilst attention is being directed to another when the will leaps rapidly from one thing to another and especially when those things are at discord the action of the will becomes confused perplexed and troubled but when the will acts tranquilly without hurry or hasty flitting from object to object and especially when it is steadily engaged on some one good course of action it is concentrated strong and peaceful and we realize its beautiful simplicity the exercise of every habit of virtue includes five distinct elements these are the object of the virtue the motive the law of the virtue the decision and the action the object of a virtue is that upon which or towards which or against which it is exercised the object decides the nature of the virtue and gives the name to it each virtue is distinguished from all the rest and obtains its special character from its object the object of faith for example is the invisible truth revealed to us by god and in adhering to that truth the will adheres to the god of truth the object of justice is to give to all what is their due the object of temperance is to hold back the will from whatever is noxious excessive or dangerous to the soul the motive is the end we have in view and the considerations that influence and determine the decision the stronger the motive the more firm animated and determined will be the decision that leads to action the object of the virtue may also be its motive and especially is this the case with the theological virtues where god is both the object of the virtue and the chief motive although that virtue may be strengthened by various considerations for several motives may be entertained and may combine to help us to decide upon our chief motive and to act upon one or more motives this is the secret of raising the lower virtues into the region of the higher virtues so that they may partake of the higher virtue by acting on its motive for it is the motive that gives value to the virtue because it is the final end to which the virtue is directed by the will if a man helps the poor because it becomes his station in life or because he accounts it honourable that no one in distress should leave his door unrelieved this man has no higher motive or end to his virtue than his own honour which is the heathen virtue of self-respect beginning and ending in the man himself if another assists the poor from the natural feeling of sympathy and kindliness 
and looks to no higher motive this is the natural virtue of benevolence but nothing beyond if the christian helps the helpless not merely from kindliness but for the love of god the motive is charity and whilst his object is to help his suffering neighbour his final motive is the love of god as all the virtues whatever their object can be directed to god as to their chief motive and final end they can all be commanded and ruled by the love of god thus every virtue may be raised to the dignity and excellence of a divine virtue by accepting its motive and what rises no higher than a natural virtue when done from natural motives may ascend to a supernatural virtue when under the influence of grace it looks to a divine motive the intention is the face of the soul says st bernard and a different intention constitutes a different fact a work is then truly excellent says st augustine when the intention of the workman is struck out from the love of god and returns again and again to rest in charity what a prodigious waste of value is caused to the virtues by exercising them on low motives and with low intentions when they might be exercised on the very highest motives the higher the motive the nearer the soul is carried towards god and this is true even in the lowest occupations man sees in the face but god in the heart man looks to the present value of the virtues as they affect this life but god looks at the inward motive and intention as it regards eternity the soul may draw near to god whilst the body is humbled down to the lowest toil but this the world cannot see there is a sublimity arising from the high flight of the intention above the meanness of the work whilst both unite in the will of the workman which angels may admire but which the world that sees but the mean work can never understand the poor man rich in faith who toils for the love of god and is generous of the little fruit of his labours is much nearer to heaven than the rich man who spends a fortune in good works from no higher motive than his natural inclination to benevolence the light in the mind presents the law of virtue to the will as well as the motives for its exercise but the object of the virtue may be presented to the mind or to the senses according to the nature of that object thus we have the object of the virtue the law of the virtue and the motive of the virtue all these are external to the will although their influence is exercised upon the will to set it in motion but without the free judgment and decision of the will which is the beginning of action and the carrying out of that decision which is the perfecting of action there is no virtue the two formal elements of virtue therefore are decision and action the decision of the will is that by which we judge and decide by the light of the law upon the motives entertained to do this or that act of virtue or to follow out a series of acts the chief element of virtue as st thomas points out is the decision of the will for where there is true decision action follows in its due time and place as a matter of course virtue then is neither more nor less than the good and right management of the will in its decisions and actions the strength of a habit of virtue shows itself in the firmness of its decisions and in the tranquil vigour of its actions restlessness and excitement betray weakness tranquillity is a quality that belongs to solid virtue it is one thing to see the better things 
another to decide the will to seek them and another to do them a clear sight of the good to be done is the first but not the only requisite for decision there must also be a wish to do them and this wish is awakened and animated by feeling the motives that determine the will to decision place a dish of ripe fruit before a child and you not only draw his attention but awaken his appetite and so move him to desire he feels the wish before he tastes and it is less the sight than the appetite that determines his desire so it is with the things of the soul there must not only be the sight but the appetite of the beautiful things of justice hence our lord has said blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice for they shall be filled st matthew chapter five verse six end of lecture two part one lecture two part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture two on the nature of christian virtue part two where the will is enchained to self-love or relaxed under the influences of vanity or is languid by reason of sensual indulgence the spiritual habits of virtue are weak and what are called good resolutions are feeble and generally speaking ineffectual the spiritual appetite of such persons is commonly low and queasy it wants self-denial to give it tone and humility to give it hunger the phrase good resolutions is too often doubtful if not painful in the mouths of persons who pretend to piety these good resolutions are often little more than weak and wavering pictures in the imagination or words parroted by the lips rather than decisions of the will that lead to action who is ignorant of those strings of good resolutions that lead to nothing who has not loathed the excuse put forward for some never do well that his intentions are good who is not familiar with the significant proverb that hell is paved with good intentions these are the intentions of the imagination fancies without reality beautifully painted trees that will neither live nor bear fruit the habit of making weak and ineffectual resolutions doomed in their birth to go no farther can scarcely be called a virtuous habit although sometimes truly good intentions may fail through human weakness or some other cause but a habit of make-believes weakens our hold on virtue and feebles the soul by indulging in pretentious nothings and gives occasion first to self-complacency and then to discouragement because of constant failure it is far better to form a few real decisions that will come to practice than to formulate a number of imaginary intentions that will have no other result than to dishearten and lower the courage of the soul this is but playing and trifling with the virtues as if they were not the goods of the soul not of priceless value but something not worth being in earnest about if you make a promise to another person you feel dishonoured unless you keep your promise you are cautious therefore how you make such promises and how you neglect your engagement if you make an engagement with yourself unless some just reason prevents its fulfilment you ought to feel equally discontented with yourself if you neglect to fulfil your engagement for this breaks down your self-discipline if you neglect a promise made to god the matter is more grave 
if you deliberately and formally make the promise of a better thing to god it partakes the nature of a vow you see then how demoralizing it is to the soul to make engagements lightly and inconsiderately with the virtues as if in grave matters you trifled with them as we should shrink from being dishonest either in word or deed with our neighbours let us not use dishonest pretensions with ourselves or before god as the decision of the will is the essential principle in practice on which all virtue turns it is all important to understand by what means decision may be made firm strong and conducive to action those means may be reduced to three when experience shows that ordinary resolutions fail it is evident that there has been a want of decision in the will the first thing to be done is to pray for light upon that virtue and for grace to bring the will to action that you may obtain that force from god which you have not in yourself the second is to bring the will under the light of the virtue by reflecting upon it and by considering its motives in god and before god that the will may feel its beauty and justice and the good that will arise from its exercise the spiritual appetite for the good of the virtue will thus be awakened and touched by its motives will gain some impulse to decide the will to act to read some solid instruction on that particular virtue and make that instruction a matter of thought and reflection will greatly help to interest you in that virtue and to saturate the will with desire of it great examples that exhibit the virtue in action will also do much to inspire a love and a taste for its beauty and value and draw the heart to a veneration of its excellence as that which is most pleasing to god above all the meditating on the example of our lord jesus christ the life and perfect form of every virtue and the fountain of its grace will not only warm the will to decision but bring the grace that gives decision the third means invaluable for true decision is to take counsel with yourself the ordinary business of life ought to teach you that a vague resolution is no decision when you have anything real to do in the matters of this life's duties you shape out the whole line of action in your mind you take counsel with yourself when that is done you see your way clearly half your work is done you become interested in it you feel it it is like a part of yourself your will is decided you set to work and would feel something wanting to you if you did not carry it out but it is the same will that you have to manage in the duties of the soul and to manage by the same methods counsel shall keep thee says the proverb and prudence shall preserve thee in taking such counsel with yourself never see small difficulties and don't let your imagination frighten you with the contrary interests of nature remembering that it is the object of virtue to overcome nature and make it a sacrifice to god counsel before resolution makes the decision clear definite and practical counsel following immediately upon resolution is the beginning of action and the pledge that it will be carried out for we repeat the soul becomes interested in what she has thought out is encouraged by clear views of her way and is warmed with the desire of accomplishing what she has diligently planned thus every step in counsel gives its impulse to the will these general rules are applicable to all the virtues because they are derived from the nature of the soul 
as those who first learn a language have constantly to go back to the rules of grammar so those who first begin in earnest the noble exercise of the virtues have constantly to go back in the rules of managing the will but as those who have acquired the habit of speaking correctly think no more of the rules of speech but use them by habit and unconsciously those who are well trained in the rules of managing the will can wisely exercise the virtues by force of habit without thinking of the methods upon which they act we have now to consider the virtues themselves according to their distinctions their unity their order and their progress the will is one but the virtues are many they do not divide the will but the attention of the will as the eye is one but is occupied by many things in succession so is the one will engaged by many things in succession each object that affects the will in a different way gives rise to a different virtue either those objects are good and satisfying to the soul and attract the will to desire and seek them or they are evil or injurious to the soul and have to be denied and rejected or they are an inevitable trial and cause of suffering to the soul and have to be endured take the three theological virtues whose objects are the greatest good of the soul god is the object of them all but of each in a different way because each of these virtues has its special object in god the revealed truth of god is one object of the soul and its chief motive is his divine authority it is possessed by the mind through the adhesion of the will and it forms the virtue of faith the divine promises that god is all good and mighty to fulfil are another magnificent object of the soul inseparable from god and to trust with all our good and desire to these promises is the virtue of hope but as god is the sovereign life and good who loves us and has made us for himself to be partakers of his life and good the love of god above all things forms the virtue of charity if we turn to the objects of the moral virtues we find ourselves placed in a variety of relations both with god and with our fellow-men and that these relations bring many claims upon us and call upon us for many things that are due to them such as honour reverence respect obedience duty service protection love trust gratitude and the giving to each his own these and the like form the virtue of justice we find again that sufferings come to the soul as well as to the body in this life of probation they are consequently the object of the will which exercises the virtues of fortitude and patience by enduring them in a right spirit and from elevated motives and so preserves the soul from perturbation anger or any other weakness of the kind there are other objects that bear upon us through our inferior appetites whether spiritual or carnal which when unlawfully or unwisely indulged are noxious to the soul and even to the body giving rise to disturbing defiling or destructive vices such as pride vanity uncleanness gluttony inebriety inordinate curiosity vices of the tongue or pen and the corrupting influence of evil communications but these and the like are controlled or kept away from the will by the virtues of temperance humility and modesty the due order measure and harmony of the virtues is another and superior good of the soul which is regulated by the virtue of prudence 
and it is a maxim of the wise that no virtue is a virtue without prudence these examples will show how every virtue is determined by its object and by the special way in which that object affects the will and that object gives to the virtue its special character and degree of excellence and to the will its special habit and mode of action when we speak of the superior and inferior will we mean the different inclinations of one and the same will according as it tends to superior or to inferior things for whilst the will is solicited on the superior side by the light of justice and the attraction of divine things it is solicited on the inferior side by the blind appetites and passions of the body or by the equally blind appetite of self-love st paul by a figure calls these appetites and passions the will of the flesh although the body has not a will but inclinations and appetites that affect the will when the will obeys the grace of the holy spirit it enters into the will of god when it obeys the disorderly inclinations of the body it becomes the will of the flesh but it is the same will in a changed condition spiritual when it ascends to superior good carnal when it descends to the inferior appetites hence st paul says they who are according to the flesh mind the things that are of the flesh but they that are according to the spirit mind the things that are of the spirit romans chapter eight verse five the unity of the will in which the virtues meet and are exercised explains the unity of the virtues with each other and how they work together and lend their motives to each other this uniting of the virtues in one and the same will enables us also to understand how some virtues are not only particular but universal virtues as justice for instance enters into them all and prudence guides them all and charity gives its life to them all and humility subjects them all to god thus the four cardinal virtues enter into all the rest for prudence is the discretion of each virtue justice its rectitude fortitude its firmness and temperance its moderation if we accept the love of god which is supreme above all and is the end and life of all the virtues and in which there can be no excess every virtue holds a middle path between two opposing vices one of which is an excess and the other a defect thus faith stands between superstition as an odious excess and unbelief as a lamentable defect and hope holds on its course between presumption and despair prudence therefore guides all the virtues on their due path between excess and defect temperance protects each virtue from what would interfere with its purity and vigour fortitude enables each virtue to master its difficulties and to endure what cannot be overcome and justice gives to each virtue its due conformity with the eternal order expressed in the divine law not only do the general enter into the particular virtues and also into each other just as certain material elements are general and enter into each particular body such as air heat and electricity but the special virtues have also an intimate connection with each other and for the same reason that their habits exist in the same will although they do not always exist there in the same degree because they are not always equally exercised but from the fact of their being united together there springs this important rule that the exercise of any one virtue influences and strengthens all the others 
and especially those that are the nearest related to the virtue in exercise the fathers of the church who gave so much study to the interior operations of the soul are of one accord on this important subject st ambrose says where one virtue is chiefly put forth the others are present because the virtues are united and blended together st augustine remarks that although each virtue differs from the rest in character they can in no wise be separated from each other st jerome observes that whoever has one virtue has the others as well not as properties of that one but by participation st gregory tells us that no single virtue is a true virtue unless it be mingled with others and st bernard notes that the virtues cannot be separated from each other this however refers to the virtues possessed not to those that are wanting in the soul as when a person for example is devoid of charity how could the virtues in isolation encounter the conspiracy of the vices for we know that the vices act in combination and it is obvious that their combination can only be effectually encountered by the combination of the virtues we have dwelt upon this point because it is a great encouragement to know that in directly cultivating one virtue we are cultivating the others and especially those general virtues that enter into all the special virtues such as faith humility prudence justice and charity of the moral virtues the four that are called cardinal may be considered as a quadrature enclosing all the rest of the natural virtues penetrating them through and making them firm and secure on every side but when by the descent of divine grace we rise from the natural to the supernatural virtues we reach a higher quadrature that embraces the first with the divine power and lifts up the plane of the soul to the solidity of a cube in the four virtues of faith hope charity and humility faith brings the light of divine truth to all the virtues hope gives them their aspiration towards the divine good and lifts their courage charity brings them into union with god and humility subjects them to god with reverence and gratitude we may consider these divine virtues in a threefold order in the order in which they are implanted in the soul in the order of their excellence and merit or in the order in which they work our reparation the first of the supernatural virtues implanted is faith yet not without the grace of humility which submits the soul to faith for we must believe before we can know what to hope or love but in the order of excellence and holy operation charity is the first giving life and complete form to all the virtues and exerting its sweet empire over them the love of god is the sovereign virtue that all virtues serve and under whose rule and influence every virtue rises in dignity and power in building the soul as a habitation for god love is the master builder whom the other virtues serve and obey faith holds the light and exhibits the plan prudence regulates the work fortitude carries it on but charity is the chief architect in the order of our reparation the first work would seem to be humility for as the beginning of all our evil is the pride that goes before ruin the beginning of our rectification must be humility in consonance with this order of human preparation our blessed redeemer began both his example and his doctrine with humility blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven 
st matthew chapter five verse three but of the virtues that put us in order towards our final end what brings us directly with all our affections to god is charity st paul therefore says the end of the commandment is charity from a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned one timothy chapter one verse five the fear of god is so closely allied with humility that it will be well to consider how this virtue stands related with the rest in four distinct books of holy scripture we are taught that the fear of god is the beginning of wisdom wisdom is that sense and relish of good which the knowledge of divine things gives to the heart inspiring us with the love of them there are consequently two elements in wisdom knowledge and affection the fear of god is the beginning of wisdom as it respects knowledge because as the scripture says the fear of the lord driveth out sin ecclesiasticus chapter one verse twenty seven and when the soul is cleansed from sin the eye is open to truth in the second place fear is the flight of evil error and deception in the third place fear is wakeful and watchful and expels negligence according to that of the scripture he that feareth god neglecteth nothing ecclesiastes chapter seven verse nineteen in the fourth place fear disperses the tumour of pride and introduces humility which disposes the heart to wisdom although the first beginning of fear is servile this prepares the soul for chaste filial and loving fear which brings the enjoyment of truth and the sweet relish of divine things which is the second element of wisdom and ecclesiasticus teaches us how intimately this wisdom depends on the holy fear and childlike reverence of god to whom he asks hath the discipline of wisdom been revealed and who hath known her wise counsels there is one most wise creator almighty and a powerful king and greatly to be feared who sitteth upon his throne and is the god of dominion he created her in the holy ghost and saw her and numbered her and measured her and he poured her out upon all his works and upon all flesh according to his gift and hath given her to them that love him the fear of the lord is honour and glory and gladness and the crown of joy the fear of the lord shall delight the heart and shall give joy and gladness and length of days with him that feareth the lord it shall go well in the latter end and in the day of his death he shall be blessed the love of god is honourable wisdom and they to whom she shall show herself love her by sight and by the knowledge of her works ecclesiasticus chapter one verses seven through fifteen the soul begins to have this sense of god when touched by fear fear searches the soul and corrects and purifies what is amiss in her fear expels pride fear opens the faculties to the influence of grace being the forerunner of humility the fear of god sifts the virtues clean of the earthly affections and the selfish motives that mix with them the fear of god moves the will to many good works and would rather abound than fail in them for there is no want in the fear of god which is like a paradise of blessing ecclesiasticus chapter forty verses twenty seven and twenty eight the holy fear of god keeps the virtues and will not let them escape into the atmosphere of vanity but a soul without fear is not safe from a fall fear shuns danger and fences her works with the safeguard of humility end of lecture two part two
lecture two part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture two on the nature of christian virtue part three what prompts and inclines the will to action is love the will is love and the object of love is good hence evil can never be loved except under the appearance and pretence of good the fear of god is but a form of love dreading to lose our greatest good and in losing our good to suffer terrible things but filial fear is the reverencing of the divine majesty with pious and affectionate awe whom we hope to reach but fear to lose even the hatred of evil is a form of love resisting the enemy of that good with the love of which we are animated as the lover of his country resents and resists her enemies the lover of god hates the vices that war against him keeping then in view that the will is love and that the principle of virtue is love and that every virtue loves its object we shall find that st augustine has given us the true and compendious definition of it in these terms virtue is the order of love for it is the office of the virtues to regulate and perfect love and when that love proceeds from the grace of charity it is life and there is no virtue without the choice decision and love of the will every virtue regulates love according to the order of justice and prudence how charity gives life and unity to the other virtues will appear if we consider that the grace of justification or charity is infused into the essence of the soul and so passes into all her powers and so as st augustine observes every just movement of the soul proceeds from a just love our lord has therefore summed up all the virtues which are commanded us in the love of god and our neighbour that this love is exercised through all the powers and faculties of the soul is the plain doctrine of the gospel expressed in the command thou shalt love the lord thy god with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind and with all thy strength st mark chapter twelve verse thirty and st paul has shown how charity clothes herself in all the virtues and works in them all where he admirably says charity is patient is kind charity envieth not dealeth not perversely is not puffed up is not ambitious seeketh not her own rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth with the truth beareth all things believeth all things hopeth all things endureth all things one corinthians chapter thirteen verses four through seven thus all the virtues work to their final end in god through the grace and inspiration of charity yet every one cannot exercise all the virtues equally because all have not the same calling or the same state and position or the requisite conditions or the like occasions yet every one may have what is equivalent to the exercise of them all because they are all summed up in charity the poor man cannot be munificent but he may be generous even beyond the munificent the poor widow who gave her might at the temple gave more than all the wealthy because she gave her all the virtues of the virgin are not the virtues of the matron yet the virgin may be the true mother of the destitute next in order to the theological virtues in approaching the soul towards god are the virtues of religion humility and penance they have a special relation to god as their object 
and are in immediate subordination to the theological virtues then come the four cardinal virtues as their regulating principles they are called cardinal as being the hinges upon which all the virtues turn or the wheels upon which they move they have been likened by the fathers to the four corners of the spiritual house to the four wheels of the mystical chariot in the vision of ezekiel and to the four chief elements of the visible world when grounded in humility they are subject to god and made acceptable to him and as the servants of charity they reach their true excellence there is a simplicity as fenelon remarks which is but a gross stupidity but there is another simplicity which is a marvellous perfection this perfect simplicity is the result of the unity and harmony of the powers of the soul through the unity and harmony of the virtues in their perfect accord in charity when the charity of god fills all the powers and purifies and animates all the virtues they work in their order and work with freedom ease and calm decision this is the secret of that beautiful lucidity and peace which shines from souls that are truly holy this is the legacy which our lord gave to his apostles together with his body and blood peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you not as the world giveth do i give unto you st john chapter fourteen verse twenty seven such souls live and are made sincere by humility just and ardent by charity they live in light and even when their consoling light is obscured or withdrawn for their probation they have still the light of justice the soul is calm and sweet in her operations and when strong things have to be done they are not done in a tempest but from that calm and deliberate strength that is silently collected through the habit of resting the interior man upon the infinite strength of god yet this calm and simple strength is such that worldlings who live upon the excitements of the imagination will never understand it but will ascribe this serene wisdom and clear strength to cunning and duplicity such holy souls nevertheless are always ready in their humility to say with st paul not as though i had already attained or were already perfect but i follow after if i may by any means take hold wherein i am also taken hold of by jesus christ brethren i do not account myself to have taken hold but one thing i do forgetting the things that are behind and stretching forth myself to them that are before i press on towards the mark to the prize of the supernal vocation of god in christ jesus philippians chapter three verses twelve through fourteen the christian virtues are the feet and wings whereby the soul moves in the direction of her final end for even those duties that have their immediate end in this life when directed by spiritual motives have their final end in god these virtues may therefore be again considered according to their advancement and progress towards god and upon the consideration of their advancement they have been measured by great theologians upon the ascending scale of these four degrees of progress as they are exemplary social purifying or actually purified exemplary virtues are in the soul from the time she begins to look to god whether in his divine nature or in that human nature in which he became our example these are the forms ideas images or patterns of the virtues as they are present to the soul and the motives upon which they should be exercised and the grace by which they are exercised 
as st augustine says we must have something in the soul that virtue may be born of and this is from god and if we follow it we shall live well when we exercise the virtues according to these exemplars we become exemplary but even whilst the will is yet contending with the earthly appetites tempers and passions we must have in us the forms of these virtues as the rule by which we contend and the grace through which we may contend successfully it is one thing however as we have repeatedly said to have light and grace and another to enter into them which can only be done through humility prayer resolution and mistrust of our own sufficiency it is much easier to be exemplary in private than in social life this however has no reference to the world's measure of what is exemplary for the world looks to its own outward examples rather than to the inward examples which god places in the soul and we are speaking of the will's conformity to those divine exemplars that are present in the soul it is difficult amidst the business the society or the pleasures of the world to keep the inward spirit and intention pure a great many christians exercise their private virtues well compared with the number that can hold their soul in hand in their social life and dealings the world's atmosphere is never very good for the christian virtues they breathe less freely in public than in private and domestic life and this is much more the case where public and social life is contaminated with religious error with luxury or with fictitious refinements the transacting of the world's business has so many encounters is crossed with such a diversity of motives and interests is attended with so many reservations and pretensions that they seldom fail to chequer warp and taint that singleness of mind and simplicity of heart which the true christian brings before god and even to the domestic hearth except again among intimate friends who understand each other's hearts social life is an exchange which puts a great deal of spurious coin in circulation the ambition of appearing the love of making a figure the art of pleasing by polished fictions the rivalry for esteem the successes and the failures on the social field with all their accompanying vanities susceptibilities jealousies and heart sufferings are neither favourable to the theological nor to the cardinal virtues the game of conversation lends itself to subtleties of self-love and vanity that mar the simple sincerity of the christian soul and whilst the present are flattered the absent too often suffer so true are the words of st james that if any man offend not in word the same is a perfect man he is able with a bridle to lead about the whole body st james chapter three verse two our share in the world's affairs is too apt to take us from ourselves and from the divine exemplars seated in the inward man and so to bring us down from supernatural to natural habits and from divine to human motives it is therefore a great advancement in the virtues when the soul can be as simple as sincere as little given to vanity and as well habited in christian goodness abroad in the world as at home this depends much upon inward watchfulness and the keeping of the centre of the soul in a state of calm recollectedness it belongs to the man who is in quest of his supreme good to draw as near to divine things as his condition of life will allow to this we are often urged in the gospel our lord says seek first the kingdom of god and his justice 
and all these things shall be added to you st matthew chapter six verse thirty three and again he tells us be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect st matthew chapter five verse forty eight that is to say as your heavenly father is perfect god be you perfect man formed upon the type of the one perfect man but this demands that higher and diviner order of virtue which is called purgative or purifying which transcends the common habits of virtues and in purifying the soul brings her nearer to the likeness of god these purifying virtues which are not without sufferings cleanse the soul from the predominance of earthly attachments and affections as well as from those interior cleavings of self-love that close the inner chambers of the soul against the better gifts of god here prudence looks down upon worldly and selfish things as altogether inferior to the contemplation of divine things here temperance refrains from the things of the body as far as nature will allow here fortitude admits no fear of loss in parting with the soul's attachment to the body or in detaching our love from those inward cleavings to oneself that the spirit may be free to enter upon eternal things here justice claims her noblest prerogative of approaching as near to the eternal justice to its perfect order and beauty as the soul is capable of doing the principle of this purification is the call of god and the seven gifts of the holy spirit they lead to the love of god through the contemplation of his truth which inclines to holy retirement whilst not neglecting the duties of life but when duty is performed and the soul is left free she devotes herself anew to the eternal truth as the soul advances in purification she learns to measure all things by comparison with the divine truth and not by her own imagination she values their internal motives rather than their external show she weighs their intrinsic justice rather than their outward convenience she loves them by the charity that they serve and not by the vanity to which they may reluctantly minister in a word the purifying virtues seek god in all things and self in nothing but when the virtues reach the divine similitude they are called the virtues of the purified soul where prudence is absorbed in divine things where temperance knows the earthly cupidities no more where fortitude ignores the passions and where justice is in constant union with the divine justice through imitation these are the virtues of the blessed or of the very rare and perfect souls who in whatever they may be externally employed have their interior recollected with god so the angels whilst they do their ministries to men live always in god's presence these are the heroic virtues their force is in the gifts of the holy ghost and in the generous fidelity of the will to their inspiration the ordinary virtues of the christian are transformed and ascend with pure and energetic motion to a sublime elevation and raise the soul with them in a singular way directing every thought and action towards god these are god's heroes they have found the true use of that aspiration towards greatness which is implanted in every soul that holy ambition inspired by the love of divine things which however costly in what it takes from nature is exceedingly rich in what it gives to nature it is difficult to draw a near comparison in detail between material imagery and spiritual things but we will do what we can to give some picture of our spiritual nature as it becomes the subject of light or darkness 
virtue or vice the soul has been often compared to a sphere let us suppose it to be a globe of pure crystal resting in an earthly body but this globe must be pervaded with light to represent the mind and at the centre there must be a spring of action to represent the will with a glow to represent its love and rapid movement this transparent globe is open to subtle influences from above from around and from beneath it is in the middle of all these influences from above light and energy descend from heaven to illuminate strengthen and attract the central principle of action that the will may move in that direction towards its greater good the middle circumference expands outwards towards the social life and comes into contact with the external world and the social duties the inferior region of this globe is in direct communication with the body and receives reflected images and sensations of what passes in the body and this forms the imagination now if this central principle of love and action which is perfectly free turns chiefly towards the inferior side and moves towards the body it will draw up the images and sensations of its disordered appetites and passions and will give them countenance and enlargement and so the mud of sensuality turbid with the passions will enter the pure crystal and will darken and disturb the whole globe it will contend with and obscure and even expel the pure light that descends into the summit from heaven the mud of sensuality will also defile and degrade the central principle of love and action into which it becomes immersed and the tendency of that vital principle towards higher things will either be much weakened or will cease altogether but if the central principle of life and love be drawn and inclined to the circumference of the middle sphere into contact with social life and dealings it will be exposed both to good and evil and will be opened and determined to good or evil influences according to the habit of its internal life as that is most attracted to the upper region of light and grace or to the lower region of sensuality and passion for good attracts good and repels evil whilst evil attracts evil and repels good but if the central principle of love is habituated to ascend into the superior region of light and grace where god meets the soul it becomes luminous and good through acting with the divine gifts and the light will then descend with greater light and the spiritual strength with greater strength filling the central principle of the will with an ardent inclination to ascend and live in the region of god's light and as the central love ceases to be attracted in disorder to those lesser and lower things the obscured crystal will become more clear the mud of concupiscence with its turbulent commotions will subside and disappear whilst the purified sphere of the soul will become pervaded with the light of truth and the glow of heavenly love and be serene and strong then the mid-sphere will take no harm from any prudent contact with the world and the lower sphere where there is a watchful temperance will receive no serious obscuration or disturbance from its contact with the body because the central will by having its habitual attraction to the summit is always gaining new light and strength and tendency to superior good but there is another peril to which the central principle of love and action is exposed which like the canker worm in the flower is the most injurious of all because it lurks in the very principle of love and may therefore corrupt the very centre of life 
this is but too often found to be the case when instead of ascending to the greater things presented in the summit of the soul following their attraction and uniting with their good the vital principle of the soul acts reversely makes itself the point of attraction and endeavours however vainly to become the superior centre of greater things instead of submissively obeying the divine attraction to the true centres of those greater things then love changes its name to pride an affection that reverses the essential order of love and the order of all things whereby the whole sphere of the soul becomes troubled and darkened and the will in turning upon herself loses the hold of divine things and sinks while to herself she seems to rise coming in contact with much defilement for where the centre of life is corrupted the whole sphere of the soul is contaminated and nothing short of divine humility expelling the canker of pride can heal the wounded will what then can be said of the christian virtues especially when they live by the grace and inspiration of celestial charity but that they emanate in their principle from the sanctity of god are given to the soul upon the measure of her condition and are distributed through all her powers and worked into our life by the labours of the will they make the soul luminous with the light of justice harmonious with the beautiful order of their action noble through obedience to the eternal love when god sets charity in order within us all the virtues receive the fire of her life and god reigns through her gentle power as the queen of the soul by reason of her origin this divine virtue is most pure minds defiled cannot defile her but she removes the stains of error whithersoever she comes she is of such potency that anger and discontent disappear in her presence of such fortitude that she grows stronger in adversities of such liberty that oppression only increases her freedom of such altitude that no human power can reach her but she graciously descends to the humble by partaking of this divine virtue what was deformed receives a beautiful form what was dead is restored to life and love what was depraved is rectified what was weak recovers health and what was averse from god in us is happily reconciled if the beginning of the christian virtues is from god their path is on the way to god and they finally rest the soul in god the heathens imagined a heaven of gods that came to the help or the injury of man the true god came and the false gods vanished he brought us truth and justice and the grace of all the virtues that take his name become one of us except in our sin he practised and taught the perfection of these virtues and they changed the world he still teaches them still gives the grace of them to every one of good will to obey his voice wherefore the grace of these virtues is from the bosom of god their examples are in the eternal word of god made man and their inspiration from the holy spirit end of lecture two part three lecture three part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture three on the difficulties of virtue part one the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent bear it away st matthew chapter eleven verse twelve 
there are conversions however rare in which god suddenly exhibits his power changes all the affections in a moment brings the soul into the depths of humility and gives an ardour to the will to master the first labours of returning to her creator as if the soul were carried on wings these are the miracles of grace the holy violence with which the holy spirit seizes on the soul makes her swift to do violence to herself such was the conversion of zacchaeus the publican of st paul of st mary magdalene of st augustine of st catherine of genoa and of other saints and martyrs yet after the first fervour of conversion they had trials and combats within and without before they became perfect in the virtues after the wonderful conversion of st paul our lord declared to ananias i will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake acts chapter nine verse sixteen those who begin to serve god in earnest are often taken with the fancy that nothing is easier than the cultivation of the virtues and think they see their perfection already in prospect in their first fervour they pass under this deception and this is the way in which they deceive themselves when they first turn to god in earnest he is pleased in his fatherly clemency to give comfort and sweetness to their souls to encourage them in their arduous undertaking he shows them the things of the spirit in their beauty and pleasantness he makes the severity of the virtues smooth and grateful and quietens down the vices as with an opiate a sweetness is infused into the virtues and for a time the vices lose their insolence because they are put to sleep when the ignorant creature finds herself in this state and feels this new happiness she fancies herself already advanced in the virtues and with her foot upon the first step of the ladder of perfection imagines herself nearing the top that reaches up to heaven yet this inward peace this pleasure in the virtues this sleep of the vices are much more from the condescending grace of god awakening the soul to good will and desire of the better things than from the efforts of the will to enter into the power of the virtues this is but a vision of sanctity presented to the soul whom god calls to himself a grace mixed very much with the natural sensibilities so that grace and nature seem to go all one way a sweet and luminous shadow thrown upon the soul of the rewards that await the toils and combats of solid virtue and the life of self-abnegation a slight foretaste of the eternal good in exchange for which we must give ourselves up with much cost to our nature for god will not give us an idle sanctity we must make the gift our own by constant labour st paul was raised to a great vision of god and saw and heard wonders that no man can utter such visions pass quickly but leave in the soul what can never be forgotten but after this vision his strong warm and tender nature was subject to toils cares pains and afflictions to combats without and to trials within he was grievously tempted was persecuted was calumniated he endured perils from the people from the magistrates from false brethren and from the hostility of demons his soul was subject to fears within and he was exiled imprisoned shipwrecked scourged stoned and finally slain by the sword but through all his labours tribulations anxieties and perils the apostle was supported by the memory of his great vision as well as by his grace and virtue he was able to say i know in whom i trust 
I know for whom I suffer, I know whom I serve. So according to their gifts, have souls called by God to a holy life received some first view and foretaste of the beauty and sweetness of divine things, the memory of which may encourage them in their future trials. For the divine virtues are not yet gained in their strength, but only shown and accepted. The old Adam in his weakness still sleeps within. Self-love is not extinguished. The progeny of pride and vanity are not dead. Sensuality has not taken its final leave. They are all slumbering for a time, put to rest under the calming influence of the vision and sense of sanctity. But this will only continue for a time. Grace and nature must come into conflict before they are conquered and removed. God will close his hand upon those sweet and consoling lights, leaving but the dry light of his justice and the dry strength of his grace. And suddenly the slumbering Adam will wake up, surprising the soul with the revelation of her weakness and those beautiful forms of sanctity that still remain in her memory will make the revelation more complete this is the critical time on which the whole future of that soul depends at first she is perplexed and troubled at her new condition fearing perhaps that she has done some grievous wrong though ignorant of what it may be grace seems to have deserted the soul although the light of justice remains and grace is only hidden from her sensibilities she has hitherto been buoyant with pleasant sentiment and feeling she has now to contend with her conscious weakness and repugnances and to strive to gain those virtues by effort that she had fancied to be already her own all this is in the order of the providence of grace for god only gave those fascinating sentiments for a time to win the soul to the desires of solid virtue in those first devotional feelings there was much that affected the animal spirits as well as the will not without a considerable mixture of self-love but god whose government of souls is directed to the perfecting of them for their final end according to what they are capable of bearing withdraws this sensible light after it has done its first office that the soul may begin to know herself may take the way of humility labor at her purification and strive for solid virtue if yielding to discouragement the soul slackens and recedes from her holy purpose great mischief ensues and she slides back into her old ways but if that soul abides in patience awaits the hand of god believes in her spirit that he is near although to her senses he seems far away and trusts in his secret help if notwithstanding the waverings of nature or even occasional lapses into weakness she strives in the main to do her best in will and intention on the way of virtue and duty that soul will come forth out of the cloud of trial into the light of consolation with her spirit purified and her virtue much consolidated and having now learnt how to bear herself under similar trials she will go on from strength to strength and from virtue to virtue let us put the whole question of progress in the christian virtues in a simple form at once the end of the christian virtues is union with god which implies the renunciation of oneself this requires two kinds of knowledge and two kinds of effort the knowledge of god which should be ever progressive and the knowledge of oneself which should be ever progressive the knowledge of god teaches us not only what he is but what he does for us 
the knowledge of oneself teaches us what we are not and what we are unable to do for ourselves without the divine help it is the great and difficult task of getting at the truth about ourselves in which the light of god alone can help us but these two great lessons are best learnt by alternate light and trial for in his light we know god and in our own trials we learn to know ourselves the two fundamental efforts of christian virtue are these the first is to leave our own selfish affections as much as we can and to get as near to god with our will and affections as we may the second is to get the habit of acting as much on principle and as little on sentimentality as we can for sentiments spring from our own subjective feelings they have no light in them they are always changing they are too apt to be allied with what st paul calls the spirit of the flesh to act from impulse often from temper and to have an element of self-love in them and they have no wisdom in them but principles are presented to us in the light of god they are calm fixed true just wise unchangeable from god and not from ourselves so that when indifferent to all that moves within us whether pleasant or unpleasant except what speaks in our conscience where those principles reside we act on principle we follow the serene guidance of god and give to him our will but it is long before many souls even with good desires can reach this peaceful state of serenity owing to the want of self-knowledge and the purification of their sense and sensibilities the whole labour of virtue consists therefore in transferring the will from the attractions of nature to the attractions of grace and in getting out of that narrow selfishness and away from those morbid sensibilities to reach the divine atmosphere of truth and justice this demands inward labour and the pain of sacrifice with sober and steady perseverance and not unfrequent conflicts with the obstinacy of nature david understood all the difficulty when he asked of god bring my soul out of prison that i may praise thy name psalm 141 verse 8 but the very first difficulty is that of sight the forms of the virtues may be in the mind in a certain way and some little of them may be known by experience but it requires a special grace and special correspondence of the will to fix attention on their profounder sense the light is still perhaps in the summit of the soul unable to reach the interior and reveal the condition of the soul for it is arrested by pride or self-love obstructing the way to the centre of the spirit we see not what calls for correction or reform until by violent acts the old habits are broken down when humility opens the soul light enters and we obtain deeper knowledge of ourselves although the supernatural virtues are not acquired by human efforts but infused they require the vigorous cooperation of the human will before any great advance is made in them and although the gift of charity whereby the soul lives is communicated to the other powers in which the moral virtues are exercised yet it will happen as st thomas observes that any particular habit of virtue will encounter obstacles to its action because of certain contrary dispositions left by previous habits so that until they are overcome there will be no pleasure or satisfaction in the exercise of that virtue it should be observed again that there may also be certain impediments of constitution or temperament 
or defects of instruction and training which make the soul less active and responsive to the movements of grace although earnest faith and ardent charity will finally master all difficulties and bring life and vigour to the virtues the only insurmountable obstacle is want of humility to obtain which is the greatest labour of the soul the first disposition for acquiring solid virtue is undoubtedly a good will made good by right intention the second not less essential is a brave and courageous will made brave by a resolution that never stops at imaginary difficulties and understanding that it is the very office of virtue to master real ones but even then it takes time and perseverance to make the other faculties and powers prompt and responsive to the will before the virtues on which they are employed become easy and pleasant those virtues again that have been habitually done from human motives will have to be brought under divine motives and referred to god as their final end before the soul can be raised in all her powers to her just and true elevation and this implies an habitual consciousness and realization to the soul of the presence of god to soften away these truths would neither be just wise nor fair it would be unjust to the truth unwise for the interests of virtue and unfair to the soul our blessed lord in his eternal wisdom spoke plainly and concealed nothing he knew man perfectly and knew that where the will is good the knowledge of difficulties awakes the soul to energy and resolution and to the desire of the better things for the very reason that they are costly to the mixed multitude gathered to his sermon on the mount he spoke in these plain words enter ye in at the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there are who go in thereat how narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leadeth to life and few there are that find it st matthew chapter seven verses thirteen and fourteen on another occasion calling the multitude together with his disciples he said to them if any man will follow me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whosoever would save his life shall lose it and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul st mark chapter eight verses thirty four through thirty seven when messengers came from john the baptist and the multitude around him were filled with the thought of that austere prophet jesus said to them from the days of john the baptist the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent bear it away st matthew chapter eleven verse twelve when the rich young man went away sad because jesus said to him that to be perfect he must sell all that he had and give it to the poor and come and follow him jesus looking about said to his disciples how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of god st mark chapter ten verse twenty four virtue itself spoke through his mouth and showed its difficulties whilst pointing to its reward why are the christian virtues difficult to nature why do they do violence to nature why is that violence called the crucifixion of nature clearly because the principles of the divine virtues are so much greater than we are because the graces of these virtues make large demands upon our nature because the divine objects of these virtues are so much higher than our nature 
because our spiritual nature must be enlarged through humiliation and suffering to receive them and be raised through self-renunciation to reach them the besetting danger of souls is to imagine that they are easy to acquire and easy to keep this comes of the habit of confusing the frailties so commonly indulged in short of mortal sin with the true and proper character of the christian the perfect christian is in all things subject to god that he may be holy in body and in spirit one corinthians chapter seven verse thirty four there is an easy-going virtue low in faith and easy in life that is always weighing the virtues to find their lowest sum of obligation and least weight of inevitable duty and that is always exploring the lines that divide right from wrong and sin from freedom with no other view than that of running as near the line of danger and evil as may appear to be safe such a one makes his life a compromise between god and the world and in running so close to the line of danger often trespasses beyond for the weight of his frailty is apt to overbalance him or at least to give him a bias on the unsafe side but the virtues of the gospel are not calculating their character is generous and their whole spirit and intent is to make the perfection of the christian the first pursuit of life he who does not understand this knows not the first principle of the christian life which is this in the very words of christ seek first the kingdom of god and his justice and all these things shall be added to you the children of the faith may be broadly divided into two classes those who follow the routine of obligation and those who devote themselves to the cultivation of the soul to the first the pursuit of virtue seems easy because they make it easy but though they scarcely know it from their ignorance of the better things that belong to nobler virtue they suffer internal labor from the weight and petulance of their unpurified nature and want the light serenity and peace that belong to the calm joy of generous virtue a low view is taken of the dignity of the soul and of the grandeur of the gift of faith which gives the soul her dignity and of the virtue that belongs to that dignity the magnificence of that grace not of earth but of heaven which the soul carries within her is not realized to the mind nor what this celestial spring of life claims of the soul a shallow measure is taken of the depth from which we have to be raised and of the height to which we must descend before we can be united with god in eternal beatitude what are all the petty interests of this mortal life that they should absorb the soul compared with the wonderful things above us that hang on the tree of life and are always ready for the soul that is willing to reach up to them most wonderful is the mercy of god in providing a place of purification after this life or few of the great multitude would reach the kingdom where all is pure and divine grace is strong but nature is weak and blind and though the virtues are delightful they demand the whole man to make them delightful happy the man who realizes to himself the significance of life and who devotes himself to the cultivation of life but it is the very cultivation of spiritual life that the parables of the gospel represent as toilsome and laborious although rewarded a hundredfold in this life and holy in eternity the chief reasons why the real beginning and each great step in advance on the way of divine virtue are laborious may as well be here summed together they demand self-renunciation and self-denial 
they involve the breaking up of old and cherished habits to which nature clings they require an ever-increasing humility descending further and further into the soul pulling down the last remains of the pride of life and opening the innermost soul to the influence of grace they have to master human respect they have to detach the will from self-love a detachment that rends nature to her centre before the healing and restoring life of charity can enter thus far and close the wound of nature they have to transfer our powers more completely from nature to grace and to raise what still acts in us under human motives to divine motives all this requires that we be subject to trials for the greater knowledge of ourselves to force our will to take refuge from our troubles in the strength and protection of god and that the consciousness of our helpless weakness may abate our self-love lead us to self-mistrust and induce us to carry our affections to the god who is our only good yet the difficulties to be overcome in these ascensions to better things are not in them but in ourselves and there is a grandeur in the enterprise a magnificence in the venture that is full of encouragement what a charm to be linked and united more closely and ever more closely with the eternal mysteries what a help in the divine power what a glory for us mortals to be always approaching nearer and nearer to the supreme and infinite good we have also a divine leader not in the remote distance of history but with us always with us god in our nature god with us god within us our way truth and life lighting us to the virtues giving us the force to practice them if the israelites had not trusted themselves to moses they would have remained the slaves of the egyptians had they refused to follow the man of god through the forty years of their hard and difficult way deprived of their natural comforts they would never have entered the promised land but a greater than moses is with us moses came from the court of pharaoh and could only give them external guidance christ comes from heaven and coming to conduct us thither gives us not only outward guidance but inward light and help on the way end of lecture three part one lecture three part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture three on the difficulties of virtue part two if there were not labors calling for effort and endurance in the virtues they would not be of inestimable value if they did not claim the whole man they would not constitute the health and vigour of his life we must either take them for our strength or consent to be spiritual invalids or even to be infected with some mortal malady whatever labours or solicitudes accompany the virtues in their progress much greater are the labours the troubles and even the miseries that follow the vices nor are they by any means absent even from those subtle interior vices which are invisible to human eyes and which it is the work of humility and self-renunciation to discover and to remove not that the removal or destruction of the things denied or mortified is the destruction of nature or any part of nature but it is the destruction of those propensities that soil and encumber and corrupt its integrity purity and freedom that it may receive a divine perfection 
we must choose therefore between the labours of virtue and the heavier labours of vice for there is no other alternative we cannot stand still in one place and condition as though we were statues and not human beings we must go one way or the other and unless we strive against our downward propensities we shall descend to what is worse than what we are to drink a bitter draught is not pleasant at the moment but to obtain health from the draught is pleasant to the whole man this is an image of the first steps in self-denial the pain of which is soon changed into the sweetness of healthy life whilst vicious habits even those that are interior begin in a sweet delusion and end in bitterness and if still pursued they settle down upon the vapid lees of a pleasure past and gone what is a harmless bitterness at the beginning compared with an evil bitterness at the end joined to the horror of having defiled a spirit divinely created for the holiest and purest good to conceal the labours of virtue from a soul is to judge her unworthy of them god has planted a predisposition for them in the deepest appetite of our soul in our appetite for universal good and the will is more easily roused to energy and exertion in the face of difficulties where reward lies beyond them it is the ease and smoothness of the path that fosters indolence and indifference the irascible powers are strong in human nature and love to contend with difficulties where there is an adequate motive convert them to their just objects and the evil in them when in a wrong direction will become absorbed and purified by their right direction when a man sets himself to make a name a fortune or a position in the world the difficulties in his way become the cause of his success they draw forth his latent energies increase his acuteness and exercise his resolution patience and perseverance each obstacle augments his courage each step gained is a reward where there is not utter degeneration the love of rising over obstacles is inherent in human nature and is confined to neither sex what is the secret charm of those innumerable stories that never fail to interest both youth and age forsooth he cometh with a tale he cometh with a tale that draweth children from their play and old men from the chimney corner it is always the old tale new through a thousand editions of some dear object to be gained that fascinates the soul but is only achieved through the conquest of many obstacles that meet the adventurer on untried ways and the prize that makes him happy is won by faith courage and perseverance tales like these are the unconscious exposition of the mystery of human life the christian knight of romance goes forth in the springtide of life on his enterprise of chivalry he finds some holy hermit in the woods skilled in the ways of god and of human life who purifies his conscience blesses his sword and gives him the spell of faith that masters all enchantments he proceeds on his way and meets visions of terror that guard the enchanted castle horrible monsters roam about and threaten him strong giants seem to guard every approach he draws his sword repeats the word of faith strikes one blow and the portentous vision is dissolved he sets the captive christians free and they find they have been imprisoned in delusion what is this but an exposition of the truth that most of our fears are the work of imagination that most of our obstacles are the delusions of self-love and that the prison in which we are confined is raised around us by the enchantments of pride 
one courageous stroke at them with the cross is the word of faith and they fall to nothing excepting our spiritual adversaries of whom we have already spoken and who are easily overcome by faith and the cross there is nothing external to be conquered but human respect and even the cause of this unnerving influence is within us it exudes and flows over us from the mingled efforts of false shame and fear of criticism which have their cause in pride and cover us like a garment of green skins that tightens as the moisture evaporates until liberty is exchanged for torture nothing cramps the freedom of the soul in a greater degree than the fear of what others will think and say but the ways of god's servants are not the ways of the world and the first thing to be done after taking the narrow way is to shut the world out of consideration and look only to the approval of god life in the presence of god is the great safeguard against human respect and the sense of our accountability to the divine majesty at every moment lifts the soul above the trivial thoughts and light fashions of human opinion the imagination is a great inventor of terror there is an organic and intimate connection both of the outward and inward senses with the imagination which may truly be called the spirit of the flesh as it refines and subtilizes and spiritualizes and depicts in exaggerated forms everything that moves in the senses changing with all their moods and variable humours a soul under the dominion of this spirit of the senses is light and trivial at one moment sad at another full of unfounded fears at another all this springs from the subjective man not from the objective light of god in the mind and conscience which is our true enlightener our true guide and the corrector of all that works trouble in the imagination it is the work of spiritual direction when we have got astray among the fancies and fears generated in the imagination to bring us back to the truth contained in this spiritual light for the subtle power of the imagination when under the impulse of the blind and selfish senses magnifies every difficulty especially in what regards the denial of the corporal senses and the inward sense of self-love and raises up discouraging fears without any reasonable cause often again through this force of imagination will the inexperienced soul mistake oppressions in the body for depressions of the soul and thus produce a real depression and discouragement surrender her liberty to these depressions and thus drawn into them she next gives way to disheartening doubts and fears about her state and absorbed in these discouragements loses the spring of her will and the inclination to lift up her head to the light of god in the mind that would restore her confidence and dispel the illusion under which she labours the imagination again is a great exaggerator of pain both corporal and spiritual if what we suffer in the body or in the labour of self-abnegation or in the trials of the spirit were divested of the imaginative fears that increase and multiply them we should suffer comparatively little but through the fears conjured up through the apprehensions of the imagination we anticipate greater pain and difficulty in what we have to do or encounter than we find in the reality we exaggerate the present difficulty or suffering and are thus alarmed or even dismayed from doing what we ought to do or from giving up what we ought to give up the first purgation of the soul therefore is the purgation from the dominion of the senses 
and of the spirit of the senses in the imperious control of the imagination so that we may rise out of them and live in the light of god and become gradually freed from the false alarms delusive fears and petulant disturbances that absorb so much of the mind and heart and that harass the soul with frequent apprehension and solicitude where there is a real evil on which the finger of the conscience can be put let it be at once looked to repented and corrected this is the first and most pressing duty of the soul to endure no real evil or suffer it to remain but it is those vague and indefinite fears and alarms that come not from conscience but imagination that keep the soul in a state of discouragement fret and irritate the temper and keep the will back from generously rising to god in imagining what has to be abandoned self-love will dread the pain and loss without seeing the divine compensation in the good that will come in its place in imagining what is to be overcome the same self-love will enlarge the obstacle augment the labour and pain of the effort and close the eye to the grace that strengthens the will and to the high motives that encourage its action making such a future for us as will never come the imagination will burden the duty of the present hour with that fantastic future and give rise to broodings and fears of obstacles to perseverance that will never arise as they are anticipated and which in whatever shape they may arise will not come without the divine help to conquer them this indulging of the imagination upon oneself is very weakening to the soul obscures the present light absorbs and troubles the force of the will takes it off from working generously with the grace of god diverts its attention from its true object relaxes the virtues discourages the soul with vain and useless alarms and weighs the spirit down with sadness thus the soul makes her own fears very far from the fear of god her own difficulties such as god has never made and her own disheartenments where god would have her lift her heart to him this is neither humility nor the way to humility it is all the vapour of self-love it is not self-knowledge but delusion one stroke of light from god will pierce through the whole mist reveal the soul to herself show her how she has been nursing her self-love and compel her to confess that she is nothing without god and must go to him for light and strength take off your imagination from yourself and nine-tenths of your difficulties will be removed you will then become subject to the light of god you will lift up your mind to the great motives of your enterprise and pray with clear intention for the divine help to advance with courage on the way to god instead of looking back where there is nothing to be done or forward where nothing has yet come instead of inventing obstacles that nowhere exist except in the unmortified senses in self-love and in the imagination let the soul be assured that she has nothing to overcome but herself and that every time she overcomes herself the next step will be easier when the imagination is brought under discipline and made the servant instead of the master it will come over to the service of our good habits unreasonable fears will cease with its opposition and holy habits will be loved as those discarded habits never could be loved all that we have said shows the value of a well-informed and experienced guide who can explain to the soul what is really amiss in her remove unnecessary apprehensions teach her how to use her powers aright 
and inspire her good will with courage and confidence amidst the clamour for universal education for progress in the arts and sciences for the sound training of every man and woman in their own art duty or profession all excellent things when under the dominion of the moral order ordained by god the votaries of the world who know all wants except those of the soul exclaim against spiritual direction they cannot realize to themselves what they never think of that all things are for the soul and the soul for god and that there is a science an art the very first of all arts an education and a training of the soul whereby knowledge removes ignorance experience provides against inexperience prudence removes perplexities medicinal remedies give health and wisdom teaches the way to better things is the body to be trained in all manly exercises by skilful teachers the mind to be trained to the exercise of its powers by men already experienced in the rules and the soul which is the very life on which all depends to have no education is no one to teach her the athletics of the virtues no one to train her to run the way of perfection this was not plato's view nor that of pythagoras nor of any of those heathen philosophers who considered the guidance of souls the first duty of the wise yet they had no divine system resting on inspired authority such as christ has left to us when a virtuous habit is forming it inclines to the good of its object feeling towards that good in proportion to the earnestness of desire until the will acts through that power with promptitude and firmness and moves to its object with ease and rapidity every virtue is proportioned to its generosity and this generosity is the spirit of self-sacrifice doing a willing violence to self-love or self-interest for the object to which a virtue moves is neither ourselves nor any part of ourselves but a greater good of which we desire to partake so that the will must go forth out of oneself to embrace that good the will that seeks the highest good draws all things to god and the love of god makes the way of virtue sweet and generous with respect to the management of the imagination our lord has given us a rule that is applicable to many things be not solicitous for to-morrow for the morrow will provide for itself sufficient for the day is the evil thereof st matthew chapter six verse thirty four although the literal sense of this admonition relates to the things of the body the rule is equally applicable to the things of the soul do not imagine difficulties before they come to imagine them is to make them you have the light and help of the present hour and duty but not of the future you know not says st james what to-morrow will bring st james chapter four verse fourteen to-morrow will have its providence as well as to-day the trial of to-morrow is not the trial of to-day and the light and help of to-day is not the light and help of to-morrow to lay the burden of the future on the present is what god never intended he gives to each day its duty and to each day its help to each hour its duty or trial and to each hour its help to load the present hour with the burden of the future that never comes as anticipated is both to encumber the present duty and weary the mind and to derange the order of divine providence in your conduct thus that is made heavy which god has made easy there are persons also who burden the present with the past calling up past errors 
not as subjects of present humiliation or penance but to judge them anew by present lights and troubling the present peace of the conscience as if they had not been judged by the light of the time and were responsible anew to the greater light received since the time when they were brought in sincerity to the tribunal of penance this greater light undoubtedly increases their deformity and makes them a great subject for humiliation but they were judged and condemned in the light of the time and if every new light upon them is to bring them anew to the tribunal the soul will never have peace or security this loading of the present hour with the past and with the future destroys freedom simplicity and peace what you have now to do do with all your heart and strength and remember that the best preparation for duties to come is the careful performance of the duty in hand this does not however exclude what is really foreseen and must be now provided for for that is an actual duty of the present hour there are not a few people of whom it may be said that they scarcely ever live they are always away from themselves in some wrong direction they moon over the shadows of things past and gone or over possibilities to come or over things distant from them or over what they fancy they would like better than what they have or are they dream more than they live god is the eternal present and the eternal life in him there is no past distant or future and the secret of life is to live in the present with god and to fulfil the duty of the present in the presence of god this gives patience strength and peace the other rule which our lord has given us for conquering our difficulties is sharp and effective and happy are they who realize its full significance the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent bear it away of what kingdom of heaven is he speaking but of that of which he said the kingdom of heaven is within you of that kingdom for which he taught us to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven it is the reign of god within us that is obtained by doing violence to ourselves this violence consists in the denial of our sensual appetites and in the renunciation of self-love by the first we remove the fuel that feeds the fire of concupiscence by the second we destroy the fuel that feeds the blinding vices of pride and vanity by removing these we not only weaken the vices in their causes but overcome our repugnance to the way of the cross the true path of the christian soul for our lord himself explained this law of generous violence when he said if any one will follow me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it st mark chapter eight verses thirty four and thirty five this is the first condition of christian progress we must part with the old to receive the new the first step is the venture of faith and this venture is a sacrifice in the confidence that we shall receive a great return st justin the martyr a native of palestine made diligent search for the unwritten words of our lord and tells that he often said be ye good traffickers this corresponds with his parable of the merchant who gave all that he had to purchase that precious pearl which is the kingdom of heaven he also gave us the promise which for nineteen centuries he has fulfilled to his servants that instead of proving a bitterness this self-denial when accompanied with humility would lighten every burden and sweeten every labor come to me all you that labor and are burdened and i will refresh you 
take up my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart and you shall find rest to your souls for my yoke is sweet and my burden light st matthew chapter eleven verses twenty eight through thirty the burden of our life is from ourselves its lightness from the grace of christ and the love of god humility takes off the weight of the burden for it overcomes that attraction to ourselves which hinders our ascent to purer things when we receive the light and grace of christ with humble subjection to their celestial influence and the seeds of eternal life are already within us in the act of submitting ourselves to their light yoke we pass from our troubles to his rich and tranquil life this in some is the violence we have to do ourselves according to those never to be forgotten words he who will lose his life for my sake shall find it end of lecture three part two lecture three part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture three on the difficulties of virtue part three three things are required for the cultivation of the virtues the first is to know what we must believe the second what we must desire the third what we must do to obtain what we desire faith exhibits the motives of the virtues their divine example and their law and that our faith may be secure christ has deposited its whole truth in his church and has invested her with his authority to teach the faith with unfailing certainty among other reasons that in hearing the church we may have the beginnings of humility and in obeying the church we may progress in humility he himself also helps the interior man with light and strength to see and cleave to the unchangeable truth which he has given to his church this is the wonderful proof of his continued power on the earth known only to the faithful that the inward light that he gives to souls accords in all things with the outward teaching of his church and that his inward gift of sacred force agrees with the outward commands to obedience we are brought from the pursuit of evil to the desire of good by two mighty influences the first wakens up the conscience to the fear of god the dread of his judgments and the terror of his punishments the fear of god represses the force of concupiscence brings down the elation of pride shakes us out of our self-confidence drives sin away and awakens the desire to return to god the fear of god brings down those selfish guilty human fears that make us shrink from approaching the justice of god the fear of god fills the heart with contrition breaks up the habits of evil disposes the heart to trust in god's mercy and prepares it for the seeds of good the fear of god humbles the soul and prepares her for chastisement but though fear refrains the soul from evil it will not make her just after the spiritual being has been ploughed and harrowed by fear it must be cleansed before it can be planted and made fruitful with better things how is this spiritual being to be cleansed by penance and the blood of christ in his sacrament of reconciliation humility must go before charity because god resisteth the proud but giveth his grace to the humble st james chapter four verse six love and pride are incompatible things 
and divine love can never consort with human pride they essentially exclude each other whilst yet under fear we are in a servile condition incapable as yet of any good that can bring a heavenly reward but when the sacrament of reconciliation brings the grace of charity we are set free and are made the children of god the second mighty influence therefore which succeeds the first is the most gracious gift of charity the grace of justification which restores the soul to the friendship of god the whole object and intention of the law of god is that we should adhere to him and this adhesion is chiefly through love there are two things in man by which when divinely helped he is able to adhere to god by his mind and his will for by his inferior nature he is not able to adhere to god through his mind he adheres to god by faith but by his will he completes his adhesion to god but the will may adhere to god in either of two ways that are very different from fear or with love to adhere to god from fear is to adhere to him for a reason different from himself this reason is to escape from impending evil but to adhere to god with love is to adhere to him for his own sake the love of god is therefore the most powerful way of adhering to god and is therefore the whole intent and final end of the divine law the end of the law is also to make men good but a man is good when his will is good for his good will brings all the good that is in him into action his good will is that in him that desires to be united with good and especially with the greatest good which is his final end the more he wills this good the better he is but what he wills from fear has in it a mixture of unwillingness as when a man parts with his goods to save his life the love of god as he is the supreme good is that therefore which makes the soul good and as that supreme good has no limit or measure the law of this good is to love god without stint or measure and as this love is the end of the whole law of justice upon which every virtue is formed all the virtues to be perfect should be the servants of the love of god hence we are taught that the end of the precept is charity one timothy chapter one verse five and that this is the greatest and the first commandment thou shalt love the lord thy god with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind st matthew chapter twenty two verses thirty seven and thirty eight hence as the law of christ is the perfect law it is called the law of love and as the imperfect law the old law is called the law of fear from the presence of the love of god in the soul four wonderful effects will follow the first is spiritual life derived from god and pervading the soul for the grace of charity is a certain participation of god and st john says he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him one john chapter four verse sixteen it is the nature of charity to change the affections of the soul into the affections of him who is loved hence the true love of god makes us like to god for which reason st paul tells the corinthians that he who adheres to the lord is one spirit one corinthians chapter six verse seventeen as the body can neither live nor move without the soul the soul has neither divine life nor anything that reaches to divine life without the charity of god the second effect of charity is the keeping of the divine commandments 
for the justice of charity moves us to fulfil all justice it penetrates all the powers to make them the instruments of justice the love of god is never idle observes st gregory wheresoever it is it works great things if it refuses to work it is not love love therefore fulfils the whole law and as our lord says he who loveth me will keep my word the third effect of charity is to keep us from evil no adversities can injure those who love god on the contrary they help to increase the flame of charity charity is strong to heal injury but not to inflict injury it is faithful to eternity but not to vanity adversities detach the loving soul from all that is not god and concentrate the affections with greater earnestness in the exercise of charity as external trials augment the intensity of human love they much more increase the intensity and sweetness of divine love the fourth effect of charity is to bring us to our beatitude in god this is only promised to those who love god above all things there is laid up for me says st paul a crown of justice which the lord the just judge will render to me in that day and not only to me but to them also who love his coming to timothy chapter four verse eight as the grace of charity is the foundation of the grace of glory the degree of glory will be proportioned to the degree of charity for the greater works are done from greater charity and he who loveth much to him much will be given the blessed vision of god is promised to love by our lord himself if any one loveth me he shall be loved of my father and i will love him and manifest myself to him st john chapter fourteen verse twenty one great love moreover kindles great desire which gives the soul a larger aptitude and disposition for the light of glory there are other effects of charity that ought not to be forgotten the very first of these is the remission of sins there will be no difficulty in understanding this if we only reflect that even among men if one has much offended another and afterwards regrets the offence and devotes himself with love to the person offended the good heart readily forgives the offence but god is infinitely good and has no desire to see our sins estrange us from him but gives us his love that we may return to his friendship st peter therefore tells us that charity covereth a multitude of sins one peter chapter four verse eight whilst solomon says in the proverbs that charity covereth all sins proverbs chapter ten verse twelve but should any one think this is a reason why he should not do penance for his sins let him reflect that not only must penance prepare the soul for the love of god but that there can be no real love of god without the most bitter regret and repentance for having offended him who is worthy of all love and that the more we love god the more grieved we must be that we ever displeased his divine goodness and lost his love charity also illuminates the heart with wisdom and gives us the sense of god for where is charity there is the spirit of god whose unction teacheth us of all things by nature we are in darkness as to the good we ought to pursue but the holy spirit of love is the spirit of wisdom and understanding and when he dwells in us and spreads abroad his love in our hearts he suggests to us whatever we need for our sanctification hence ecclesiasticus says ye who fear the lord love him 
and your hearts shall be enlightened ecclesiasticus chapter two verse ten charity perfects the joy of the heart no one knows of what joy the heart is capable who knows not the love of god to be without charity is not to have god in one's life to have great desires and to have nothing proportioned to those desires is the cause of weariness restlessness and discontent but to have the charity of god is the first beginning of beatitude the present pledge of the future joy the commencement of union with god and the happy expectation of more perfect union consequently charity gives peace to the soul for whoever loves god above all things rests his heart on the eternal peace god is greater than our heart he can fill all our desires and when the heart knows this the nearer it draws to the divine fountain of good the more it finds repose charity also gives dignity to the soul making her the living temple of god wherein the spirit of god dwells to work our sanctification in the words of st paul the spirit himself beareth witness to our spirit that we are the sons of god and if sons heirs also heirs indeed of god and joint heirs with christ yet so if we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him romans chapter eight verses sixteen and seventeen all these considerations unite in commending the inestimable value of charity as the gift above all gifts that does all things for the soul our one work in this life to which all things else are secondary is to obtain to augment and to perfect within us the love of god but we must keep in mind that charity can never come from oneself it can only come from god st john expresses this truth in most clear and definite terms every one he says who loveth is born of god and knoweth god he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is charity by this hath the charity of god appeared towards us because god hath sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live by him in this is charity not as though we had loved god but because he hath first loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins one john chapter four verses seven through ten charity is the greatest of divine gifts but to receive this gift or any large increase of it requires certain dispositions on our part two things especially dispose us to receive the gift of charity and two things dispose us to receive it in greater abundance the first thing that disposes us to receive the divine gift is the diligent hearing and reflecting upon the divine word for we only desire the good that we know and we desire it the more the more earnestly we reflect upon it the sacred scriptures compare the word of god to an enkindling fire and being the word of the holy spirit it must enkindle the heart into which it enters when after his resurrection our lord expounded the scriptures to his two disciples they knew him not at the time but after he had revealed himself and departed they said to one another was not our heart burning within us whilst he spoke on the way and opened to us the scriptures st luke chapter twenty four verse thirty two when st peter preached in the house of cornelius the holy ghost fell upon all them that heard the word acts chapter ten verse forty four the second preparation is to humble the soul into greater subjection under the mighty hand of god in fear in self-abjection 
in repentance in the cry of the heart the soul makes known her conscious miseries and her desire to return to god and he will exalt her in the day of visitation but let it be plainly understood that we cannot return to god unless we return first into ourselves god is everywhere but not everywhere to us there is but one point in the universe where god communicates with us and that is the centre of our own soul there he waits for us there he meets us there he speaks to us to seek him therefore we must enter into our own interior when the prophet isaiah called upon the people to return to god this was his cry and now ye transgressors return to the heart isaiah chapter forty six verse eight the psalmist sings to god thy law is in the midst of my heart psalm thirty nine verse nine and our lord emphatically tells us the kingdom of god is within you st luke chapter ten verse twenty one when the soul enters into herself she begins to know herself her shortcomings and her wants are before her eyes and god shows her what to do and what to ask of him the humbled heart is opened the grace of god enters and his love is desired for hard must that soul be and hard with pride that knowing what she is and what god is to her has no real desire to love him who has loved her so much and whose love is so great a good two things also we have said are required to dispose the soul for receiving greater charity god is always ready to augment the gift of life where he finds the soul prepared but charity must be always proportioned to self-renunciation in the nature of things this must be so if the capacity of the will to love god is pre-engaged if only one part of the affections is given to god whilst the other part is kept back in the interest of self-love it is evident that this second part of us is neither open nor disposed for receiving an increase of the divine gift of charity the obstacles caused by self-love and earthly desires must be moved out of the way that the recesses of the spirit may be opened for the larger entrance of the gift of life these obstacles are described in the well-known words of st john love not the world nor the things which are in the world if any one love the world the charity of the father is not in him for all that is in the world is the concupiscence of the flesh the concupiscence of the eyes and the pride of life which is not of the father but is of the world st john chapter two verses fifteen and sixteen what injures charity as st augustine observes is the hope of gaining and the desire of holding the things of time diminish cupidity and you will increase charity let cupidity cease and charity will be perfect for the root of all evil is cupidity to increase charity you must therefore lessen cupidity the second thing required to dispose the soul for greater charity is a profounder humility for it is to humility that charity is given for god can only give greater life to a soul that is empty of herself and is subject in her inmost powers to him but of this we shall speak fully later on charity is not only the greatest noblest and most fruitful commandment but is the fulfilment of all commandments whatsoever besides its eternal foundation in god whom to know is to love and whom to know more is to love more besides its foundation in the eternal order of justice which is the form and measure of charity 
besides its foundation in the supreme superiority of the divine good over created good besides its foundation in the relations of the soul as a living subject with god as her divine object the law of loving god above all things rests upon these four considerations arising from our human nature the first consideration is that of the divine benefits we have received all that we are and all that we have that with them we may serve the divine author of them and may love him with our whole heart gratitude has never a strong hold on the heart unless it springs from love of the divine giver of all things when king david offered up the contributions of the people to build the temple it was from the deep sense of what he owed to god that he poured forth his gratitude thine o lord is magnificence and power and glory and victory and to thee is praise for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine thine is the kingdom o lord and thou art above all princes thine are riches and thine is glory thou hast dominion over all in thy hand is power and might in thy hand greatness and the power of all things now therefore our god we give thanks to thee and we praise thy glorious name who am i and what is my people that we should be able to promise thee all these things all things are thine and we have given thee what we have received from thy hand one paralipomenon chapter twenty nine verses eleven through fourteen there is no more certain proof of a great love of god than habitual and earnest gratitude the second consideration is our incapacity of ever doing complete justice to the divine excellence for even though we love god with our whole heart mind and strength we can never give him the love that is due to his goodness glorify the lord as much as you can says ecclesiasticus for he will yet far exceed and his magnificence is wonderful when you exalt him put forth all your strength and be not weary for you can never go far enough ecclesiasticus chapter forty three verses thirty two through thirty four the third consideration is the renunciation of worldly things it is a great injustice and injury to god to put anything here below on an equality with him but we put corruptible things on an equality with god when we love them equally with god when we say that he is a jealous god we know that his jealousy is his justice in justice he can suffer no rival in the love that we owe him if we love the creature with the kind of love which belongs to god alone he will leave the soul and the soul will collapse upon the creature the love of him is his gift and its ardent power aspires to carry the heart back with it unto him charity is also a power that enables us to love all things better in god than in themselves to love all things in the order in which god loves them through the virtue of divine charity is the secret of using them as though we use them not the fourth consideration regards the powers with which god has provided us that we may love him as it becomes a spiritual creature to love her creator redeemer provider and sanctifier our powers are our mind heart soul and strength thou shalt love the lord thy god with thy whole heart with thy whole soul with all thy mind and with all thy strength whatever we are doing whatever virtue we are exerting we must make the love of god our first and chief intention give to the love of god the full energy of our soul and lighten that energy with the highest motives in our mind 
and sustain that loving energy with the fortitude of our will against all that might weaken its ardour then will every virtue as it is graced ordinated and ruled by charity grow strong pleasant and victorious add these considerations one to another ponder them in your heart and they will bring you the overwhelming conviction that charity conquers all the difficulties of virtue every advance in charity is the mastering of some difficulty whilst perfect charity is the conquest of all difficulties end of lecture three part three lecture four part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture four on the nature of humility part one where is humility there also is wisdom proverbs chapter eleven verse two there are four virtues the fruits of divine grace which in their union bring the soul to god these are humility faith purity and charity with the loss of the knowledge of the true god they were lost to the world and our lord jesus christ brought them down anew from heaven to mankind their union in the soul is the distinctive sign of christian holiness when pride throws off obedience to god humility dies when the mind rebels against the authority of god as the revealer of truth faith dies together with humility when the graceless soul allows the body to revolt and defile the soul with uncleanness holiness is extinct when self-love holds the place of charity the spiritual life of man is no more when these virtues have departed the man is left to nature and the world but to nature in cruel disorder and to the world not as god has made it in his goodness but as man has made it in his concupiscence to the world as it is taken up for a final end in place of god the men of the world have their measure of virtue but that virtue falls short of god and ends in this life they measure their virtues upon the requirements of their fellow-men a man is great in their eyes not as he serves god but as men serve him not as he loves god but as he has gained the good will of his fellow-men not as he has accepted the supreme reason of god but as he glorifies his own he is a great man of the world who by force of his own natural mind and will has obtained the ascendancy over many and variously gifted minds truth is less his master than his useful servant and the virtues as the world understands them are the docile instruments of his personal elevation without those four evangelical virtues he thinks and acts on the exterior of his soul but knows nothing of his interior he knows little of himself and little of god disguise the skeleton under whatever accomplishments the world's virtue as in the heathen times is the supremacy of the natural man yet it was to destroy the supremacy of self-sufficiency that christ brought these four virtues to mankind that by humility the soul might know herself and all that god is to her by faith she might be the humble subject of his truth and authority by charity she might have her life in god and by purity she might be holy in body and spirit to have these virtues is to know them not to have them is to be completely ignorant of them because they are not theories of the mind but experiences of the soul 
a cynical writer of the world school has called them the dropped virtues but where they are dropped the soul has fallen from god and all care of herself the one least known of the four and consequently the most misunderstood is the virtue of humility and yet it is the very groundwork of the christian religion not only is it widely misunderstood but often despised and the cause of this contempt is the pride of false freedom putting aside however that ignorance which insolent pride prefers the virtue itself is of such a hidden character and there are so many spurious imitations of it that to those who have never cultivated the inward conformity of the soul to truth and justice it is not easy to distinguish true humility from its counterfeits but where true humility exists it seldom fails to discern its existence in another st lawrence justinian repeats the sense of the early spiritual writers in saying that no one can well understand what humility is unless he have received from god the gift of being humble for there is nothing in which men are more often mistaken than in their notions of what constitutes humility it is a grace as well as a virtue it is not only a virtue in itself but an essential element in all the christian virtues it belongs equally to the mind the will and the spiritual sense once planted in the heart and brought into exercise it draws light from many fountains moves to action from many influences and finds its motives in all comparisons of divine with human things it grows upon whatever we contemplate in god or in ourselves it is exercised in all our relations with god in every consideration of ourselves and in every due respect to our fellow-creatures and even acts towards the inferior creation with a beautiful benignity yet so vast is the scope of this virtue so profound its motives so widely does it act through the other virtues so many and so great are the evils to which it is opposed that the difficulties are insuperable of embracing the whole virtue within the terms of a single definition indeed the early ascetic fathers who devoted their lives to its cultivation declared it to be indefinable on a certain occasion saint zosimus was instructing his disciples on humility when a sophist from antioch was present but the sophist could not understand what the venerable abbot meant he pressed him with questions and among other things asked how he zosimus known far and wide for his sanctity and good works could call himself a sinner the venerable man could only smile and say that he was unable to explain further then his disciple st dorotheus who in earlier days had been a distinguished lawyer in antioch stepped forward and said i suppose it is like you philosophers and physicians and men of other professions that require great skill you obtain your skill by study reflection and practice but if any one asked you what that skill is and how you got it by degrees you could not tell him so the soul obtains the habit of humility by degrees and from the constant observance of god's commandments but that habit is unspeakable our fathers said continues saint dorotheus that we might know the presence of humility by its fruits but what that disposition is that is thus formed within us no man can declare in words when saint agatho was dying the brethren asked him if he felt afraid he replied that he had always done his best to keep god's commandments but as he was a man he knew not whether his acts were pleasing to god or not because god judges one way 
and man another this explains how we are to apprehend humility an ancient was asked what humility is and he replied it is a great work something unspeakably divine the way to humility is to subdue the body with labour to submit oneself to every one and to pray to god unceasingly but humility itself is divine and incomprehensible the celebrated cassian who brought the traditions of those great practical schools of humility the egyptian monasteries to the west tells us that it is based in self-renunciation and leads to charity but neither he nor the fathers whose instructions he has preserved ever attempt to define what it is he only gives the ten signs of its presence which saint benedict afterwards expanded into the famous twelve degrees saint john climacus the abbot of mount sinai begins his conference on humility in these terms to attempt to explain the sense and effect of divine charity of humility of holy purity of the divine illumination or of the holy fear that it inspires to such as we have never experienced them is like trying to explain the sweetness of honey to one who has never tasted it the saint then invites the brethren in conference to give their several views of the meaning of the word humility which was inscribed upon the wall after all had spoken the saint concluded in these words when i heard all these things and calmly weighed them within myself i found that i could not take hold of the blessed sense of humility from what i had heard humility is a grace of the soul that cannot be expressed in words and is only known to experience it is an unspeakable treasure of god and can only be called the gift of god learn he said not from angels not from men not from books but learn from my presence light and action within you that i am meek and humble of heart and you shall find rest to your souls the venerable man saw the impossibility of defining the virtue without the escaping of its essence and without such a contraction of its nature as to do injustice to its greatness and comprehensiveness notwithstanding all the light that has since been thrown upon this virtue from the greatest minds and holiest souls that difficulty still remains and is still felt though in a less degree when we come to treat the various definitions which holy and profound men have given of humility we shall see it to be so many-sided that no one definition can possibly do more than give a partial view of what that virtue is that sinful man should be humble through the gift of god does not seem strange on a first reflection but that the eternal son of god should take our human nature to his person and become the humblest of men is a fact so high and profound that it leads us at once to see that we cannot penetrate into the sublime depths of this virtue but our lord is the proof that humility is essential to the perfection of an intelligent creature whoever imagines that the need of this virtue comes altogether from our sins or from the necessity of conquering pride does not understand the nature of humility satan fell from innocence and adam fell from innocence only because they had ceased to be humble humility is therefore an attribute of innocence christ as the perfectly innocent man in perfect union with god has the complete knowledge of what man is and of what is justly due from him to god and as his human will was in perfect conformity with the justice of god in him alone is the virtue of humility in its absolute perfection 
although the blessed virgin was free from original as well as actual sin she was the humblest of creatures next to her divine son she was the humblest because the most pure and innocent and the most pure and innocent because the humblest and her words in the holy scripture breathe nothing but humility this is their wonderful charm it belongs to the holy angels as well as to the saints although in heaven it is exercised in a more perfect way for the blessed see their native nothingness and the wonderful gifts which god gives to their nothingness and their absolute dependence on god as they see all truth not in themselves but as mirrored in the light of glory to understand the virtue of humility we must consider it both subjectively and objectively by subjectively we mean the virtue itself as it exists in the powers of the soul and is exercised by them but objectively we mean the object and end for which it is exercised and the reasons and motives upon which it is exercised the light and law of the virtue comes from god and is present in the mind the exercise of the virtue is in the will but in the will as helped by the grace of god the feeling of the virtue is in the spiritual sense it is of understanding says st bernard and comes of knowledge it is of the heart and comes of affection humility is in the mind when the will subjects the understanding to the divine truth which god presents to the mind and to the divine author of that truth it is in the will when the will is subject to the will of god it is in the affections when those affections are subject to god in charity it is in the other powers of the soul when the will subjects their operations to god humility is in the judgment when we judge ourselves to be what we truly are in the sight of god it is in the whole conduct of the soul when we hold ourselves with firmness and magnanimity in that position in which god has placed us neither lifting ourselves with conceit above what we are nor presuming to account ourselves for more than we are humility consists moreover in the sense of our dependence on god on the help of his grace and the rulings of his providence it also very much consists in adopting the means prescribed in the gospel and taught by the experience of the saints for making us humble of such means are the faithful keeping of the commandments the following of the divine counsels of christ the exercising of humiliating labors and penitential devotions the denying of ourselves both in our senses and self-love and the taking up of our cross to follow christ it consists likewise and very much consists in living with filial reverence in the presence of god to whom we are accountable at every moment of our lives it also consists for its very basis in holding the will with patient fortitude in constant subjection to the strength and support of god and refusing to be detached from our dependence on him whether by pride vanity or any other solicitation of our lower nature finally humility must pervade the other virtues to make them subject to god and agreeable in his sight this summary account of the virtue on its subjective side will help us to understand the various definitions that give each a partial apprehension of humility we shall consider it on its objective side in the next lecture in which we shall treat of the grounds of the virtue what first led to the careful consideration of the nature of humility from the intellectual point of view was the rise of the pelagian heresy of all heresies the proudest 
since its authors denied the necessity of divine grace for the justification and sanctification of man and maintained that with the preaching of the gospel man was sufficient for himself without the interior help of god this was to destroy the foundation of humility perhaps the first clear definition of humility is to be found in the celebrated letter to the virgin demetriades long ascribed to saint prosper but more recently to julius pomeranius it was expressly written to guard that distinguished person from the wiles of pelagius who had addressed a letter to her the definition is in these terms humility consists in our subjection to god in all things to this subjection all humility tends treating expressly of its definition st thomas put it in these terms as it is a special virtue humility chiefly looks to the subjection of man to god for whose sake he also subjects himself to others his great commentator cajetan puts the same definition with greater precision in these words it is the subjection of whatever is of oneself to whatever is of god we must not however confound the subjection of obedience with the subjection of humility although humility is at the root of true obedience and true internal obedience fosters humility true obedience has its chief motive in god whilst humility has its chief motive in ourselves obedience contemplates the dominion of god and his sovereign right to command us whether directly or through his representatives and it consists in the subjection of our will to his will and law but humility contemplates our own unspeakable inferiority and in view of that inferiority it subjects or more truly abjects us into our just and true position beneath the infinite perfection of god for humility is always exercised in comparing ourselves with what is greater and better than we are and regards what we have that is less or what we have not at all its essential reason lies in our native poverty and want not as these defects are fancied or imagined but as we see them in very truth and consciousness for as saint augustine observes humility holds its ground on the side of truth and not on the side of falsehood or to put it in the plain words of saint vincent of paul the reason why god is so great a lover of humility is because he is the great lover of truth and humility is nothing but truth whilst pride is nothing but lying to which we may add that god is the great lover of justice and humility is nothing but justice whilst pride is nothing but injustice on the side of god therefore and as the final end of the virtue humility is the subjection of ourselves to god in all things the psalmist understood this when he said shall not my soul be subject to god for from him is my salvation and again be thou o my soul subject to god for from him is my patience for he is my god and my saviour my helper i shall not be moved psalm sixty one verses two six and seven the second definition we shall give is that of grostet the celebrated bishop of lincoln and of many other theologians humility he says is the love of abiding firmly in that order which belongs to us according to all its conditions as pride is the love of abiding in an order above what belongs to us this is the definition of humility as viewed on the side of justice by the order belonging to us is meant the rank and position that we hold in the sight of god with all the conditions and defects that truly belong to us and determine our position 
his contemporary st thomas takes the same view of the virtue he is explaining how humility comes to be a virtue and has the power of a virtue in repressing the appetite that aims at great things beyond just reason he then states that humility becomes a virtue when any one in the view of his deficiencies holds himself down in that low place that measures what he is as when abraham said to god i will adore the lord who am but dust and ashes perhaps this definition has been put more completely by another acute thinker who says humility is the virtue by which from the true knowledge of the human state and condition held with firmness the man holds himself persistently in that nothingness which of himself he is and refuses to be moved from it by any external thing this firmness and persistency in holding ourselves to what we justly are in the sight of god shows that humility is closely allied with fortitude and magnanimity and that it is a brave and courageous virtue we have a sublime example of this firm persistency in st francis of assisi whom nothing could move from the lowest estimate of himself and who was wont to exclaim who art thou o lord and what am i i am what i am in thy sight and i am nothing more we may now listen to the explanation which bishop grosstet attaches to his definition humility is the love of abiding firmly in that order which belongs to us in all its conditions this love may be in a man before he knows all the conditions of his state and therefore it becomes divided from one into many exercises of humility according as he finds out those conditions to explain by a similitude the light of the sun in itself or in the air is pure light but when it comes in contact with a colouring substance such as a many-coloured window the light divides into the colours through which it passes and becomes red yellow or blue in a similar way that love which we call humility whilst it adheres to the general principle of firmly abiding in the order that belongs to us is a general principle like the pure light before dividing into colours but as we gradually find out its several conditions and discover what belongs to each condition humility divides into its special kinds as light into its special colours for instance when this love discovers that it is due to our human condition to be subject to god as the angels and saints are and to keep the inferior creatures beneath us humility begins to love this state in a special manner which before was only loved in general so when this love begins to understand that penance is the state due to sinners it begins to love penance in a special way and not merely in a general way thus humility multiplies in man according to the number and diversity of states or habits which he discovers in himself as light is multiplied into many colours according to the things it touches as it belongs to every virtue to work and minister to that end for which it is appointed yet no virtue can continue so to work unless there be added to it the love of abiding and persisting in its condition it is evident that to the working of that virtue humility must be added and as this humility gives an abiding persistency to each virtue and so each virtue is preserved by humility it is likewise evident that humility is the guardian of all the virtues it is also the first virtue as pride is the first vice again the greater one is the more one is subject because greatness of soul consists in the number and intensity of the virtues to which the soul ministers 
but every minister is subject to that which he serves and this ministry is exercised by that love which we call humility as humility therefore causes him who is greatest in the virtues to be all the more their minister he is consequently all the more subject yet the humbler he is in this service of the virtues the higher will the branches of his reward ascend well therefore has the holy scripture said the greater thou art the more humble thyself in all things this beautiful exposition will be better understood if we reflect that the christian virtues are in their principle the gifts of god that man is their subject that it is by humility he becomes their subject and that in working with them he ministers to them as their servant and that in short it is by humility that he subjects the virtues to the service of god and secures their persistency according to this definition then humility keeps us firm in the position in which according to our deservings god has placed us it measures what we are and what we deserve and never advances to a higher position unless god advances us and when we are by him advanced it never forgets from what god has advanced us in this spirit abraham prostrated himself before god and said i will speak to the lord who am but dust and ashes genesis chapter eighteen verse twenty seven in this spirit when god had chosen saul to rule his people and his heart was yet as that of a little child he exclaimed am i not a son of gemini of the least tribe of israel and my kindred the last among the families of the tribe of benjamin one kings chapter nine verse twenty one in this spirit peter judged himself unworthy to behold the miracles of the lord and on his knees cried out depart from me o lord for i am a sinful man st luke chapter five verse eight in this spirit the canaanite woman took the place our lord assigned to her and answered yea lord even the wealth seed of the crumbs that fall from their master's table st matthew chapter fifteen verse twenty seven in this spirit the roman centurion declared himself unworthy that the lord should enter under his roof and in the same spirit of humility the publican in the temple stood afar off and would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven but struck his breast and said o god be merciful to me a sinner and he went down to his house justified st luke chapter eighteen verse thirteen end of lecture four part one lecture four part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 4 On the Nature of Humility Part 2 The definition to which we may give the third place is that in which humility is considered as the temperance of the soul, refraining from and denying herself to the adversaries of this virtue. These adversaries are self-love, pride vanity and vainglory for although inordinate self-love is opposed to charity in another way it is opposed to humility self-love is opposed to humility as it is the origin of pride of vanity and vainglory for if we were perfectly subject to god in mind sense and will we should have no inordinate self-love the temperance of the soul is a spiritual temperance refraining from those inordinate appetites that spring directly from self-love 
and this temperance is chiefly concerned with humility and meekness with humility as it refrains from pride and vanity and with meekness as it refrains from anger for this reason st thomas considers humility as potentially belonging to the virtue of temperance and declares it to be nothing else but a certain moderation of spirit for although humility is caused by the reverential fear of god this does not hinder it from being a part of modesty or temperance the learned and devout suarez takes the same view he says that although humility inclines us to be subject to god yet properly and of itself it is not inclined to another but moderates our affection for our own greatness and in this way holds us subject to god and to whatever partakes of the excellence of god st thomas therefore defines humility to be the virtue which tempers and withholds the soul from tending immoderately towards high things as opposed to the morbid appetite of pride or to the contemptible appetite of vanity humility is the spirit's modesty the soul's sobriety the vices to which it is opposed are the impurities of our spiritual nature defiling the soul with their falsehood disordering the will with their injustice blinding the understanding deceiving the heart making us contemptible and even ridiculous before god and his angels and even before men who does not remember the withering words of the almighty when adam sought to be as a god behold adam hath become as one of us knowing good and evil pride alone is hateful to god and every other vice is hateful for the pride that is in it for pride is the malignant element in every vice the malice which rises against god in every act of injustice humility therefore may be truly called the purity and modesty of the soul that combats every tendency to false elation every inclination to make oneself what one is not every movement to claim for us what is not one's own every disposition to rise above our true and just position in the sight of god and to combat these unjust inclinations by withholding the will from the false appetite we tend to true greatness by subjecting ourselves to god because subjection is the essential condition of union with god and this subjection is the only thing that the creature contributes towards that union the more we are subject to god the nearer we are to him he is infinitely above us but by this very subjection we ascend to him and find in him whatever is truly great but the elation of pride is a tendency to great things that are neither according to god nor to truth but the productions of our fancy and the inventions of our conceit and to this humility is opposed the temperance of humility combats the intemperance of pride in the way in which modesty combats immodesty it combats by withholding the mind the sense and the will it combats by refraining the mind from the evil suggestion or imagination by keeping the spiritual sense above the movement of the appetite and the will from consent it combats by turning the mind to some nobler object more worthy of the soul and especially by subjecting the soul with greater humility to god and even to our neighbour for god's sake in a word humility effectively combats pride by withholding the will on every side and giving it some better entertainment nor is it amiss where temptation is urgent to remember the fact that the devil is behind every suggestion of pride as well as every instigation to impurity 
but there is no more decisive way of preserving the soul from attacks of pride than to do some act of humility towards another in god's sight and for god's sake the pelagian heresy gave rise to another definition of humility which we shall put in the fourth place as this pestilent heresy took away the foundation of the virtue by denying the grace of god humility was defined to be the confession of the grace of god the spirit of this heresy fills the world's literature inspires the world's policy and animates the world's votaries the world deifies the human intellect and the human will self-perfectibility on the basis of self-sufficiency is the shallow doctrine of the world in the west as it is the religious doctrine of the buddhists in the east many again are they who would shrink from pelagianism as a doctrine yet are little better than pelagians in their practice they reject not the existence of grace but they care not to have grace they object not to the principle of humility but are not concerned about having humility they are far from denying that man is dependent on god but they prefer to depend on themselves in the celebrated letter to demetriades after defining humility as consisting in our subjection to god in all things the author observes that it cannot exist without the grace of god and from this point of view he tells us that it consists in the confession of the grace of god as the grace of god is both the cause and inherent principle of the virtue this confession not of the lips but of the heart implies the submission of the will to the grace of god and the dependence of the soul on the divine help and it cannot be omitted from any complete account of humility it has therefore been adopted as a partial definition by many devout writers since the fifth century the exposition with which the author follows the definition is so just and beautiful that we shall here give it in substance though much abridged humility consists in the confession of the grace of god we must therefore confess the grace of god in all its reality and integrity for it is the first office of grace to make us sensible of the help which it gives us and hence the apostle says we have not received the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we may know the things that are given us from god one corinthians chapter two verse twelve should any one imagine that he has some good that god has not given him but of which he is himself the author that one has not the spirit of god but the spirit of the world he is puffed up with that wisdom of which the lord says i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the prudence of the prudent i will reject one corinthians chapter one verse nineteen of these wise ones the apostle says when they have known god they have not glorified him as god or given thanks but have become vain in their thoughts and their foolish heart is darkened romans chapter one verse twenty one mark well the retribution of the proud and how they receive their reward even when they gain the knowledge of truth they ascribe it to themselves and glory in their native genius as if what they knew came not from god was not his gift but some production of their own intellectual faculties when the elements of the world and those creatures of kind so many and varied are present to our sight they reveal to us the invisible things of god they speak as a master speaks and as the scriptures speak but whatever good passes through the eyes into the field of the heart it can never take root or be fruitful there unless the divine husbandman gives the force of his influence to bring what he has planted to perfection 
for whether it be the creature or the truths of faith that we contemplate it is not he who planteth or he who watereth but god who giveth the increase one corinthians chapter three verse seven they who strive in their own strength take off their hope from the lord and set that hope upon themselves and in them the words of the prophet are fulfilled accursed is the man who sets his hope in man and strengthens the arm of his flesh his heart hath departed from the lord jeremiah's chapter seventeen verse five pride is justly called avarice in the scriptures as well for both these vices are excesses beyond all right and justice the proud hoard up the things that belong to others as well as the avaricious and are reckless as to whose claims they violate looking upon all things as if they came from their own fountain this comes of perversely appropriating god's gifts and forgetting who it is that gave them had god given nothing to their rational nature which is sublime or beautiful they would never have had anything upon which to extol themselves but their pride takes possession of what is god's as the devil does of whom our lord says when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own st john chapter eight verse forty four solomon shows the source of our knowledge when he says in the proverb the lord giveth wisdom and out of his mouth cometh prudence and knowledge proverbs chapter two verse six and st john says we know that the son of god is come and hath given us understanding that we may know the true god and be in his son one john chapter five verse twenty if then we are able to direct the attention of our soul to what is right and to what is good for us that comes from the inspiration of god and from his eternal and immutable will st paul therefore says work out your salvation in fear and trembling for it is god who worketh in you both to will and to accomplish according to his good will philippians chapter two verses twelve and thirteen the reason why we cannot discover humility in the conduct of worldly wise people is because this virtue subjects us in all things to god it is only so long as we place the care and perfection of our actions in god rather than in ourselves that we lose not the merit of them what can be so just or so becoming as that the image of god should shine towards god and derive its grace and beauty from him this is the light of his countenance sealed upon us that soul is adulterous and utterly incapable of union with god that holds to the mirror of her heart any beauty which is not from god's beauty or accepts for her adornment any jewel which comes not from the treasury of the holy spirit that you demetriades find yourself capable of preferring christ to your family and fortune is a grace you can never ascribe to yourself for he is the true humility the true charity and the true chastity and the spirit that is truly free is the spirit purified from every contamination and that loves nothing in herself or her neighbor but what comes from god when the tempter fails to win certain souls to unlawful deeds because they have a high and noble spirit he often affects his purpose by some delusive delight in themselves and after they are lifted up he may throw them down as from a precipice for from the moment we cease to confess the help of divine grace we set up ourselves on our own merits this pride is of the worst kind with more folly than in other ways of elation for if whilst we are struck down we still call on our redeemer for help he will make it easy for us to rise again but for this ruin there is no remedy 
it is very difficult for a proud man to become conscious of his sin and if he becomes a little conscious it is not to his physician that he goes for the remedy no cure can come of it because he looks to his disease for his medicine enter then into the forecourt of your soul which is your mind and pass into the chamber of your heart look round there and see if you have anything that is good useful ornamental or resplendent that is not the gift of god or of which he is not the author even the good of prayer is his gift but whatever the gift or whatever the increase through your labors remember that he who gave the gift gives the increase let then the holy spirit fill his organ which is your soul and let his finger touch his lyre which is your heart as it is of the nature of humility to confess the grace of god and to acknowledge his gifts it follows of course that it can be no part of humility to deny his gifts or to conceal them from our sight yet st francis of sales had to reason against this error as well as st teresa lancisius found a learned religious superior so wedded to this misconception that he was led to write a special dissertation to prove the contrary as well from the sacred scriptures as from the fathers and saints of every age the mistake arises from confounding the gifts of god with our own merits which should certainly not be the subject of our reflections or it may arise from the fear that we should appropriate to ourselves the blessings that god in his infinite goodness bestows on us or this misapprehension may take its rise from the vague and confused notion that somehow or other it is contrary to humility to think that god has done us favours but it is from no knowledge of god's goodness to us that the danger of elation arises that comes from overlooking this truth and from ascribing the good to oneself which god has given us in his generosity nothing can be more contrary to simplicity and rectitude of heart than to play at hide and seek with the mercies and graces of god and few things are more opposite to the genuine interests of humility whose very nature belongs to truth and sincerity our great protection against becoming elated over any good we receive will be found in the habit of seeing that good in the hands of god and in constantly ascribing it to him still with the fear lest through our neglecting that good god should take it from us and give it to the more deserving to conceal from our heart how good god is to us is so far from fostering the sense of our unworthiness that what most proves our unworthiness and puts us to shame is his great goodness to us our danger is not from truth but from falsehood not from the sight of god's divine gifts but from taking them for our own merits the best protection against this is to live ever in god's presence and to see and know how good he is to a creature so unworthy how are such virtues as hope charity trust in god and gratitude to thrive with us if we are not to think on the bounties and favours that our good god bestows on us gratitude is scarce because sincere humility is rare the want of gratitude in proud hearts is proverbial in the mouth of the human race but a great gift fills the humble with confusion as well as gratitude because it awakens in them the sense of their unworthiness that is an admirable sentence of st theodore the studite our most clement god is so free and bountiful of his gifts that there is danger that through our ignorance of what he does for us we should do an injury to his goodness the first office of the grace of god is to make us sensible of the giver 
this saint paul has taught us we have received the spirit which is of god that we may know the things that are given us from god from this text saint thomas concludes that not only do those who partake of god's gifts know what they have received but that without prejudice to humility they may prefer their own gifts to those that another may appear to have received doubtless because they have internal proof of their own gift and only external proof of another's and because the gift teaches them what is best for their good the more thou knowest the gifts of god says saint augustine the more blessed thou art in those gifts yea thou art not otherwise blessed except that in having those gifts thou knowest from whom thou hast received them st bernard counts it among the impediments of grace and the effects of tepidity when we are less conscious of the good that god gives us and he takes the failure of this knowledge for a sign of indevotion and ingratitude the celebrated father lainez the disciple and successor of st ignatius wrote these remarkable words i do not think it can be pleasing to god that humility should put an impediment to the knowledge of his gifts this would be the effect of pusillanimity rather than of true humility the knowledge of the divine help and the confidence which it inspires are the foundation of that christian magnanimity which gives us courage to undertake the most arduous works because god wills them they are intimately connected with humility of heart which is conscious that power is perfected in the midst of infirmity blind and deceptive is the world spirit perverting every good gift of god to self-aggrandizement and forgetting its divine author but secure is the light of the holy spirit who teaches us the knowledge of his gifts the knowledge that proceeds from the holy spirit must be useful must be needful for unless we know these gifts how shall we love the giver of them how shall we show our gratitude for them how shall we keep them with due diligence how shall we employ them in his honour who has the right to their service how shall we breathe our confidence in that divine support which carries us through the time of affliction or of mental desolation and upholds us in our arduous duties how in short are we to know god in his gifts we cannot have these advantages unless we know the spiritual good we have received for as the wise man says in ecclesiasticus wisdom that is hidden and the treasure that is not seen what profit it there in them both ecclesiasticus chapter twenty verse thirty two but whoever would see this subject treated with the rich fullness of profound intuition should read what saint teresa has written upon it in the tenth chapter of her life the point to be guarded against is the claiming for our own what we really do not possess which is less likely to happen if we habitually ascribe all the good we have to god the other point to be guarded against is the claiming of more virtue than we really have imagining we have the solid virtues of which we read or of which we think although as yet we may scarcely have been touched with the true nature of mortification humility and inward patience nor is this confusing of imagination with fact and of sensibility with truth always limited to beginners we must therefore judge our gifts with great moderation never compare them with another's to our own advantage or lose sight of the merciful and loving hand from which they come the true test by which to judge of the presence of the greater gifts and of our good use of them are these first if they increase our sense of the presence of god secondly 
if they deepen our sense of the responsibility they bring with them thirdly if they bring us into a profounder sense of our own unworthiness for the higher gifts search the soul more deeply and give cause for greater humility which is the measure of our response to them the greater thou art the more humble thyself in all things st paul compares the man of grace to a frail vessel carrying a great treasure who cannot but tremble at the disproportion between the greatness of the treasure and the frailty to which it is entrusted there is another consideration of great moment the greater the habitual gifts received the greater must be the actual graces given at each moment to secure their exercise and turn them to account in these actual graces lies the secret of our power to cooperate with the special gifts of god and the secret of securing this actual grace is in the exercise of humility and prayer for the more constant these exercises are the more abundantly will those graces flow an eminent master of the interior life has put the question whether a soul may sometimes review her progress without injury to humility and he replies that this may be done when it pleases god to give that soul a singular light showing the change he has wrought in her giving her grace as well as light to feel and know that it is not her work but the work of god whereby she is led to confess the change which god has accomplished in her with a deep sense of humility gratitude and love and is at the same time animated with a filial fear and dread of offending the divine goodness in such a case of special light and grace there is wonder at the contrast between her present and her former state rising into a sense of god's goodness to a creature so unworthy and incapable and the soul clearly sees her native nothingness we come in the fifth place to the well-known definition of st bernard which proves its practical value by its wide acceptance as well by devout writers as among the faithful humility he says is the virtue by which from the truest knowledge of himself a man becomes vile in his own eyes this is a definition on the side of self-knowledge as humility is the foundation of all the virtues self-knowledge is the foundation of humility st lawrence justinian emphatically insists that self-knowledge is both the ground of its existence and the condition of its growth and progress from which he concludes with st bernard that without self-knowledge it is impossible to be saved how can a man have the fear of god if he knows not why he should fear how can he have contrition of heart to break up and dissolve the state of sin if he knows not why he should be contrite how can he have compunction if the arrows of divine justice have not pierced his soul with indignation how can he be humble if he knows not why he should be ashamed he who is ignorant of himself is most certainly ignorant of god for it is by one and the same light imparted to us that we know god and know ourselves and it is by entering into ourselves that we find the light that gives us the knowledge of god that is the reason why we say of one returning to god that he has entered into himself the whole difference between the godly and the ungodly is that the one lives inside and the other outside himself but if the man who is ignorant of himself is ignorant of god the grace of god is also ignorant of him in how many places of holy scripture does the almighty say that he knows this or that one but not in mercy 
when adam hid himself among the trees the lord god called to him adam where art thou he asked not where he was hidden but recalled him to himself and so to his creator of the israelites prevaricating in the desert the almighty said these men always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways psalm ninety four verses ten and eleven ignorant of the ways of their own heart they were ignorant of the ways of god who swore in his wrath that they should not enter into his rest the foolish virgins slumbered and their lamps the lights of their souls were neglected and coming to the banquet after the doors were closed the bridegroom answered from within amen i say to you i know you not st matthew chapter twenty five verse twelve how wonderful the god who knows all knows not them who know not themselves he knows their sin but not their pardon knowledge puffeth up but not the knowledge of oneself this knowledge is the sure remedy against every sort of pride it rectifies every kind of knowledge because it puts us in the just point of view for understanding every truth and detecting every error but without the knowledge of oneself we can neither understand one single thing correctly nor bear oneself towards any one as it properly becomes us to do i would have a man says st bernard to know himself above all things reason and order and utility demand this of him the right order is to start from oneself and to know what we are this knowledge is so useful because instead of inflating it humbles us and prepares us for being spiritually built up for without a solid foundation of humility the spiritual building will never stand the soul will find nothing so quick and decisive to humble her as to know what she really is only she must dissemble nothing must have no guile in her spirit must set herself plainly before her eyes must allow of no cheating nor be frightened away from seeing clean through herself whatever pain this may bring her as she looks into herself with the clear truth she will find herself in a region of unlikeness will sigh over the miseries she is sure to discover and will be disposed to cry to god like the prophet thou hast humbled me in thy truth psalm 118 verse 75 how can she be otherwise than humbled when she finds the load of her sins the oppression of her mortal body the earthly cares that entangle her the carnal desires that stain and enfeeble her soul she will find herself perplexed with error exposed to danger disturbed with fear encompassed with difficulties teased with suspicion grieved with trouble inclined to some vice that she condemns and helpless to practise the virtue she approves how then can she lift up her eyes with self-reliance and her head with pride will she not rather turn in anguish whilst the thorn is fastened will she not turn to tears be converted to weeping and return to the lord and in a humbled spirit cry to him heal thou my soul for i have sinned against thee psalm forty verse five and after turning to god he will console her because he is the father of mercies and the god of consolation end of lecture four part two lecture four part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain 
lecture four on the nature of humility part three so long as i look into myself the eye of the soul dwells in bitterness but when i look from myself to the divine mercy the consoling vision of my god will temper and soften the bitter vision of myself and i shall say to him my soul is troubled within me wherefore i will be mindful of thee psalm forty one verse seven it is no obscure vision of god that gives us the experience how fatherly he is and how inclined to our prayer which shows us in very truth that he is gracious and merciful patient and rich in mercy exodus chapter thirty four verse six his nature is goodness his property to have mercy and to spare we know by experience that this is the order in which god becomes known to us in the way of salvation when a man enters into himself goes into his miseries and wants and cries from the midst of them to god who will then hear him and say i will deliver thee and thou shalt honour me psalm forty nine verse fifteen thus shall thy knowledge of thyself be thy path to the knowledge of god and through the renewal of his image in thee he shall be seen by thee whilst thou beholding with confidence the grace of the lord with open face shall be transformed to the same image from brightness to brightness as by the spirit of the lord when we examine st bernard's definition closely we shall find that it only takes the intellectual side of humility it takes in the perception of our native vileness but not the conduct of the will in the sight of that vileness it is therefore but a partial definition and was not intended for more the saint is expressly speaking of intellectual humility and of that alone and from other points of view he gives other definitions he is showing that humility is the fruit of grace before it is the fruit of light and the fruit of prayer before it is the fruit of reflection he then listens to our blessed lord giving thanks to his father because he has hidden the secrets of truth from the wise and prudent that is from the proud and has revealed those secrets to little ones that is to the humble and he then concludes from this it appears that truth is hidden from the proud and revealed to the humble of humility therefore this may be the definition humility is the virtue by which from the truest knowledge of himself a man becomes vile in his own eyes this belongs to those who dispose ascensions in their heart and go on from virtue to virtue that is from lower to higher degrees until they come to the summit of humility from which as from mount sion they look out upon the whole prospect of truth the mere perception of oneself and of one's vileness would reduce us to despair humility therefore essentially implies the comparison of our self-knowledge with our knowledge of god of our vileness with his goodness and mercy for st bernard's complete view of this virtue we must therefore go to other of his writings in a sublime discourse on the canticles for instance he takes this more comprehensive view justice is consummated in humility there is a humility which truth generates but it has no fervour and there is a humility which charity forms and it enkindles the soul if thou look upon thy inward self in the light of truth and look without dissimulation and there judge thyself without flattery doubt not but that thou wilt be humbled and become vile in thine own eyes yet though thy self-knowledge make thee humble 
even then thou wilt not perhaps endure to have the truth known to other persons because thy humility is thus far but the work of knowledge and comes not yet from the infusion of love the splendour of truth hath enlightened thee and hath shown thee in a true and healthy way what thou art but if beyond this thou hadst been affected with the love of that truth there is no doubt but that thou wouldst have wished all men to have that opinion of thee which thou hast of thyself as far as that can go and i say as far as that can go because it is not proper to make everything known that we know of ourselves because the charity of truth as well as the truth of charity forbids the wish to make that known to other persons which were it known would do them an injury here as in many other places st bernard shows that it is charity that brings humility to perfection as an affective disposition of the heart and his final definition accords with our first the sum of humility he says appears to consist in this that our will should be duly subject to the will of god it may be well to say a word here in reply to those ungodly men who look upon humility as degrading to man it is impossible for any man to understand what he is not disposed to see or for seeing which he is not in the right point of view or in the right condition of mind no man can know himself without the means of comparison with what he ought to resemble humility results from self-examination in the light of god in which light is the standard of truth and justice whereby we measure what we are in the sight of god st paul draws this distinction between the man of the world and the man of god that the first sees in his own light and the second in the light of god he says to them who had passed from the first to the second light ye were heretofore darkness but now light in the lord ephesians chapter five verse eight the first light is singularly obscure in what concerns oneself especially where an unconscious pride prevails but he who knows not his pride knows not himself he knows not how much he takes to himself that neither in truth or justice belongs to him he knows not what great things are wanting to him for which nevertheless his soul was made he makes great things of what are inferior to him and looks with but little concern upon those truly great things far superior to himself which he might have if he chose he lives the life of nature not of pure but disordered nature and sees but the surface of things which he is disposed to refer to himself and not to his creator the eye of the eagle to that of the mole is the figure of the distance between the insight of the humble christian and that of the natural man immersed in self-sufficiency it is altogether another sight and a different power the earthly man sees not the difference between the soul in herself and the soul clothed with spiritual light between her created existence and the good with which god can endow that existence between the faculties of the soul and the truth and grace presented to those faculties in the choice of which lies good or evil life or death the man one calls oneself is the man without that divine light without those grand objects without that spiritual good for which he was created the grand object for which we came into existence is more than the light and grace of god it is god himself and those gifts are given to guide and lead and help us to him 
we are not our own good nor are the things around or beneath us our good however useful in their place and order but god is our good and whatever comes from god that is better than ourselves helps us on to him we have but the capacity for good and the power of working with the good we receive pride is the practical denial of this truth a truth that springs from the constitution of our nature and therefore it is said in holy scripture that pride was not made for man ecclesiasticus chapter ten verse twenty two it is not as compared with anything in this world that man is vile but as compared with the justice and perfection of his creator it is when considered in himself and as he would be were god to leave him to himself unenlightened ungraced unhelped even in the order of providence vacant of all but himself stained too and disordered with sin that we say that man is nothing before god it is in contrast with the divine support that saves us from returning to nothing and with the noble gifts we receive or might receive and with the infinitely noble end to which we were created to aspire and advance that we say man in himself is vile and worthless moreover it is the tendency of the creature sprung from nothingness to bring the gifts of god to nothingness and to debase and defile himself with things baser than himself and to falsify himself with egotistical pride and vanity that make him vile to very baseness we say then that without the merciful and loving grace of god and without an unfailing cooperation with his never-failing goodness we are needy and poor the psalmist felt this when he prayed but i am needy and poor o god be thou my help psalm sixty nine verse six when the soul takes this just and truthful view of her infirmities she rises from blindness to truth and looks to god to raise her out of her vileness she humbles herself in the truth because it is just and the god who loves truth and justice exalts her but in our feeble and defiled origin in the multitude and malice of our sins in the corruption of our earthly body blinding the soul with concupiscences distempers illusions and low desires in the subjugation of our mind and judgment to our imagination in the petulance of our senses given now to levity now to gloom in the fickle inconstancy of the mind at the mercy of every mood of our earthly frame in the dissensions of our heart from our mind and of our mind from our heart in the blinding excitements of our passions and the unreasoning rage of our appetites in our uncertain purposes feeble resolves and failures of performance in the poverty of our acts compared with the pomp of our pretensions in the selfish meanness jealousy and moral cowardice that lurk like serpents in the caverns of our pride in our slavery to human respect in our dissemblings with ourselves and our simulations with other men in our slowness of faith and want of patience under trials in the languor of our charity and our want of magnanimity in those obscurations of the soul where pride and self-sufficiency stop the light of god from entering in the neglect and abuse of the grace and goodness of our lord our saviour and our god in the very nothingness from which we came and on which unheeded by us the creative hand of god supports us in these and in many things besides we know and feel that we are vile 
and the more we contemplate ourselves in the sight of god the more vile we find ourselves it was after contemplations like these that david exclaimed i was reduced to nothing and i knew it not i am become as a beast of burden before thee and i am always with thee psalm seventy two verses twenty two and twenty three and finding that he was no good to himself he concluded my good is to adhere to god to set my hope on the lord psalm seventy two verse twenty eight st francis of sales therefore gives us this well-known advice never to think long on our own miseries without thinking of the mercies of god lest we despair and never to think long on the mercies of god without thinking of our own miseries lest we presume there is a sixth definition of humility which is more profound and comprehensive and which has originated in contemplative minds accustomed to look more deeply into things this definition is based upon the first of the eight beatitudes blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven st matthew chapter five verse three this beatitude has always been interpreted as profound humility the poor in spirit are they who detached from all but god claim nothing as their own their heart is with their treasure and their treasure is in heaven st chrysostom says with great justice on this text that as pride is the root and cause of all evil christ began his teaching by plucking out the root of pride and planting humility in its place as a firm foundation on which all things else might be built but if our subjection be lost this foundation is destroyed and all the good gathered upon it will perish to be poor in spirit is to have nothing of one's own nothing but what one receives from god if as st chrysostom observes the word poor in the original text signifies a needy mendicant this does not prevent him from deciding that the humble in spirit are here meant who always feel their poverty and are always asking god for help for true humility springs from the sense of our native poverty and is fostered by a cheerful detachment from whatever is not ordained for us by the will of god the voice of true humility is the voice of the psalmist the lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup it is thou that wilt restore my inheritance to me psalm fifteen verse five and for what have i in heaven and besides thee what do i desire on earth for this my flesh and my heart hath fainted away thou art the god of my heart and the god that is my portion for ever it is good for me to adhere to god to put my hope in the lord psalm seventy two this poverty of spirit withdraws the will of man from all self-love and from every love that is not in god and not for god that god alone may be the one object of love and that all things may be loved in god and for god this full and perfect love of god generates a complete abdication of self-love and the humility of love that as st thomas observes has its root in the knowledge of the majesty of god and in the most true and profound reverence of god from this knowledge of the supreme majesty of god and this unbounded reverence there springs up a sense in the soul that accounts all we are without god as nothing and inspires us with self-contempt from this point of view rusbrock defines the virtue in these terms humility is the abasement of the soul that is 
it is a certain internal and profound inclination and subjection of the heart and soul towards the most high majesty of god which justice commands and which the heart endowed with divine love and pressed by charity cannot refuse speaking elsewhere of the profound reverential fear that springs from the loving contemplation of the divine majesty he says that from this loving fear true humility and unfeigned self-objection are born whilst the soul is attentive to the greatness of god and her own littleness to the wisdom of god and her own ignorance to the wealth and generosity of god and her own poverty and want poverty of spirit springs from the true knowledge of our nature and this knowledge is caused by the penetration of the light of truth and justice into the innermost recesses of the soul where we see without possibility of error how our very existence rests on god and all our light life and love are received from him then we come to the last phase of humility which is the expression of unbounded gratitude this is the truth of all truths and the law of all laws for the rational creature this gratitude this humble love return to him who has loved us first who has created us from love who has preserved us with love who has redeemed us from love who has given us his holy spirit of love and has prepared for us the kingdom of his love in this love is our life and the gratitude of this love is the perfection of humility this reaction of our soul to the divine action within us the returning of love for his love the grateful acknowledgment from our inmost spirit that all we are or have received or shall receive is from the goodness of our divine benefactor is the foundation of all christian humility and of all christian dignity it is the foundation of all christian humility which feels and confesses in every form of gratitude our absolute dependence in all things upon god as well for our being as for our deliverance from evil and for our partaking of his good and perfect gifts it is the foundation of all christian dignity which admits of no other authority over the soul than that which comes from god to acknowledge our dependence with humble gratitude on god alone and that his will alone ought to rule our will is the only just way of using our liberty to think upon the sovereign will of god to feel and to love that divine will which is the rule of justice and the source of all communicated good and to make that will the law of our life is that which constitutes true christian dignity a dignity before god as great in the poor man clothed with rags as in the prince who is robed in purple humility is the just and truthful expression in our thought sense and conduct of our nature our position and our dependence as the subjects of god it is the order arising out of that subjection and dependence it takes the form of gratitude in responding to the divine generosity a gratitude that springs from all the good of which we are the subjects deepened by all the sense of our being undeserving of that good yet whilst the soul is made to be the complete subject of god and to freely love and adhere to him with our whole mind heart soul and strength she finds on self-examination that there is a division within her this division as she finds is owing to her self-love her mind and heart are divided between god and herself when she examines this self-love 
she finds that it is nourished by inordinate earthly desires and by the vanities of life and when she looks more deeply into herself she finds that pride divides her affections with the love of god this may not be in the summit of the soul where the love of god may be but on the part of the inferior soul which divides the affections of the will and troubles her peace what is the remedy to denude the soul of these inordinate affections opening those closed recesses of the soul to the light of god and humbling herself into subjection to a greater depth she will take the short sharp and decisive way with these inordinate affections will cut off their supplies and deny herself the objects and the acts that foster her self-love but after this is done there still remains the spring of self-love within the soul which is not only tenacious but often difficult to get at and to understand before it can be converted and changed into the love of god to accomplish this will cost many efforts and wounds to nature but in the proportion in which self-love is sacrificed the will becomes free and generous and subjects herself to the grace of god more ardently uniformly and consistently this brings us to the final expression of humility which is sacrifice humility is the spiritual element in all sacrifice it is the surrender of nature and life to god that by his power they may be altogether changed into a better form the one divine sacrifice obtained its power from the unspeakable humility of him who offered his human nature and life to the sovereign justice of the father of all in his innocence he sacrificed himself in the likeness of sinful man that through partaking of the grace of his divine and inexhaustible humility every sinful nature might be changed and made subject to god through that sacrifice we have all received the power of offering ourselves as spiritual victims to god humility is the interior spiritual sacrificial action through which with the profoundest veneration and gratitude we offer to god the being and life we have received from him with the desire and the prayer that we may die to ourselves and live to him that we may be wholly changed and transformed into his likeness detached from earth and united with god but as we come to our god from sin and dark ingratitude we owe more to him than our being and our life we owe him the contrition the breaking to pieces of our sinful form with regret and sorrow that we have defiled and defaced his beautiful work we owe to him that we throw away every breath of vanity falsehood and evil which when cast out of us is nothing penitential contrition must therefore be added to our humble gratitude as an essential part of our sacrifice that we may offer ourselves to his recreating hand an oblation to his mercy as well as to his goodness to his pardoning as well as to his bountiful love we may therefore give a final definition of humility as the grateful acknowledgment to god of all we are and have and as the sacrifice and surrender of our whole being to god that he may reform it to perfection by his goodness although the beginning of humility prepares the way for charity perfect humility is the fruit of perfect charity the more we love god the less we value ourselves the nearer we approach to god the more sensible grows the truth that we have no foundation in ourselves we then understand the psalmist's words 
the lord is my firmament my refuge and my deliverer psalm 17 verse 3 finding no foundation but the being of god on which to rest the soul seeks to enter into his power and to fill her treasury from his good when therefore god touches the soul with his good she denies herself repudiates her own will and surrenders herself to the gracious will of god and that will becomes her own and as the will of god is not only free but is the very freedom the spirit of servile fear is taken away and in its place is given the adoption as of a son of god and of a joint heir with christ whereby that soul is exalted in god and humbled to nothing in herself is emptied of herself and filled with divine gifts thus the highest freedom blends with the lowest humility he who is truly humble truly empty of himself is a vessel of election to god full to overflowing with his benedictions he has only to ask to receive still more he is the child of all the beatitudes poor in spirit meek of heart hungering and thirsting after justice when humility finds nothing in herself to rest upon she finds her true centre and that centre is god but where the soul requires external persuasion to be humble she is still much engaged with those phantoms of sense and imagination which she blindly mistakes for herself but when filled with the life of god we cannot help being humble the soul then sees two abysses the abyss of her nothingness in the abyss of god this caused saint paul to glory in his infirmity that the power of christ might dwell in him and so to denude himself of all things surrendering them to their divine giver that he was able to say i live now not i but christ lives in me galatians chapter two verse twenty this humility knows nothing of her own virtue what humility knows of herself is her own abasement emptiness and unworthiness in the sight of god yet this true humility brings great peace and joy because what we vacate of ourselves is filled with the charity of god and our love of god extends to all that god loves which puts us in harmony with all good of every kind so that what we once loved in a natural way to please ourselves we now love in a divine way from partaking of the love with which god loves all things being in our true position and just point of view we see all things in a purer light and as our sight is uncolored by self-love we see them justly and from god's point of view for the humble soul alone has got the divine as well as the human measure of things end of lecture four part three lecture five part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture five on the grounds of humility part one i know o lord that thy judgments are equity and in thy truth thou hast humbled me psalm one hundred eighteen verse seventy five because humility is accused by pride of acting the part of vice in lowering the dignity of man in degrading him from his worth and bringing him under a mean and timid superstition our next duty will be to show that this virtue belongs to the dignity of truth and the nobility of justice 
the fumes that ascend from the animal senses to the mind and the enchantments that are worked by self-love in the imagination obscure the vision of truth but like the rod of aaron there is a divine power in humility to break the spell restore us to sober sense and bring back the perception of truth instead of lowering man from his true dignity this virtue dissolves the theatrical illusions of mock dignity instead of debasing his worth humility discovers where his true worth lies and dispels the fictitious charms of false greatness the first office of humility is to put up with no deception but to find out the very truth respecting ourselves when the truth is found the second office of humility is to do justice to the discovery and to be severe in repressing what is false and unjust in the estimate we have taken of ourselves but we can only take this just measure of ourselves in the light of god's truth and by the rule of his justice and this caused the psalmist to say i know o lord that thy judgments are equity and in thy truth thou hast humbled me the true dignity of man is very great too great for anything but humility to know for humility is the price of that knowledge when a man looks for that dignity where it is not to be found and refuses to look where it is to be found he gets himself entangled in delusions and falsehoods that disgrace him and in his ignorance he invests his immortal soul in an unfitting robe of party-coloured pretensions that will not suffer the light to go through them and missing his true greatness he dishonours his soul and becomes little and contemptible in the sight of god the true dignity of man is in his spiritual nature in the image of god formed in that nature and in the capacity of his soul for eternal good this is the beginning of his dignity the advancement of his dignity is in receiving the eternal truth from god that he may live in its light and in the hope and charity that draw him out of himself out of his own contracted limits into the sphere of divine things but the altitude of his dignity is in his final end in that god who is the object of his existence and the fountain of all his good and happiness the true dignity of man is therefore infinitely more in god than in himself and can only be reached in perfection when he is united with god meanwhile it is his duty and ought to be his ambition to follow the truth revealed by god wherever it may lead him and to begin with the knowledge of himself this will bring him on the grounds of humility and from those grounds he will hear the voice of eternal justice the first ground of humility is our creation from nothing we are of a short time our beginning was feeble as became our origin and nothing was the womb of us all whence are we from the creative will of god what are we an existence dependent on the will of god whither are we going onwards ever onwards the body to the dust the soul to the judgment seat of god god is the one absolute perfect being we are but existences the products of his will dependent on him for all we are and have and all this great scene about us that fills our senses is of less value than the last soul that was created and born into this world for the soul is for god but this visible universe for the service and probation of the soul god has promised us an eternal existence and that promise he will fulfil but this increases instead of lessening our dependence on god 
we are not only dependent on god for our existence but for all the conditions of our existence his will is his love so that in love he created us and in love he upholds us by the word of his power the voice of the eternal word to saint catherine of siena is a voice to every intelligent creature knowest thou what thou art and art not and who i am if thou knowest these two things thou shalt be blessed thou art who art not and i am who am if thou hast this knowledge in thy soul the enemy can never deceive thee and thou shalt escape all his snares thou wilt never do anything against my commandments and wilt obtain every grace every truth and every enlightenment having no being of our own none but what we receive from god none but what we hold of his provident goodness we have no ground for pride none for self-glorification if any man think himself to be something says st paul whereas he is nothing he deceiveth himself galatians chapter six verse three what we are we are of god but nothing of ourselves the root of our existence is not in ourselves but in the will of god and to this fundamental truth we may apply the words of the apostle if thou boastest thou bearest not the root but the root thee romans chapter eleven verse eighteen as humility is just and gives to god the things that come from god and as pride is unjust and gives to one's self the things that come from god as to the creation of man is the glory of god and not his own glory it is evident as the scripture says that pride was not made for man once allow the fact of our creation and it must evidently follow that humility is the most creaturely of virtues and pride the most uncreaturely of vices the second ground of humility is in our intellectual light that light makes us reasonable creatures in that light we see the first principles of truth order and justice it is the foundation of our mind and of our conscience man is variable and changeable and one man differs from another but the light of truth and justice shines one and the same to all and the chief difference between one man and another is in the degree of his communion with that light but the light of reason is implanted in our soul at her creation and is made ours through the exercise of our understanding and will yet the origin of that light is from god which caused the psalmist to say the light of thy countenance is signed upon us o lord psalm four verse seven and he again says to god with thee is the fountain of life and in thy light we shall see light psalm thirty five verse ten and to show that the light of truth is also the light of justice he says in the next psalm he will bring forth thy justice as the light and thy judgments as the noonday psalm thirty six verse six often in the sacred scriptures is the light of god called the light of justice although this is much more applicable to the light of grace than to that of nature in the sublime opening of st john's gospel we are taught the true origin of the light which shines into our mind and conscience in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god all things were made by him and without him was made nothing that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it that was the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world 
st john chapter one verses one through nine the word of god is the substantial light the original reason from whom all men receive the light of reason in a way that is obscure to them until the revelation of god makes it more clear the darkness into which that light shines is a darkness owing to sin which cannot see the cause of light or the divine fountain from which it comes to the mind the light is there but the mental eye is turned from the giver of the light and the light itself is obscured by the gross shadows of the sensual man let him turn to god receive the faith and purge his sight and he will know the divine author of his light blessed are the clean of heart for they shall see god st matthew chapter five verse eight the lovers of this world come not to the light to know the author of their light but they who love the word of god incarnate know that he is not only their light but the light of the world st john chapter eight verse twelve for he enlighteneth every man that cometh into the world with the light of reason if not with the light of faith alas that so many should prefer their own darkness to the author of their light but our souls are the subjects of the light of god and were that light to cease from shining into our soul we should be reduced to mental and moral darkness yet if there is one thing of which a man boasts and on which he prides himself it is on the light of his reason as if it flowed from his own fountain and had not its origin in god if there is anything which instead of treating with reverence man abuses as if it were of his own creation and dominion to make and unmake at will it is the light that shines from god unto his mind and shines to bring him to the knowledge of god of his truth and of his justice but the root of these abuses is pride which refuses to be subject to the light of god whilst humility is the virtue that corrects this pride and restores us to our true position as the obedient subjects of truth and justice wherefore both truth and justice compel us to conclude that as humility is the most creaturely of virtues and pride the most uncreaturely of vices humility is also the most intellectual of virtues and pride the most unintellectual of vices what have the proud done that has not led to error and folly and what have the humble done that has not led to truth and wisdom the third ground of humility is in our dependence on the providence of god if we separate ourselves in thought from all that is not ourself we shall begin to understand what we are we shall see that if we were detached from that wonderful system of provisions which god adapts to every requirement of our mind heart and body we should perish instantly from the heavens above from the earth below from persons and things far and near that serve our needs and desires we find ourselves the subjects of god's divine providence he created them he rules them he directs them to our help in their times and seasons the sun gives us light and warmth the air gives the body its vital energy the earth renders us support and nourishment the living creatures in every element supply us with food and clothing god himself gives us light of mind the whole visible creation is our teacher as also are our brethren beyond these vast provisions for our service is the ruling action of god reaching from end to end mightily and disposing all things sweetly wisdom chapter eight verse one separate the products of your own will from the products of the will of god 
and you will understand how at every step and turn you depend in a thousand ways on the providence of god then may you put to yourself st paul's question what hast thou that thou hast not received and if thou hast received why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received one corinthians chapter four verse seven this wonderful providence with which god embraces us and on which we so absolutely depend makes us know what needy and perishing creatures we should be were we left to ourselves the evidence is everywhere about us that were not god to uphold and to foster his creature with countless provisions that creature must return to nothingness look at the many things upon which our life in this world depends a very little change in the position of any one of them would cause the dissolution of our body and send our soul into the world of spirits our life with its conditions is in the hand of god the constant manifold and loving service of god to his rational creatures is amazing but when we turn to the recipients of this loving care and inexhaustible bounty and see how scanty is the return of gratitude or even of recognition we may learn to what a state of mental and moral degradation the great mass of human nature is reduced but this excessive humiliation of human nature is not humility the humble see all things in the hand of god they greatly revere his loving providence and are greatly dependent on his goodness wherefore receive repay beware receive the bounties of god from his hand with humility repay his goodness with thanksgiving beware of ingratitude the fourth ground of humility is our sins whereby we have deformed and denaturalized our nature ungraced ourselves before god and incurred his reprobation if the creature has cause to be humble how far greater cause has the sinful creature the innocent creature is in a low estate by nature but the sinner has descended to one incomparably lower by the conduct of his will the creature is from nothing but the sinner deserves to return to nothing yet the mercy of god comes in and in justice to his eternal plans he upholds his fallen creature in existence as the sinner has not answered the end of his being but failed from it by his own act and choice on his own part he has forfeited the right to that being but for profound reasons of mercy that dwell in the divine counsels god does not accept the forfeit the rational creature wants nothing belonging to his nature and so as long as he is innocent his nature is perfect and only demands fidelity to the loving grace of god to bring him to the glorious end and happiness prepared for him but the sinner is a creature disordered deformed and defiled who has deprived himself of the very first form of perfection that belongs to his nature the creature is the work of god the sinner is his own work god forms the creature man makes the sinner the imperfection of the innocent creature is neither an imperfection of nature of constitution or of due conditions but as that creature is the subject of god and god himself is the divine object of that creature he can never come to completion until his whole nature is subject to god and in perfect union with him but the grievous sinner has renounced god as the supreme object of his will and desire has put pride in the place of obedience has thereby corrupted his nature and made that crooked and perverse which god created just and right has deformed all that god made beautiful in him 
and made that guilty and impure which god made innocent and good he stands condemned by his conscience in which the justice of god spoke to his heart and to which as well as to himself he has done violence the mercy of god may visit him and if he discards his pride and repenting avows his degraded condition and his great need of the divine mercy that infinite mercy may restore him to justice and even to the friendship of god but the history of his fall can never be effaced because it is the history of the unspeakable patience and condescension of god and an everlasting ground for the gratitude and love of the pardoned sinner but never can he recover the first bright bloom of that innocence in which he was created for all have sinned and do need the glory of god romans chapter three verse twenty three he will carry for ever upon him the ineffaceable signs of a creature made for god lost to god and through the most wonderful condescension of the divine goodness restored to god for we are redeemed in the blood of jesus christ and are justified by his grace we receive in baptism the innocence of christ and that innocence is more beautiful and precious than the innocence of adam but the loss of that original innocence can never be forgotten for this would be to forget the wonderful work of our redemption even our actual sins however grievous may be blotted out in the blood of christ if we humble ourselves and repent and our injustice be rectified to perfect justice by the all-powerful grace of christ we may even obtain through greater humility a greater sanctity than was destined for the state of innocence and consequently a greater glory as the saints have done but never can this be less than true that every soul of man has received the mercy of god and that every faithful man has been raised by god not only from his state of nature but from a state of death and sin we are all the subjects of the divine mercy we are therefore subject to god not only as his creatures not only as the objects of his providential care not only as illuminated by him in our reason but we are also the subjects of his mercy and redeeming grace and the unfathomable depths of injustice and degradation from which his mercy and grace have raised us ought to be the measure of the depth of our humility if we truly know what we were of ourselves and what god has made us by his goodness the pride that brought us into those depths of sin and degradation and brought us so near to nothing is the most miserable and debasing caricature of just thought and good sense yet nothing could or ever can rescue us from its absurd and malicious folly but that honest virtue of humility which jesus christ has brought into the world the sin in which we were born and by which we became aliens from god is a deep ground for humility even after it is effaced and we carry its consequences in our body and in our weakened powers but what of those sins that we have ourselves committed after our regeneration to faith and justice what of this new league with the devil and his works that we had so solemnly renounced what of this new abandonment of light conscience and god we have gone down into a much lower degradation than that of original sin in which our own will never acted and have fallen from a greater height for the grace of christ is greater than the grace of adam why were we raised from sin to justice from death to life from communion with evil to communion with god if only to fall anew and into greater evil 
oh the weakness of man and the unbounded mercy of god of what have we to be proud what have we of our own that ought not to humble us if neither our condition of dependent creatures nor our mental dependence on the light of god nor our absolute dependence on the will of his providence nor our first deliverance from sin and death nor the dependence of our heart on the divine grace for our peace and happiness are curbs sufficient on the elation of our self-love or checks strong enough to stay our insane tendency to return to evil surely surely the signs whereby we have so far unchristianized our christian life ought to make us humble and to fill us with the conviction that without a profound subjection to the strengthening power of god we can never be safe whether we think of their enormity or their abominable folly our sins are our deepest ground for humiliation and shame their enormity is seen in breaking down the eternal order of law and justice in preferring the creature to the creator and choosing a paltry amount of apparent good before the supreme and eternal good this is why god who loves every nature he has created hates the sinfulness that dishonours his work the most high hateth sinners ecclesiasticus chapter twelve verse three and saith they who despise me shall be despised one kings chapter two verse thirty the abominable folly of our sins is seen in the suicidal folly of their self-destructiveness and in the gloomy delight taken in a fleeting joy that is at strife with all the good that is in us and that puts an end to our spiritual life and peace justly have the scriptures called this folly an abomination the way of the wicked is an abomination to the lord proverbs chapter fifteen verse nine and even the victims of the wicked are abominable to the lord proverbs chapter fifteen verse eight if we are not humbled to the dust by our part in these truths we are not yet cured of our pride god grant that it may not have passed from an inflamed to an indurated condition or even into gangrene in which case it will call for the severe knife of incision but humbling remedies alone can cure this vital disease blindness and spiritual insensibility begin the disorder and develop the evil to its mortal malignancy the most wonderful of all things is the patience of god in the long endurance of this self-elation that is always rising against his law and always producing sin first inflaming the soul to evil then deadening her to the sense of evil then excusing the evil done the disease is in the will and therefore cannot be healed without the will and god is infinitely patient with our abominable folly because he will not injure the freedom of the will listen to the well-known words in which st augustine points to the root in our weak nature of all our sin and all our misery the devil could never have caught man in open sin doing what god forbade him to do if he had not first begun by delighting in himself this brought him to delight in the words ye shall be as gods which would have been better realized had they adhered to the supreme principle of all things instead of trying by pride to exist upon themselves as a principle the more they thirst in their self-love to be sufficient for themselves the less they are because they fall from him who is all-sufficient for them the evil whereby a man delights in himself as though he were his own light turns him from that light the delight in which makes him to be light 
but this evil begins in secret before it appears openly for it is truly written that pride goeth before destruction and the spirit is lifted up before a fall proverbs chapter sixteen verse eighteen secret ruin is completed before open ruin though the soul may not think it to be ruin who thinks that his self-exaltation is ruin yet by this failure the most high is abandoned and who sees not the ruin after god's commandment has been openly transgressed god therefore gave an open prohibition that it might be impossible to justify its violation and i venture to say that it is sometimes useful for the proud man to fall into some open and manifold sin that as he has fallen already through inward delight in himself he may begin to be displeased with himself peter was in a much healthier state when he wept in his displeasure with himself than when he gave way to presumption through delight in himself and the psalmist prays to god fill their faces with ignominy that they may seek thy face o god psalm eighty two verse seventeen that is that they may delight to seek thy name who before delighted in their own the wise and experienced saint is not advocating the usefulness of sin but of its manifestation to the sinner what he would have us to understand is this that all sin originates from internal elation or pride and acts from the pleasure to be found in that self-elation but this delight within oneself is so secret and self-blinding that the elation of pride often corrupts the soul and separates her from god without the evil being seen or realized so that there is pleasure where there ought to be great displeasure then says the saint with great truth it may sometimes be useful that the internal evil should manifest itself in an external and open fall that the soul may be thoroughly humbled and brought to shame and so find out the evil disposition within that has caused the outward sin what a revelation of human infirmity is this and what a ground for humility and fear of ourselves owing to the neglect of cultivating humility the ferment of evil elation is often so hidden from ourselves that our eye can only be opened by some visible and disgraceful fall that at last awakens us to displeasure with oneself End of Lecture 5, Part 1lecture five part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture five on the grounds of humility part two the fifth ground of humility is in the weakness ignorance and concupiscence that we have inherited from original sin and have increased by our actual sins on our moral weakness we spoke in the last lecture as of a chief ground of humility whilst explaining st bernard's definition of humility but our corporal weakness has an enormous influence in causing our moral weakness we speak not of weakness of health but of weakness from loss of order and subjection to the soul there is nothing more humiliating to our life than that we carry about with us in our earthly frame the testimony of our sin and the testimony that god resists the proud and carry it in a body that is proud without intelligence in a body that is disordered in its members on fire with concupiscence rebellious against the spirit and lusting against the law of god 
this sensual body with an unruly flame in its nerves and blood drags the spirit down to partake of its blind egotism and stimulates the unguarded will to an inordinate ungenerous debasing self-love that develops into the elation of pride for this is the ordinary generation of evil concupiscence stimulates self-love self-love joins with concupiscence in stimulating the soul with elation elation swells the imagination with images of our self-importance that obscure the light of truth and act delusively upon the will the will thus excited and deceived accepts evil for good hence the vast importance of watching the first movements of elation and of being humble in the truth that we may be sensible of the first movements of self-elation this concupiscence is the inordinate appetite produced by the disordered senses and powers every man is tempted says st james by his own concupiscence being drawn and allured then when concupiscence hath conceived it bringeth forth sin st james chapter one verses fourteen and fifteen st paul calls this concupiscence the will of the flesh ephesians chapter two verse three which he says is not subject to god nor can it be romans chapter eight verse seven to the three concupiscences enumerated by st john all the rest are reducible these are sensible concupiscence curiosity and pride the concupiscence of the flesh the concupiscence of the eyes and the pride of life one john chapter two verse sixteen of these the one that is the least considered but should be the most because of its immense influence on the other concupiscences is the cupidity of curiosity of all cupidities it is the most destructive of innocence it awakens the senses to unknown evils sets the imagination at work upon them and kindles the flame of desire to taste and try the unknown from our first parents to their last descendants that curiosity which st john calls the concupiscence of the eyes has acted keenly on our mental faculties as well as on the imagination producing a thirst to obtain the sensible experience of what is forbidden and what is worse the very prohibition provokes curiosity let any one examine what has passed in his soul when he has been for some time inwardly drawn by a strong temptation towards evil and he will be surprised to find how large has been the influence of curiosity nor is this concupiscence of curiosity limited to the senses it acts with most subtle influence upon the pride of life especially in what regards strange doctrines of error heresy and infidelity all which st paul with his inspired insight has not hesitated to connect with the concupiscence of the flesh by reason of its attraction for the imagination in these days the perils of curiosity are immensely increased not only because of the unguarded manners of social life but because the cupidity of curiosity is fed by the purveyors of every kind of information good and bad as well as by the professed entertainers of the imagination who write with little regard for innocence or purity the habitual indulgence of curiosity like the habitual indulgence of pride is very apt to grow until we are unconscious of being possessed by a passion so weakening to our moral strength the three concupiscences are the more blinding when they are morosely kept working within than when they are manifested externally and thus become more visible every one knows something of the blinding effects of sensuality and pride 
but only the pure-hearted can see and understand how sensuality brutalizes the soul and pride associates us with the spirit of darkness and not only falsifies the soul but puts her in a point of view to see all things in a wrong light but that cupidity of curiosity which so much deranges the soul is not to be confounded with the just desire of knowledge and of being the enlightened subjects of the calm truth as it is in god evil curiosity is a passion that serves our evil appetites and concupiscences the just desire of knowledge looks straight forward to truth cupidity has a backward glance to the interests of selfishness ignorance of god and ourselves is the great sign that we have least cared about what most concerns us we are born in ignorance and receive the rudiments of knowledge with reluctance when we reach a greater knowledge of god and ourselves it is only through labour of mind and heart with the help of self-denial for our sensual nature works against the light and grace of god our sins again burn up the nerves of the soul break the spiritual bones of the mind and darken the light of the heart the visible world with its glorious show was made to lead our mind to god but through the predominance of sensuality over mind it takes us away from god we know not by any experience what it is to be born innocent and free and to have the light of god as the open sun of the soul we know not what it is to have a body at all times obedient and responsive to the soul and the soul at all times responsive to god the remedy for this painful and defective condition of our life is hard to nature for there is no other than mortification and self-denial yet the world denies and refuses the remedy because where there is question of freeing the spirit by denying inferior things and descending to things superior the spirit of the world is not only ignorant but cowardly even those who have the light of better things too often pursue the worse these undeniable features of the weak side of human nature are most humiliating but they are chiefly humiliating when they do not make us humble as in the nature of things they ought to do and not only ought they to humble us but to show us the prodigious power of that divine grace of humility which is able to free the soul and keep her free from such a complication of snares and entanglements the sixth ground of humility is in the open perils and hidden snares with which we are surrounded st john did not express himself lightly or without inspiration when he declared that the whole world is seated in the wicked one one john chapter five verse nineteen that is to say it is seated within the power of the evil one the apostle is speaking of the heathen world but it is unhappily an undeniable fact that a great part of what once was christendom has returned to the thoughts manners and corruptions of the heathen world through a social atmosphere beflecked and begrimed with the contagious influences of cupidity sensuality vanity and pride the devout christian must walk his way to god error in all its forms unbelief in all its modes and varieties move in their motley shapes through nearly every grade of life with the apparent unconsciousness that truth is one and comes from god the widespread evil of modern life is the amazing indifference to the well-being of the soul the energies of the soul are thrown outwards where they are absorbed in restless activity upon material interests upon the pursuit of natural and secular knowledge and upon abstract speculations 
an intense activity outside the soul pursues its many ways in the name of progress although the object or ultimate aim of that progress is neither thought of nor spoken but it is chiefly a progress not to but from the soul not to but from god and it mainly consists in making and expending money in political and social rivalries in license under the name of freedom in having the results of natural science discovery and art in the enjoyment of literature and the world's news in the pursuit of pleasure in everything that begins and ends in this world whilst the interests of the soul and her sublime relations with god and his eternal truth and infinite good are either made of but secondary interest or are held in indifference or are locked in a deadly paralysis the self-sufficiency of the heathen times has consequently returned as a sort of practical philosophy supplanting the sense of dependence on god the self-reliance that springs from the notion of self-sufficiency and which is a very different thing from doing one's own duties is a species of self-worship as grotesque as it is contrary to the truth of things it practically ignores the intervention of god in the affairs of his creatures but where the divine law of the virtues is made to give way to the humanly invented law of self-sufficiency still beset with the three concupiscences the divine virtues disappear and the natural virtues as in the heathen times are left to work upon the unsubstantial basis of pride pride with a gloss of politeness takes the place of humility a cluster of human opinions of the vague and hazy kind become the substitute of faith and the laws of modesty and purity are exchanged for manners and fashions that lead to boldness and license the literature of the world is the reflection of the world it has become so aggressive on the christian mind that one scarcely knows which of its books or periodicals to open in which there may not be some open or covered assault upon the truths of faith some attack upon the foundations of religion or some insidious invasion upon the purity of moral principles whilst not unfrequently there is an advocacy direct or indirect of one or more of the three concupiscences here the faithful soul has to guard against the cupidity of curiosity or she is thrown into danger without defence a grave statement of evil is one thing a seductive painting of certain evils is altogether another the first is calmly addressed to the calm intelligence the second is an allurement to the excitable imagination through which it stains and corrupts the soul again the spirit of the world is pride and the love of novelty whilst the spirit of the christian is humility and the love of those eternal things that are unchangeable yet always new and always wonderful and the newer and more wonderful the nearer we approach to them but the pride of the world is contagious and the love of novelty is an incessant distraction and a continual diversion from the better things such are some of the open perils that surround the earnest christian and against which he must guard his walks and ways where evil is everywhere it falls upon us like dust from the air and calls for constant purification it is a great humiliation to live in such an atmosphere but a much greater to be exposed to its infection yet what are we by nature but of this common mass of sinful humanity we have contributed of our own to the common evil and this is our greatest humiliation before god and where we have been preserved we have nothing to boast of 
because this is not from anything better in ourselves but of the infinite mercy of god and this gives us a great and special ground for humbling ourselves the more in his presence that we may be safe under his divine protection besides these open perils there are the hidden snares of the evil one who secretes himself behind our concupiscences to do his hidden work this is the significant sense of st john when he says that the world with its concupiscences is seated in the wicked one of these hidden perils we have treated fully in the first lecture what we have here to note is the ground for humility that we have in being surrounded and beset by those spirits of evil from whose insidious temptations humility alone can save us for the works of pride can only be encountered by humility and as the humble soul is under the protection of the most high god the weapons of pride cannot prevail against her hence the apostle warns the christian flock of ephesus to arm their souls with faith and justice that they may extinguish the fiery darts of the most wicked one ephesians chapter six verse sixteen the seventh ground of humility is in the special odiousness and deformity of pride we are assured on divine authority that pride was not made for man we have unhappily made it for ourselves it is the disease of devils and has made them monsters of iniquity and misery and we have contracted the life-devouring leprosy from them it is the vice of all vices the sin of all sins a shrewd writer has observed that men have a natural curiosity for monsters but that pride is a monster that is too familiar and too much akin to us to be stared at as a curiosity our unhappy familiarity with the vice prevents us from realizing its monstrous deformity and excessive ugliness what can be so humiliating as to be the subject of a vice that perverts and blinds our spiritual nature to its centre even to men when it appears externally in other men pride is both odious and ridiculous and what must it be seen in all its interior deformity before god and his angels it is only when seen in the light of humility that we begin to understand how it eats into and undermines all truthfulness honesty and justice no cancer can eat its way more destructively into the soundness of the body than pride eats consumingly into the health of the soul the very best gifts fall under its deadly influence and feed its voracious appetite like the cancer it works inwardly and corrupts the circulation of the spiritual life pride is the one and only enemy of god the malignant root and virulence of the vices the consumer of the virtues the falsification of the man pride is the lying spirit that sacrifices good to evil and even invents the semblances of good out of evil to augment the evil sacrifice making the man who sacrifices the good things of god to his own lust of self-exaltation contemptuously false and radically unjust pride affects independence and self-sufficiency and that in contradiction to all the facts in heaven on earth and in the nature of the man all proving with one voice that without innumerable dependences and providences he must perish soul and body thus pride is the most ungrateful and cruel of vices ungrateful to god and cruel to oneself pride is in direct opposition beyond every other vice to the order reason and truth of things and withstands the whole reason of humility we see then why god hates pride above all other evils 
why his chief punishments fall on pride and why it penally blinds the mind to truth and of its own malignancy corrupts the soul with injustice pride turns all things from god humility turns all things to god pride is the radical disease of the soul humility the radical health of the soul there is no neutral ground between these two and one of the greatest grounds of humility is the escape which it gives us from the most detestable vice of pride the eighth ground of humility is in the consideration of what this virtue does for us it is the essential foundation of all christian faith and charity and consequently the foundation of our salvation it is impossible to imagine a christian without humility or a perfect christian without profound humility for the very notion of christianity is founded in humility as the very notion of infidelity is founded in pride it opens the soul to the truth of christ and the heart to the grace of christ christ chose it for all strength and taught it for all strength what is pride but utter weakness and moral dissolution yet what pride can be healed except through the humility of the son of god what light can reach us from heaven or what charity can quicken the soul unless humility prepare the way for it you can make no road to the truth says st augustine but the one constructed by him who knows as god how feeble are our steps this road is in the first place humility in the second place humility and in the third place humility for although other precepts are given us unless humility go before the good we do and accompany that good and follow after that good unless humility is before us that we may see it and is brought to us that we may cleave to it and is laid upon us that we may be kept within due bounds whilst we are rejoicing in the good we do pride will wrench it altogether from our hands end of lecture five part two lecture five part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture five on the grounds of humility part three we have hitherto considered but those grounds of humility which are in our human nature or that environ us in this world but the ninth ground of humility is first and supreme and that ground is the knowledge of god and his divine perfections the knowledge of god is either acquired or infused acquired knowledge is obtained with the help of divine grace by study and meditation when we reflect on god as he is the supreme majesty infinite goodness and almighty power we feel our own littleness weakness and vileness when we look to him as the divine holiness and purity we become conscious of our sordidness and uncleanness when we meditate on him as the one infinite unchangeable truth we learn to know our extreme ignorance and inconstancy when we open our souls to god as the bountiful giver of all that we stand in need of we find ourselves but as poor and needy mendicants before his generous throne when we draw nearer to him as to the supreme object of our life and desire we find ourselves to be nothing without his presence and his love nothing of ourselves but everything in him for what are we without the light that proceeds from him and the charity that flows from him the god of unbounded excellence dignity and glory 
grows upon our subject soul diminishing her to her true proportions and discovering to her wandering heart that without him she is reduced to nothing then the soul finds that to herself she is nothing indeed whilst god is all things to her and that what she can best do for herself is to subject herself to god with all the reverence and veneration of which she is capable and to depend wholly on his sovereign will infused knowledge comes when god draws near to a soul and gives her some wonderful manifestation of his majesty and divine perfections suddenly the vision comes brief is its stay quickly it departs doing more in that moment than ages of study and meditation could accomplish the soul is struck with stupor and amazement at the glorious revelation and shrinks into her own littleness fully conscious of her weakness and nothingness or perhaps that soul is divinely enlightened in her contemplation to behold the most sweet and wonderful affluence of god as it descends upon his intelligent creatures and her inward eye is open to look upon his inestimable benefits as they flow in streams into souls to convert them or to sanctify them and this causes her affections to melt and flow like wax in fire and to merge her love and gratitude into the abyss of the divine goodness at such a moment the soul cannot but enter into her own nothingness especially as she is stricken with the sense of her ingratitude and with the unfaithfulness and thanklessness of so many other souls who like herself have been the unworthy recipients of great and generous mercies this and the like infused knowledge can never be obtained by study meditation or any effort or labour it is given by god where he chooses and given to the clean of heart who fervently persist in prayer and in self-denial and who unceasingly lift up their minds and hearts to divine things we read in the lives of many saints and holy persons how they were thus favoured with divine illustrations to the immense increase of their humility although god often conducts the holiest souls by paths more obscure all the days of their mortal pilgrimage as it is the nature of the divine goodness to communicate and impart his goodness when he finds a soul capable of such grace and illumination without its being injurious to humility and where it will be helpful to that delicate virtue when that soul is eager to accept the divine wisdom he infuses a light that opens a view of the divine perfections that entrances the soul whilst it strikes her with the sense of her own vileness and unworthiness in a greater or less degree according to the divine will and her own disposition but the more the soul is humbled and abased the more she exalts and praises god as we find recorded in those dialogues between god and the soul so full of wonder at the divine goodness and condescension and so profound in humility and self-abjection which some of the saints have left us the tenth ground of humility most wonderful of all is the secure rest provided for the soul in the unspeakable benefits of our redeemer it had been of little use to be born had we not been redeemed by the infinite mercy of the most high god through the humiliation of his son we have been purchased from death snatched from the evil one and restored to the inheritance of that beatitude for which we were created lost to god in the first prevarication and lost anew by every grievous sin we have committed each time we have been pardoned has been to us as a new redemption for we have been called to repentance 
through the mercy grace and blood of our lord jesus christ who has taken our sins into his atonement paid their price blotted them out and reconciled us to his father he has paid for them with his humiliations his griefs and his tears with his prayers his stripes his wounds and innumerable sufferings with his unspeakable humility with his obedience to death on the cross we are therefore the purchased servants of christ for which reason we bear his name and by every law of justice we ought to be the humble servants of our humble redeemer behold o christian soul exclaimed saint anselm behold the power of thy salvation behold the cause of thy liberty behold the price of thy redemption thou wast a captive and in this way christ purchased thee thou wast a bondsman and in this way he set thee free thou wast an exile and he brought thee home thou wast lost and art restored thou wast dead and art brought to life feed thy heart on this drink thou of this when thy mouth receives the body and blood of thy redeemer for by this alone wilt thou abide in christ and christ in thee and in thy future life thy joy shall be full but as thou didst suffer death o lord to give me life can i enjoy liberty at the cost of thy bonds can i enjoy my salvation at the price of thy griefs can i glory in a life obtained by thy death ought i to rejoice in thy sufferings or take pleasure in the cruelties that made thee suffer had thine enemies not been cruel thou wouldst not have suffered and hadst thou not suffered i should not have had all these good things if i grieve over their dire cruelty let me grieve the more over my sins that brought thee under them for had there never been the cruel pride of cruel sins thou wouldst never have been subjected to their cruelty how shall i rejoice over all the good that had never been but for these cruelties yet their wickedness could not have prevailed hadst thou not allowed it to prevail thou wouldst not have suffered hadst thou not devoutly willed to suffer whilst then i detest their cruelty and the cruelty of my sins that brought thee to these sufferings let me enter into them with compassion by imitating thy labours and death with the humility of gratitude let me love thy devout will and so safely exult in the good things thou hast bestowed on me o poor little creature leave their cruelty to the judgment of god and think of the benefits thou owest to thy saviour think on what thou wast and what thou art think on him who has done all this for thee and on what thou owest him look on thy great needs and on his goodness understand what gratitude thou owest him and how thou oughtest to love him thou wast in darkness and in a slippery condition on the decline to hell an immense weight as of lead was on thy neck to weigh thee down an insufferable burden pressed with its load upon thee and invisible enemies drove thee onwards so wast thou not even knowing it for so thou wast conceived so born into the world whither wast thou going then the remembrance of it is a terror the thought of what thou wast makes thee tremble o good lord jesus i was in that condition and thought of nothing else when thou didst suddenly shine upon me like the sun and showest me what i was thou didst cast off the leaden weight that bore me down and all the burden that oppressed me and didst drive away the evil spirits that forced me on setting thyself for me against them thou didst call me by a new name received from thee 
and didst lift up my face from the evil on which it was bent that i might look on thee and thou saidst have confidence in me i have redeemed thee and have given my soul for thine if thou cleave to me thou shalt escape the evil out of which i have raised thee and shalt not fall into the abyss from which i have delivered thee and i will lead thee to my kingdom and make thee the heir of god and the joint heir with myself from that time o lord thou didst take me under thy protection that nothing might hurt me against thy will and lo when i adhered not to thee as thou didst advise thou didst not suffer me to fall into the pit but didst wait for my return to thee and thou didst what thou hadst promised yet not only did i not follow thee but i committed many sins and thou didst wait for me and didst all according to thy promise consider my soul and let all that is within thee understand how thy substance is due to thy lord assuredly o lord i owe my whole self to thee in humility and love because thou hast made me i owe my whole self to thee again because thou hast redeemed me i owe my whole self to thee once more for all thou hast given me and promised me and i owe an infinitely greater love to thee than to myself because thou art infinitely greater than i am for whom thou hast given thyself and to whom thou hast promised thyself the eleventh ground of humility is in our distance in this veil of suffering and tears from the supreme object of our soul and the risks we run in the meanwhile from our infirmities for although god is not far from each one of us we are still far from the possession and security of the pure vision of him and if we humbly descend into ourselves we shall find too much reason for this delay we shall find that we are still far from what our conscience demands of us still far from what the inspirations of grace require of us still far from the perfect form of the virtue set before us there is much very much in our self-examination to humble us not to speak of those hidden defects and weaknesses that faintly loom or scarcely loom to us out of the secret recesses of the soul yet nothing defiled can enter heaven apocalypse chapter twenty one verse twenty seven there is still much to renounce much to place on the altar of sacrifice much not yet made subject to god much to rectify by the labours of humility much to purify in the fire of charity meanwhile we have to fear and humble ourselves for the evil inclinations that we know and for the infirmities still concealed from us to pray from my secret sins cleanse me o lord psalm eighteen verse thirteen the completely humble and pure soul can alone see god so long as we are not completely humble there is always a certain amount of insincerity and hypocrisy mixed with our virtues and even after a certain degree of interior progress it is difficult as st gregory observes to keep our exterior actions straight the tongue for example is slippery enough to betray the incontinence of the heart and even our gifts and virtues are so apt to endanger humility that god in his loving care of us often leaves to us a certain amount of weakness to keep from conceit and only removes it in the end st paul did not account himself perfect but forgot the things behind him and stretched forward to lay hold of the perfect things before him upon which st jerome remarks that there are various forms of perfection so that we cannot know that we are perfect where we have yet to lay hold we have not yet received 
and have not yet become perfect from imperfection what we really know or ought to know is that we are still imperfect and to confess our imperfection this concludes saint jerome is the true wisdom of man to be sensible of his imperfection and to know that even the perfection of the just while still in the body is imperfection this wisdom is not a dry knowledge of the head but a sensible and affective knowledge of the heart with a profound contempt of one's self the twelfth foundation of humility is the holy fear of the judgments of god for unless we shelter ourselves well in the humility of christ and do penance and use the world as though we used it not we are not safe unless again a humble dependence on god be the foundation of our life and the love of god be our ruling affection we know not in what state god will find us in the hour when we shall pass from this world there is another and a very broad ground of humility open to all who have the interests of god at heart and who love him truly they cannot be but deeply humbled in witnessing the alienation of such a great number of souls from god whereby his majesty is dishonoured and the divine sacrifice of redemption is made of no effect whereby the world is filled with maledictions and the most merciful designs of god are brought to nothing if a whole family is brought to humiliation through the evil conduct and ingratitude of one of its members how ought we who are members of the human family to be humbled before god when we see our heavenly father insulted and dishonoured by so many of his children whilst therefore we have first to give up ourselves to god in all humility and self-surrender because this is just and due on many grounds and especially because his humility is of the very essence of love we cannot be true lovers of god without mourning and grieving and humbling ourselves for the iniquities many and grievous of our brethren of the same human family abraham humbled himself down to dust and ashes to entreat mercy for the five criminal cities moses offered himself a sacrifice to god in an ecstasy of grief and humiliation for the great sin of his people st paul was ready to become an anathema if so his brethren might be saved the humble have great solicitude for the honour of god and the more advanced they are in light the more they humble themselves before god for every sin whereby he is dishonoured this is the humility of the saints always ready to see the first cause of sin in themselves always ready to offer themselves as victims to suffer for all the sin whereby god is offended it is this humility of the servants of god that saves the world from destruction few are they who understand how much of the lightning of divine indignation is turned away from the sinful world or how much of the grace of repentance is brought down from heaven upon obdurate hearts through the supplications of even one truly humble soul such power has humility with god not to speak of abraham david and the prophets the lives of the saints which have their full illustration in the kingdom of heaven are the undying records of this wonderful power when there is no more humility in the world there can be no more charity and therefore no more salvation what remains of human nature will be but waste and refuse that has failed of its end and the destruction of the world must follow but whilst there is humility on the earth god has his cause in the world and christ his power a few truly humble souls will change the hearts of many and will prevent much sin if only by their prayers 
for god hath had regard to the prayer of the humble and hath not despised their petition psalm 101 verse 18 they are the hinges upon which god turns the providence of his mercy the lightning conductors that avert many a storm of divine anger from their erring brethren all power is with god and with his humble servants who are never far from his mercy seat whose sole solicitude is for his honour and glory and who often move him to the exercise of mercy though themselves unconscious how much blessing they bring down far and wide around them having no power of their own and always confessing this truth god exercises his power through them knowing that they will not take it to themselves the whole history of sanctity shows that the great things of god for the salvation of mankind have been worked through humble souls who have never claimed the work as their own or dreamed that it could be their own the salvation of all that are saved is first and chiefly from the humility of the son of god and secondly through the instrumentality of his humble ones whose number is the safety of the world end of lecture five part three